Good morning, everyone. We will start the session in within few minutes. പറയുന്ന കേട്ടിട്ടൊന്നും ഏത്
Good morning, all. I welcome you all to the fifth international conference on dentistry and oral health, which is held on 7th and 8th December 2022, Dubai. The virtual mode of conference is organized by Asia Pacific Association for Dental and Oral Health, APA Dento, associated with Saveta Dental College and Hospital, Chennai, India. Saraswati Dental College and Hospital, Lucknow, India, and Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, India. About APA Dental, Asia Pacific Association for Dental and Oral Health is one of the leading professional association committed to improving dental and oral health by promoting advanced science-based evidence through our initiatives in education and research. Oral and general health are related and act as a key indicator of overall health, well-being, and quality of life. Dental caries, predominant gum disease, tooth loss, oral cancer, oral manifestations of multiple illness, and oral dental teroma, and birth defects such as cleft lip and plate are among the disease and conditions covered. APA Dento provides a broad-based home for members and societies who are interested in aspects of oral health, which companies, hospitals, government organizations, and APA Dento connect doctors and professionals in the field of dental and oral health and act as a bridge between researchers and academicians. About our Biolix. Biolix is a non-profit professional association which predominantly promotes research and development. We at Biolix have brought a revolution in the field of worldwide conferences. Biolix worldwide conferences bring together the professional wizards and leaders who have explored all avenues to reinforce the field of life science and med medicine technology. Biolix worldwide conduct events worldwide which help in enhancing the skill set of the people from diverse industry, industries and also forms a common platform for eminent personalities, physicians, researchers, doctors, and academicians, professionals, business figures, and much more. Bilix Conference encourages better comprehension about improvement and progressions over the world, over the world through worldwide conferences with the speed of science and technology. We work with our motto of creating a better tomorrow by organizing a conference and creating a network which will help grow a better tomorrow with the help of advanced technology and achieve sustainable development. About the conference, Asia Pacific Association for Dental and Oral Health, APA Dento, associated with Saraswati Dental College and Hospital, Lucknow, India, Saveta Dental College and Hospital, India, and Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, India, organizes fifth international conference on dentistry and oral health on 7th and 8th December 2022, Dubai, virtual mode of conference. Oral health shows our overall health. The mouth is one of the first place to show symptoms of many illness. Maintaining a good oral hygiene is important since mouth is the entry point and it offers a clue to your overall health. Considering the Asia Pacific Association for Dental and Oral Health is organizing the fifth international conference on dentistry and oral health on 7th and 8th December 2022 at Dubai, which is based on the theme a novel approach and promulgating the latest innovations in the field of dentistry. This conference aims to bring together the dental experts, research scholars, budding scientists, professors, and students from all over the world in sharing the recent trends and techniques researchers in dental science. Academic partners. About Saveta Dental, a unit of Saveta University. The Saveta Dental College, a unit of Saveta University status was conferred SIMATS deemed university. It is the top ranked institutions in the country with over 7,000 scoopers and 4,000 plus web of science publications and have secured the 18th position in the world QES subject ranking 2022 in dentistry. Number one in NIRF ranking, a remarkable achievement made more impressive by the fact that SDZ has scored 100 for research output in this ranking. Saveta Dental College is one of the few independent dental institutions in the world which various research centers with over 50 dedicated scientists developing solutions to enhance dentistry. Their INEQ curriculum encourages undergraduate and graduate research products which are well supported and promoted by the university. 
This has translated into their impressive research performance in the world university ranking. They avail over 2 lakh patients record and 6 million images, radiographies and 3D scanned models recorded in the previous year for clinical research with the touch of a button. Saveta Dental Hospital is one of the largest centers in the world with over 550 plus dental operators that cater to over 2,500 plus patients every single day. About Saraswati Dental College and Hospital Lucknow, India. Saraswati Dental College is serving the community for 24 plus years and it is the only dental college from East UP to Assam to be granted the prestigious A grade by the National Assessment and Aggregation Council, NAC of India. Saraswati Dental College serving the community with the vision to make a quality with the defining element of higher education in India through a combination of self and external quality evolution, promotion and sustain in in initiatives. Saraswati Dental College also serving to achieve its goal as guided by its vision and mission statements. NAC, pre NAC primarily focus on assessment of the quality of higher education institutions in the country. Saraswati Dental College is recognized as the best private dental college of India at Leadership Summit 2019. And it is also started as an outstanding dental institute in academic and clinical research in International Education Summit and awarded 2020 Bangkok. About Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Sri Ganganagar, Rajasthan, India. Surendra Dental College and Research Institute was started in the year 2003 to 2004 to serve students with the best dental care and oral and maxillofacial, max, maxillofacial surgery and to transform society through education, learning, care and research at the highest international levels of excellence. The trust firmly believes in the overall development of the students. There is always an effort on the part of institute to instill con confidence in the mind of its students. The environment of the institution is conducive to the study and intensive training of the students. Surendra Dental College and Research Institute is affiliated with the Rajasthan University of Health Science at Jaipur and is approved by the Dental Council of India. Surendra Dental College and Research Institutes enrolls as many as 100 plus students on the undergraduate course and 27 plus postgraduates in all specialties in the field of dentistry. And it offers an environmental conducive enough for quality learning. The institute focus on the on and coordinate the primary prime aim of skill building and personality development of the students, seminars, conference, debates, sports, and dramas, etc are the regular happenings of the institute besides the curricular studies which in needed it is a key strength i would like to welcome all our honorable dignities i welcome apa dento president dr antonio copil g professor competency university university competency d merit spain dr kapil dental academy spain now i welcome apa dento Secretary, Dr. Falivo Molina, implantologist at BlackRock Dental, Dental D Care, prosthodontist at Ratot Dental Implant Center, Clinical Supervisor, DDUH Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland. Now I welcome academic partner, Dr. Sandeep Kumar, Director and Principal, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. Now I welcome Mr. Rudra Banu Satpati, CEO, APA Dento Dent Technorate Group, India. And eminent keynote speakers, Dr. Mohammad Hamad Abad Allah Gaizi, Professor Ch and Chairman of Fixer Prostodontics Department Faculty of Dentistry, University of Mansoura, Mansoura, Egypt. Dr. Mauricio Gonzalez Balot, Orthodentist, Central Special DO, Mexico City Metropolitan Area, Mexico. Dr. Sumit Gupta, MDS Ortho, Diplomat of the American Board of Orospatial Pain, Founder and Director, RAK Dental Care and Implant Center, UAE. 
Dr. Hussain E. L. Charkavi, Professor and Chairman, Department of Prostodontics, <laughs> Faculty <laughs> of Oral and Dental Medicine, Future University, Cario, Egypt. Dr. Sunira Chandra, Professor and Head Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology, Sarapati Dental College and Hospital, Uttar Pradesh, India. Dr. Sumil Olivan, Director of Periodontics and Implant Program, La Salle University, Professor, University, Professor, University San Pablo, CEU, Merit, Spain. Dr. Roberto Scaridu, Clinical Supervisor, Department of Endodontics, Turnitin College, Dublin, Ireland. Dr. El Sheikh Yazar Mohammad, Professor of Plastic and Corneo -max Maxillofacial Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, Menofia University, Egypt. Dr. Andrea Fizdi, Professor, Department of Periodontology, West Virginia University School of Dentistry, Morgantown, USA. Dr. David Gunsman Abru, Professor, Director of Kapil Dental Academy, Mexico, ICOI Promoter, Mexico. Dr. G. Karthik Agyan, Professor and Head Academic Academics, Department of Periodontics, Saveta Dental College and Hospital, Tamil Nadu, India. Dr. Antonio Kapil G., Professor, Competency University, University Competency, D. Merit, Spain, da Director, Kapil Dental Academy, Spain. Dr. Felivo Molina, Implantologist at BlackRock Dental, Dental D Care, Prostodontics at Rathod Dental Implant Center, Clinical Supervisor, DDUH Turnitin College, Dublin, Ireland. Dr. Jamie Kapil, Co-Director, Kapil Dental Academy, Private Practice in Aesthetic Dentistry and Oral Spain. Now I would like to welcome guest speakers. Dr. Bazavaraj T. Bhakavati, Professor and Head Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology, Surendra Dental College and Rajasthan, India. Dr. Surichi Juneha Shukija, Professor and Head Department of Pedotonetics and Preventive Dentistry, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. Dr. Sh Dr. Sheetal S. Chaudhary, Professor, Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology and Microbiology, Erla Dental College and Hospital, Maharashtra, India. Dr. Shahana Vaza Mulani, Associate Professor, Aditya Dental College. Dr. Manish Kumar, Professor, Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. Dr. Karpakhavalli Shanmukha Sundaram, Professor and Head Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology, Seema Dental College and Hospital, HNB, Gharwal University, Jammu and Kashmir, India. Dr. Sri Shakti D., Associate Professor, Public Health Dentistry, Savaita Dental College, India. Now I would like to welcome our session chairs. Dr. Sandeep Kumar, Director and Principal, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. Dr. Rajneesh Agarwal, Professor, Department of Prostodontics, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. Dr. Nishant Kumar, Associate Professor and Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. Dr. Karpahavalli Shanmuga Chundaram, Professor and Head Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology, Seema Dental College and Hospital, HNB, Garwal University, Jammu and Kashmir, India. Dr. Neetu Chandal, Professor and Head Department of Conservative Dentistry and Endodontics, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. Dr. Reenu Agarwal, Professor and Conservative Dentistry and Endodontics, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. Dr. A. Vasanta Kumari, Professor and Head Department of Periodontics and Pre Preventive Dentistry, Adi Parashakti Dental College and Hospital, Tamil Nadu, India. Dr. Manish Kumar, Professor, Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. 
Dr. Manisha Sol Solan Solanki, Professor and Head Department of Oral and Maxillofacial <laughs> Surgery, Surendra <laughs> Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. Dr. Manu Batra, Associate Professor, Department of Preventive and Com Community Dentistry, Surendra yes. Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. Yes. Dr. Rajni Agarwal, Professor and Head Department of Periodontics yes. and Implantology, Surendra yes. Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. Yes. Dr. Enal Bamri, yes. Professor, Department of Orthodontics and yeah, Dentofacial yeah. Orthopedics, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. Dr. Tarulata Shayagali, Professor, Department of Orthodontics and Dentofacial Orthopedics, M.R. Ambedkar Dental College and Hospital, Karnataka, India. Dr. Mani, Lecturer, Department of Prosthodontics, Saveta Dental College and Hospital, Tamil Nadu, India. Dr. T. N. Uma Maheshwari, Professor and Head of Admin, Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology, Savita Dental College and Hospital, Savita Institute of Medical and Technical Sciences, Savita University, Tamil Nadu, India. Dr. Devika S. Pillai, Lecturer, Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology, Savita Dental College and Hospital, Tamil Nadu, India. Dr. Abhilasha R. Professor, Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology, Microbiology, Savita Dental College and Hospital, Tamil Nadu, India. Dr. Karthik Raj S. M. Lecturer, Department of Periodontics and Implantology, Savita Dental College and Hospitals, Tamil Nadu, India. Dr. Lavanya Pratip, Associate Professor, Department of Anatomy, Savita Dental College and Hospitals, Tamil Nadu, India. Dr. R. Gayatri Devi, Associate Professor, Department of Psychology, Savita Dental College and Hospitals, Tamil Nadu, India. Dr. Kaviyarasi Renu, Lecture, Department of Biochemistry, Savita Dental College and Hospital, Tamil Nadu, India. Dr. A. He Hima Sandeep, Associate Professor, Department of Conservative Dentistry and Endodontics, Savita Dental College and Hospital, Tamil Nadu, India. Dr. P. Shankar Ganesh, Lecture, Department of Microbiology, Savita Dental College and Hospitals, Tamil Nadu, India. Dr. Taridi S., Associate Professor, Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, Savita Dental College and Hospital, Tamil Nadu, India. Dr. Arti Balasubramaniam, Reader, Department of Public Health, Dentistry, Savita Dental College and Hospital, Tamil Nadu, India. Dr. Mebin George Matthew, Lecturer, Department of Pediatric Dentistry, Savita Dental College and Hospital, Tamil Nadu, India. Dr. Gurvin Chawla, Associate Professor, Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology and Microbiology, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. Dr. Monika Chowdhury, Associate Professor, Department of Conservative Dentistry and Endodontics, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. Dr. Ravindra Kumar Jain, Professor, Head Department of Orthodontics, Dentofacial, Orthopedics, Savita Dental College, Hospital, Tamil Nadu, India. Dr. Navaneet Ka Kaur, Reader, Department of Periodontics and Oral Implantology, National Dental College and Hospital, Debrisi, Mohali, Punjab. Now I would like to welcome our APA Dento 
President Dr. Antonio for welcome message to all the participants. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, I want to I want to thank all the participants. Please, can you disconnect your microphones, please? Thank you. Um, from from my presidency in Apadento, um, we are very proud to be uh, opening this fifth uh, international congress in Dubai. We have participants from the Emirates, from Mexico, from India, from the US, from Spain, from Egypt, from Ireland. So it's truly an international event. I am very happy to see that Apadento is growing. Uh, oral health and dentistry is very important throughout the world. Um, research is very important and to have together the universities, the research and the um, private practitioners, the general dentists and the specialists. It is very important for all of us to share. Please can you silence your microphones? Thank you. Um, it is very important to, to, to all of, for all of us to share our knowledge and truly mm, through online, through these Zoom meetings, we can, we can make the world smaller. We can reach you know, India. We can reach any other country in the world. And uh, I think these two days are going to be very interesting. We have very interesting lectures, uh, and very good speakers. And I am sure we are going to enjoy these, um, this Congress. I want to thank the organizing committee it is uh, very hard work to put together all the presentations, uh, get in contact uh, with all the doctors and make it work online. Uh, it's not as easy as it looks. It is uh, almost more difficult than doing it um, live on site. So again, I want to, I want to welcome you all to participate these two days and to attend the sessions. And we, I'm sure we are all going to learn a lot. Thanks again for the wonderful program. And uh, yes, uh, Apadento is, is growing. Oral health and dentistry are very important and we all have to, to help it grow in our, in our different countries. Thank you very much for your assistance and I hope you enjoy these two sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now I would like to welcome Dr. Sandeep Kumar, Director and Principal of Surendra Dental College and Hospital for giving your welcome speech, sir. Good morning, everyone. I, Dr. Sandeep Kumar, Principal Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Shri Ganga Nagar, Rajasthan, India, welcomes you all to the fifth international conference on dentistry and oral health, which is being organized by Apodento. Apodento is the one of the leading professional association committed to improve dental and oral health by promoting advanced science-based evidence through education and research. Apodento meets with this objective through academic networking, meetings, conferences, projects, publications, academic awards, and scholarships. Thank you, Apodento, for providing us such an eminent platform for intensify and magnify knowledge in our stream. It is a matter of pride and glory for our institute to be an academic partner for fifth international conference on dentistry and oral health, which is being organized by Apadento. Apadento gave us an opportunity to have a vision and inspiration to groom at international level. It gives me immense pleasure to extend my cordial welcome to all the keynote speakers who are well known in their specialties guest speakers who share their knowledge and offer a new uh, perspective, chairpersons who are all facilitators and listen to all the speakers patiently and can have a session at the end of the presentation. A hearty welcome to all of you. Lastly, I would like to represent my institute, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, which is the prestigious institute situated in the state of Rajasthan in India. It was established in the year 2003 
to fulfill the needs of the aspirants to obtain professional degrees in BDS and MDS. It is an autonomous institute affiliated to Rajasthan University of Health Sciences, Jaipur, and is recognized by Dental Council of India, is now accredited by NAC. Our college actively involves in quality teaching and research practices in oral health and care that make it as a center for excellence for providing world-class education in clinical, academic, and research domains. Our main aim is to see our students to be professional, strong, and determined. We also provide outstanding and affordable dental care to the patient in the patient-friendly environment. Thus, the mission of our institution is social transformation through dynamic education. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. <laughs> now I would like to welcome Mr. Rudra Banu Satpati, CEO of Appadento Technoroid Group India to give a welcome message to all the participants. Excellencies from different countries. I want dignitaries, honorable speakers, and most respected Dr. C.G. Antonio, honorable president of the Asia Pacific Association for Rural Health Academy. Reward Secretary of Appadento, Dr. Flavio Molina. Office bearers of this esteemed conference. <coughs> Chairs. Reward speakers. Our lovely academic partners. Presenters of oral and post the presentations and participants watching this conference from nook and corner of the globe. My dear friends, our country is celebrating 75th year of independence and with many substances of ups and downs. Our organization, Appadento, is incubated in India. When we are celebrating the 75th years of independence, with the successive period of growth and contribution by academic institutions, universities, Today, we rank as 745 in H index among the globe with country ranking of 7 Simago and citation for document 11.19. As Appadento, a unit of Technomarit Research and Development Association, being incubated and developed and established and initiated from India, we have been relentlessly extending selfless service to academic communities with five transformation goals. If I begin up with the first and the foremost need is digitalization of learning. At this rapid pace of evolutions of scientific knowledge, when technologies grabs the market, and at this age, when we don't use technology, rather we leave technology, Artificial intelligence in dental care has created best modalities for the patient. We talk of regenerative dentistry. We talk of 3D printing. We talk of robotic surgery. We talk of intra-oral scanners. So at this high evolution pace of technology, it is extremely important 
to learn beyond the classroom. So organizing this type of conferences in this digital platform implicates towards our goal of digitalization of learning. Today, when the world is moving towards digitalization, we are also speaking about digital universities, virtual universities, and I urge our community members and organization members, office bearers of Appadento, to imply their thoughts towards digital learning. Moving towards next, we speak of commercialization of information. One of the major problem in developing countries of globe is investment and funding towards research. So it's high time academic universities, industries, organizations, associations, societies, institutions should come forward with proper procedures of commercializing information, commercializing scientific knowledge. And I believe if a knowledge market could be established, it would be developing and it would be more efficient than the existing stock markets we have. We speak of liberalization of institutions, organizations, associations and societies again. So liberalization is a very important factor when we have to cross the boundaries and think beyond the limitations we have, think beyond the existing structures, existing hierarchies and existing boundaries and liberalization of organization would definitely lead for international learning, faculty exchange programs, student exchange programs, that we are into it. We are supporting this type of organizations, institutions by establishing inter-university connections so that a common platform could be brought and universities so jointly organize this type of conferences and so is there, so and exhibit their excellencies. We also speak about globalization of academic infrastructure. When the world is moving towards interconnectivity, it is highly important to integrate associations, industries, and academic institutions and universities in a common platform so that a revolution in rapid growth of education system could be brought. I express my hearty gratitude to Savita Dental College and Hospital Chennai for their contribution, for their participation, for their involvement, for their valuable time. My hearty gratitude to Surendra Dental College and Research Institute of India as well for being the academic partner of this conference. It would have been a very difficult job to exhibit this conference, to execute this conference without your support. My heartfelt thanks to Saraswati Dental College and Hospital, Lucknow, India. These all leading institutions of India have taken the leadership to make this conference a grand success. My gratitude to all eminent speakers to add values and content to make this conference worth of attending. I do express my gratitude to all our guest speakers as well for their valuable time. And it's a really good numbers to see. We have more than 319 uh, registrations with shortlisted of 165 oral and 80 poster presentations after double peer blind review and ethical editorial process so that we make sure the best quality of content could be available. I believe these two days of conference will be worth of attending. I wish everyone all the best and I hope 
the learning opportunities and the networking opportunities we have in these two days of Asia Pacific Association of Dental and Oral Health International Conference on Dental and Oral Health ICDOH in 7th and 8th of December will be ever captured in our memories. Wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Now we move on to the keynote presentation. Now I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Mauricio Gonzalez Balut, orthodontist, Centro Orthodensio Especializadio, Mexico City Metropolitan Area, Mexico, to deliver his keynote presentation. Over to you, sir. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. Okay, well, thank you so much to all uh, my dear colleagues around the world. Thank you to the Asia Pacific Association for Dental and Oral Health, Apadentum. Uh, I have many good friends in India. Uh, I haven't met Dr. David Coppel personally from Spain, but I met Dr. Flavio Molina. We were giving lectures in October on a cruise around Italy. And uh, visiting uh, India, I have been in Mumbai, I have been in Goa, and I also have been in New Delhi. And of course, uh, I went to see the Taj Mahal. So uh, my uh, topic for today, because we, I think we only have 20 minutes for each presentation, uh, it's the aesthetic uh, approach with a self-ligation bracket prescription for borderline cases. And uh, talking about uh, a little bit of me, I live in Mexico City. Like New Delhi, Mexico City is one of the largest cities in the world. We are 25 million people in all the metropolitan area. And uh, that in Mexico City, I got my dental degree. And then I made my master's degree at the University of Loma Linda in California. There, this is the hospital of Loma Linda. And here is the medical uh, center. And the Loma Linda Medical Center is well known uh, worldwide because they have a um, uh, a research program on cancer on which they develop a proton beam that cures all the cancer cysts that uh, have not been metastasized. And also uh, the Loma Linda Pediatric, uh, Dent uh, Pediatric uh, Program, hospital program, uh, the Children's Hospital, this is where they made the first transplantation of a heart from a monkey to a baby. So this is where uh, why Loma Linda is very well known. And uh, one of my professors at the University of Loma Linda he was Dr. Robert uh, Murray Ricketts, rest in peace. Dr. Ricketts was named the father of modern orthodontics. Of course, you know that Dr. Edward H. Angle is the, um, the father of orthodontics, but uh, I was very, um, I was very lucky to have great uh, professors at the University of Loma Linda like Dr. Robert Ricketts. And this is the ortho program at Loma Linda. It's a three building storage. And that's where every time I go to, every year they make the alumni association meeting. So I attend, I try to attend every year to the alumni uh, orthodontic uh, association um, congresses. So let's start. I'm going to share with you today a prescription that it's based on uh, not on the crowns of the teeth, but on the roots of the teeth. Many orthodontists are now with the uh, outcome of the aligners. They only uh, emphasize the position of the crowns, but they never think about the position of the roots. So when I develop this bracket prescription, uh, you will ask me, what is the purpose of another bracket system? And talking about evidence-based orthodontics that some of the doctors from India mentioned that we try to do everything evidence-based. This is an article from Dr. Greg Huang, 
who I think he's still the chairman of the ortho program at the University of Washington. And he published in January 2005, the evidence-based orthodontics. And uh, what he mentions is that we are in a profession searching for the truth and the evidence-based approach is the best means to take us into that direction. So this bracket prescription, which is uh, was made actually for uh, not for Caucasian patients, but for Asian patients. And we're talking about Asian and Latin American patients. And I will go through that a little bit. Uh, if you think about it, all the analysis that we use in orthodontics to do the diagnostic um, procedures in our patients, they were made on Caucasian patients. And you know that uh, African-American are different than Caucasians. Latin American people, ethnic group is different than Caucasians. And of course, Indian people, which I've seen many Indian people, they look alike more like our population in Mexico. If you see, if you see a native Mexican and a native Indian, uh, you can see that almost the ethnic features, and I'm talking about the face and the craniofacial features are almost the same. So if you think about the Ricketts prescription, and uh, I, I made a study which I actually published at the Asian Pacific uh, Association of Orthodontics, the APOS, and you can get this, this, uh, this article. Uh, we made studies with a Ricketts analysis and we established that 17 out of 28 measurements of the uh, Ricketts analysis, analysis were um, di different, statistically different from the Latinas when compared to Caucasians. So of course, this Caucasian girl is very different than this uh, Latin American girl or Mexican girl. Five of these differences are due to the dental relationships and 12 have to do with skeletal relationships, which are compensated by the inclination of the teeth. Of course, when you go through the numbers, the, the norms of the Ricketts analysis, you're going to see that when you compare Caucasian with Mexican, of course, all the num most of the numbers are going to be different. Or when you compare African-American and when you compare Indian patients and when you compare Asian patients, of course, they are going to be different. And also in the Steiner analysis, and uh, most of you, well, if you read the, um, the, the uh, how do you say, the article of Dr. Steiner, the original article, which is uh, cephalometrics for you and me, the statistical uh, number of patients that Dr. Steiner took for com becoming into his uh, norms for the analysis, one, one beautiful girl from Hollywood that uh, Dr. Steiner liked and she came to her office and she said, okay, let's take your cephalometric numbers. And this is how we, he came out with the Steiner analysis. So uh, with a study that, like I mentioned before, it's published at the APOS, um, uh, as Asian Pacific Association of Orthodontics, Nine out of 14 measurements of the Steiner analysis were statistically different when compared Caucasians with Latin American. Three of the measurements are related with the position of the arch, within the position of the teeth in the arch, and six of them are skeletal discrepancies comp compensated again by the inclination of the teeth. And when you see the tweet analysis in the cephalometric norms, all the three uh, tweet and uh, measurements are statistically different comparing these two ethnic groups. And this is most of the numbers of uh, the Steiner analysis and the tweet analysis. And uh, basically what is the most important features I'm talking about in orthodontics and in dentistry, what we can modify from the patient even when you do a digital um, uh, design uh, of, of, of the smile, like nowadays uh, it's very common to do, is the interincisal angle. In orthodontics and in dentistry, in dentistry, we can only modify the lower third of the face, okay? The lower third of the face. So when you can look, you can take a look at the interincisal angle for Caucasian patients, it's 131. When you see a Latin American, an Indian, and an Asian patient, the interincisal angle is between 120 to 125 degrees. Okay, and how is going to be this um, showed in the lower third of the face? And I'm going to go through it. 
And these are the numbers. These are the five main numbers that are statistically different. And this is how they are going to show in the ethnic uh, groups, uh, the difference between Caucasian and, and, and the Latin American, Indian and Asian. So when you go from the upper incisor to the Frankfurt plane, the average for Caucasian is 109, for Latin American and Asian is 115, that's plus 5.5 degrees of differences. The upper incisor to the APO line on the Ricketts analysis is 3.5, for us it's almost eight millimeters. That's uh, almost five uh, millimeters of differences. The lower incisor for the APO is one millimeter and, the, and the for us is 4.5 millimeters or 4.6. This is a plus 3.6 millimeters of difference. The lower incisor for the APO line in degrees is 22 degrees. For Latin American and Asian patients is almost 27 degrees. The lower incisor to the mandibular plane, 90 degrees. This is on the tweet analysis. And there are Asian and Indian patients with 96.6. And this is again on the right Dale analysis and on the Steiner analysis, interincisal angle is 134.0 degrees. So for us, like I mentioned before, it's 120 to between 120 to 125 degrees. This is minus, okay? So talking about the interincisal angle, the more that you get closer to 180 degrees, it's the, the teeth are going to be retroinclinated. And the more that you get closer to 90 degrees, the teeth are going to be proinclinated. But also, again, you don't have to think about the crowns. Please think about the position of the roots between the inside the bone. So okay, with no. the outcome of the CBCT, and this is one of the first, CBCTs that was sold in the United States. This was one from one of my professors from Loma Linda. This is from Hitachi. And this was bought uh, around 20 years ago, around two, the year 2000. And from Hitachi, the patient is sitting down and you can get this kind of images. So now a bi-dimensional image, we can now diagnose it uh, with a CBCT three-dimensional. So again, thinking about the interincisal angle, we have to see in the lower third, how is going to be expressed this position. And also um, on, in the black, in the black, uh, uh, if you see the black color of the tooth, this is a, mm -hmm. a, a Finnish case on the, uh, back in the old days mm -hmm. of orthodontics, they do a lot of retroinclination of the crown. This is the norm in green for Caucasians and in blue is the norm for Asian and Indian. Again, on the black, this is how they used to finish the, the orthodontic treatment. And on the green, you're going to see how this is inside the bone. And also for the Asian and the Latin American ethnic group on the blue, this is how it's going to be the position, not only on the crown of, of the crowns, but also think about the roots inside the bone. Again, on the mandibular plane, 90 degrees for Caucasian. And for us, we are a little bit more pre-inclinated. So what happens when our teeth have more pre-inclination, Indian teeth, Asian teeth, Latin American teeth, and African American teeth, we have more lip support, okay? So the less interincisal angle angulation that you have, the more, um, uh, how do you say, the more lip pre-inclination or the more lip support we are going to have. Okay, so in the study that I, uh, that I published is we measured the thickness of the lips of the, uh, of the upper lip of the Latin American and the Caucasian. And of course, the thickness of the lower lip of the Latin American and the Caucasian. And we compared the thickness. And what we found actually is that the lips of the Caucasians are a little bit thicker, but why we have more lip support, and this is due to the interincisal angle. This is a Mexican girl. This is a Mexican girl. She could be Indian. This is a Mexican guy. This is a Peruvian boy. And take a look at the lip support, okay? Check it, take a look at the tip of the nose, the tip of the chin, and these are not concave profiles. These are straight profiles, but they are not 131 degrees. They are actually 100, between 120 to 125 degrees, okay? And this is what I want to show. If you see the Caucasian, the upper lip thickness is 13 millimeters in the Mexican population, also 13 millimeters. And when you compare the lower lip thickness, actually the concation was 
thicker, okay, than the Mexican population. So again, the, the our, our lip support is given by the proinclination of the teeth. Now, if you take a look at these three uh, profiles, this is a Caucasian boy, this is a Peruvian boy, and this is an African-American boy. All their features in the lower third of the face are different. So why are we using the cephalometric standards of the Caucasian uh, population? And this is why in my study, like, and this is the third time that I'm going to mention, and if you send me an email, I can send you a copy of my article. I established the cephalometric standards for the Mexican and Asian population and on the cephalometric norms, uh, on the rickets stainer and uh, tweet analysis, and also on the Arnett analysis. Most of you have you have heard of Dr. Arnett. Dr. William Arnett was also my professor, a teacher at the University of Loma Linda. So again, in dentistry and in orthodontics, what we are going to modify it's the uh, that lower third of the face. And this is when you nowadays you can talk about digital smile design. Okay, when you do a digital smile design. Not only think about veneers, not only think about crowns, also think about the position of the roots within the bone. And let me show you one thing with my uh, computerized program, and I can do a video, which is the visual treatment objective or the prediction of how the profile of the patient is going to look. This is a Caucasian girl, and this is her profile with the, the teeth on 131 degrees. And then this is the prediction with four bicuspid extractions. And take a look on a Caucasian girl. How can you modify the profile and make a concave profile? You have to be very careful when you do your diagnosis. Sorry. Again. And if you proinclinate to 120 degrees, then a Caucasian girl will look biprotrusive, okay? And again, we have to respect the ethnic group, the ethnic features of each patient. And this is the bracket prescription that I develop to respect this. Now, looking at the treatment for this girl, this is a very easy treatment. Uh, skeletally, she's class one. She has a deep bite with some spaces and diastemas. Uh, easy case. Her, her occlusion is very well settled down and she's class one molar. A little bit class two, but we can correct all of this. And again, I don't want to modify her profile. I don't want to do any instructions. I want to respect her ethnic group uh, profile. So I use a Roth prescription, which is not so much pro-inclinated. And this is, this is the final outcome. You can see the upper arch this is the anterior photograph, midlines are on. We corrected the deep bite. We corrected also the crowding. And because she had a little bit of a tooth size discrepancy, we have a little bit more spaces uh, between the cuspids and the first bicuspids. But uh, if we wanted to do uh, interproximal reduction, we should have the uh, IPR on the lower arch to close these spaces. But when we talked to her mother, uh, she didn't agree to do this. And when we do, and this is a la Mexican girl, this is her normal profile on 120 degrees on, on her interincisal angle. And this is her profile on four bicuspid extractions. Mm -hmm. Now she has a straight profile. Uh, everything that you have to respect also, of course, it has to be the crowding and also uh, it has to be the malocclusion that the patient presents. Now, if you go from 120 degrees to 115 degrees, then what you can end up, it's going to be a bipartisan profile, okay? So I think uh, what they are telling me now is that we are running out of time and I don't want to use the time of the rest of the doctors. So if it's okay with you, uh, in in another session and in another chance, of course, I will share with you more of this topic. Um, I don't know if I'm uh, okay in this time or or what can we do now?
हेलो अगेन and i would like to thank uh, dr falavio molina and all the organization uh, committee for apadento and uh, it would be great to share with you in uh, in another in another chance this this kind of topics so thank you so much again for the invitation and uh, whenever you come to mexico city I will be glad to show you around. Uh, thank you so much and bye bye. I think in Dubai it's uh, seven o'clock in the morning. In India it's twelve uh, hours ahead. I think it's ten thirty already. And in Spain I believe it's seven seven thirty. So again, muchas gracias. Thank you so much and take care. thank you for your informative presentation sir now i request all the participant to switch on your camera camera to take a snap where can we take a snap hold on hold on how can we take a snap we will take the snap sir kindly switch on your camera all the participants wait 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 Hold on. How can we say? Okay, there you go. Yeah. Yes, that would be great to take a snapshot. Yeah, I request all the participants kindly switch on your camera so that we can take a group snap. I already took mine. Thank you, everyone. Next, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Surena Chandra, Professor and Head Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology, Saraswati Dental College and Hospital, Uttar Pradesh, India, to deliver his keynote presentation. You welcome you, ma'am. The session is over to you.
warm greetings from Saraswati Dental College, Lucknow, India. I congratulate the entire team of Epidento and BioLeague for conducting this uh, successful conference. And also, I thank the team uh, for giving me this opportunity. I am Dr. Sunira Chandra, Professor and Head, Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology, Saraswati Dental College, Lucknow, India. I'm here to share my knowledge on tobacco cessation through mind reprogramming. I have taken smoking as the example for uh, today's presentation. So for next 10 to 15 minutes, uh, we all will try and understand how our mind programs and how we can uh, utilize this unique feature of our mind to reprogram it and quit smoking. So uh, our mind comprises of uh, conscious mind and subconscious mind. Our conscious mind deals with logical interpretation of our day-to-day -day experiences. So our experiences, they generate emotions, feelings, and thoughts that goes and gets stored in our subconscious mind because our subconscious mind acts as a data storehouse and works 24 seven. So our conscious mind with uh, our experiences leads to generate a belief and that belief generates emotions, feelings and thoughts. And these feelings and thoughts, they lead to a generation of action and attitude which forms a behavior. So our behavior is dependent on our beliefs. For an example, if we believe that we can be a CEO of a company sometimes, this belief will generate certain kind of emotions and thoughts will be, of course, rewarding emotions and thoughts, which will lead to a change in our action and attitude and in our change behavior. So because of this change behavior and action and attitude, probably someday some company will identify you suitable to be a CEO of a company. This rewarding emotions acts like a rewarding stimulus in the reward pathway of our brain. Yes, there's a reward pathway in our brain, which when comes in contact to a rewarding stimulus, release a feel-good chemical, which is known as dopamine. So very briefly, we have understood how our mind programs. Let's understand how mind can be reprogrammed. For this, I would like to introduce another unique feature of our subconscious mind. That is, our subconscious mind never analyze things as negatives or no. And it always stores the data as yes or positives. For example, if our internal dialogue is coming up as I don't want to be afraid to start up my new business. I don't want to worry today. I don't want to have chocolates or I don't want to smoke a cigarette. So our subconscious mind is filtering out these negative terminologies as don't and taking up and storing our internal dialogue in our subconscious mind as I want to be afraid to start my new business. I want to worry today. I want to have chocolates and I want to smoke cigarette, something like this. Let's understand this with an example of a pink elephant exercise. As you all can see on the screen, there's a very cute looking pink elephant. And now I would want you to close your eyes and I would like to ask you a question. Don't think about that pink elephant that you just now saw. Do not imagine that pink elephant. Don't think and imagine that pink elephant. 
So I would now like to ask, what were you imagining? You can even answer in the chat box. I cannot wait very long for the answers. So I'm sure your answers will be a pink elephant. The purpose of putting up this exercise is what you resist persists, keeps on storing and growing in your subconscious mind. So don't resist, instead accept and acknowledge. Reframe your feelings and emotions as positives. So instead of saying, I don't want to be afraid to start up my new business, say, I know my own business is going to be a success. Instead of saying, I don't want to worry today, your internal dialogue should be, I want to be at peace today. Instead of saying, I, want, I don't want to have chocolates, your internal dialogue should be, I want to eat healthy. Instead of saying, I don't want to smoke cigarette, you should reframe it to, I want to breathe in fresh air. So that's how you can reprogram your mind. Or I can say that reframing helps in reprogramming your mind. So let's understand how mind programs during addiction. We just have got a brief idea at how our mind programs, how you can reprogram your mind. And now let's talk about how mind programs during addiction. Again, talking about the reward pathway, in case of smoking, the rewarding stimulus here is nicotine. When nicotine comes in contact with the reward pathway, it generates again that feel-good chemical, dopamine. And we instantly go into a feel-good state. So this instant change to your emotional state or fix of pleasure at any time is available with the use of cigarettes or smoking. So you smoke again and again to replicate that pleasurable effects of dopamine. Let's understand this concept with this small story of a bee and a pitcher plant. This bee is buzzing around very happily without any extra effort and till it comes in contact with this pitcher plant. And now this bee wants to explore this pitcher plant and want to taste the nectar inside. Want to explore, want to have a new experience, thinking that it can come out of the pitcher plant anytime it wants to. So it goes inside, have a good time, taste the nectar, enjoys the rewarding stimulus. And then after some time realizes, I think I've had enough. Now I'm don't enjoying it. I want to come out of this plant. And by that time, it realizes that it is trapped. Something similar happens with the smokers. They, because of the peer pressure or to experience something new, start smoking, thinking that they can leave it anytime they want to. But after some time, they realize that they are trapped. And what goes inside the smoker's mind is, tug of war, a continuous conflict in the mind, a part of which says, it's costing me a fortune, it's killing me, it's filthy, disgusting and controlling my life. And another part says, it is my little pleasure. I will feel deprived if I'll stop it. Stopping will be a nightmare. And after some time, because of the side effects, because of the multiple problems, it leads to death. So smoking is an emotional behavior. You smoke either to escape a bad emotional state, to have a good feeling, or you smoke to encourage an already good emotional state. And this is the reason why people enjoy smoking more with the alcohol because they want to encourage their already higher emotional state by having smoking along with the alcohol. 
So in any case, the motive for smoking is to feel good emotionally. So this self-destructive behavior is emotions. As smoking is immediately giving you an emotional pleasure. That is why smokers' need for pleasure is way more than their need to survive. So what is happening inside the mind of a smoker during addiction or craving? So the internal dialogue goes something like, I want a cigarette. And the other part says, don't smoke. But I want to smoke a cigarette. And the other part says, no, you can't have a cigarette. So by now you know that subconscious mind doesn't take negative terminologies. So what is going and storing in the subconscious mind? It is smoke. You have a cigarette. If we delete or filter these words like don't, no, and can't. So imagine if your mind is having an internal dialogue, I don't have a cigarette, I don't want to have a cigarette, 10 to 20 times in a day, what is going and storing in your subconscious mind that I want to have a cigarette? That is why it is said, what you resist persists. That is how you grow your addiction. So let's talk about how mind can be reprogrammed to quit smoking. And the very first thing that you can do here is to make a decision, choose to quit. Now, you know that smoking is an emotional behavior. So you have to start believing in your decision. You remember, your beliefs leads to the formation of your behavior. So once you start believing that you are going to be a non-smoker soon, your behavior will be accordingly. And you have to cultivate this thought process continuously. So this stage, at this stage, you change your smoking behavior. And what you're doing exactly, you have to reframe your thoughts by replacing the word cigarette with the words that resonates with you. And you have to practice your craving words. So during craving, you have to Change the words like cigarette from I want to smoke cigarette to something like I want to breathe in fresh air. I want to practice deep breathing because breathing is very much important for quitting smoking. So this is just an example that you can replace these words like cigarette and smoke with breathing and practicing breathing. After this, if you know you can control your craving, you will quit smoking. And after choosing, cultivating, and bringing in change, what you have to do? You have to condition it. You have to make a habit of practicing it. That is why the cultivation will help in conditioning. And this is a very important stage. If you'll not condition, if you'll not keep on practicing this thought process of your change emotions, then this is a stage where maximum of smokers relapse. They go back to smoking. If a smoker can feel the same pleasure without smoking, quitting will be easy. And how it can be done? Learning something new activates the same reward pathways as do nicotine. That means you have to generate those same emotions and feelings and thoughts which can act as a rewarding stimulus in your reward pathway. And what can be done? It can be anything. It can be gymming, it can be swimming, it can be dancing, it can be acting, anything that keeps you happy or brings in a rewarding stimulus. So what you have done, you have made a decision, you have started practicing it, you have conditioned it, and gradually you will outgrow your addiction. A smoker desires to smoke. So as a non-smoker, there will be no desire to smoke. So you have to cultivate this thought process. You have to behave as a non-smoker and there will be no desire to smoke. It all depends whether you are willing 
to quit or not. If there is one position we have that is most valuable and can truly transform our lives completely, it is our free will. It is our decision. Because whatever we are today or going to be in our future is because we have taken certain decisions in our life or we have failed to take one. So with this, I would like to uh, give you a takeaway from here. And that takeaway is that practicing tobacco cessation through behavioral therapy should be an integral part of general and modern dentistry today. It should not be taken as a charitable work. A patient should be charged for it, like any other dental treatment. Why? Because any advice given for free is not taken seriously. And considering it is a global threat, tobacco is a global threat. Every dentist must practice it. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you for your informative presentation, ma'am. Now I would like to welcome our next keynote speaker, Dr. Sumit Gupta, DS Artho, Diplomat of the American Board of Orofacial Pain, Founder and Director, RAK Dental Care and Implant Center, UAE, to deliver the keynote presentation. We welcome you, sir. Over to you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, a big round of applause for the Asia Pacific Association for Dental and Oral Health and Dr. Raja Rajeshwari for giving me this opportunity. So thank you, Dr. Raja Rajeshwari. Thank you, Apidento. I'll just like to share my screen. Uh, let me know if my screen is visible. Hope everyone can see my screen. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, my topic of presentation today is temporomandibular disorders, uh, demystifying the myths. So temporomandibular disorders has been a hot topic since decades and still a lot of mis, uh, myths have been associated with them. Hope I can help you demystify these myths uh, with uh, today's talk of mine. Just a minute, I'm having a problem in moving my slide. Okay, so this is my disclaimer. So today's presentation will help us to know the various etiologies of temporomandibular disorders, which are multifactorial. 
the role of parafunctional oral habits as well as occlusion, uh, if they have any contributing uh, role in, man in uh, causing TMDs, uh, whether uh, pain-free clicking uh, uh, requires any treatment or not, and what are the different management uh, uh, modalities for temporomandibular disorders, including uh, surgical management. So orofacial pain is a relatively common complaint in general medicine and dental practice. And the quest to better manage pain problems involving uh, the head and neck area, such as the headaches, facial pains, and temporomandibular disorders has led to the establishment of OFP uh, as a discipline in the field of dentistry. Orofacial pain uh, is now the 12th recognized specialty in the US and in many parts of Western world. Uh, like Brazil, Chile, and Europe. And it's an emerging area of specialization in many other countries, including UAE and the Middle East. And I hope UAE recognizes orofacial pain as a specialty for the betterment of our chronic pain patients who have been suffering since long and uh, who have been wandering from one specialist to another uh, seeking uh, relief. So what is orofacial pain? Uh, as per the International Association for the Study of Pain, it is pain perceived in the face and face uh, or oral cavity caused by diseases or disorders of regional structures, dysfunction of the nervous system, or through referral from distant sources. At present, orofacial pain encompasses temporomandibular joint disorders, masticatory and cervical musculoskeletal uh, pains, neurovascular pains like migraines and low face migraines, neuropathic pains like neuralgias, burning mouth syndromes, occlusal dysesthesias, uh, trigeminal neuropathies, sleep disorders related to orofacial pain such as sleep bruxism, snoring, sleep apnea, orofacial dystonia which is a, a movement disorder, headaches, and certain systemic disorders which can cause OFP. And my today's talk is on TMJ disorders uh, which are only one subgroup of this huge field of uh, orofacial pain. And I should emphasize here that not all pains of the facial region are temporomandibular disorders, but there's a lot we dentists should know and learn. Today's medicine as well as dentistry should be science-based, literature-based, evidence-based, and my today's talk is uh, totally evidence-based. So any of you would like to have citations for any of my slides, please feel free to contact me. I would happy to share them across. So there are a lot of uh, myths associated with temporomandibular disorders, whether the entire TMJ is innovated and is pain producing. What is the role of occlusion and condylar position in causing temporomandibular disorders? Does orthodontic therapy cause uh, TMDs? Uh, how do we examine a patient for TMJ, uh, whether standing behind or in front of the patient? Uh, whether patients complain of noise uh, during opening or closing be diagnosed as TMDs? Uh, do we record joint sounds by placing fingers inside the patient's ears? Uh, the role of 2D imaging like a panoramic and transcranial views, are they used for diagnosing TMDs? Should MRI be done uh, for painless clicking? And do these painless click require treatment? And when is surgery indicated for TMJ uh, disc derangement disorders? Uh, so this is anatomy of uh, temporomandibular joint. Uh, all of you are well aware of it. So I would not uh, dig into that and we'll just skip this slide. We'll just talk in brief about the blood supply. Uh, it's by the superficial temporal artery, the middle meningeal and the internal maxillary artery and the condyle is supplied by the inferior artery and the feeder vessels. The nerve supply, about 80% of the TMJ is supplied by the auriculotemporal nerve, which is a branch of the tri uh, mandibular division of trigeminal nerve. And the remaining 20% is supplied by the deep temporal nerve as well as the mesotric nerve. What are the pain producing structures in the TMJ? Uh, most of the articular disc is avascular and is largely non innovated The central part of the articular disc, uh, condylar head, articular fossa, and the articular eminence are largely non innovated and therefore they are non-pain producing. The periphery of the articular disc is sparsely innovated. 
and pain from the TMJ is usually due to inflammation or injury to the capsule, to the retrodiscal tissues, which is highly vascularized and innervated, the synovial tissues, and the adjacent muscles. So referral from the masseters, the lateral and the medial pterygoid muscles can cause pain as well. So what are temporal disorders? They are a heterogeneous group of painful and non-painful conditions that involve the TMJs, the masticatory muscles, and the contiguous tissue components, which are uh, the ligaments and the tendons. TMDs are a major cause of non-dental pain in the orofacial region, so one of the causes of non-odontogenic pain. Diagnosis and management of TMDs remains a challenge for clinicians to this day because symptoms of many other conditions like headaches, uh, dental pain, neuropathic pains, autological diseases can mimic TMD presentations. The two most common type of painful TMDs are the myogenous or the muscle-generated pain or arthrogenous, which is a joint-generated pain. Talking about the epidemiology, uh, about 25% of uh, patients in general population report some, uh, some awareness of TMD symptoms. However, less than 10% feel that their problem is uh, severe enough to seek treatment. And the greatest factor which determines their seeking care is the degree of pain they experience. Mostly TMDs are seen in the young to middle-aged uh, adults between 20 to 40 years of age. Children and elderly are less frequently affected and women are twice more commonly affected than men. Cigarette smoking has been associated with increased risk of TMDs in young adults. And TMD patients are most likely to have comorbidities such as headaches, muscle soreness and other body pains. The etiology of TMDs is multifactorial and complex, wide or prolonged mouth opening, third molar extractions and intubation. It can be an indirect trauma, which is a sudden blow, but without direct contact, uh, like an acceleration, desolation injury, also known as whiplash injury, with no direct blow to the face. Or it can be a micro trauma because of prolonged repeated forces over time, such as uh, postural imbalance, uh, forward head posture, phone cradling, Parafunction, uh, such as teeth clenching, tooth grinding, lip uh, biting, have been suggested as initiating and uh, perpetuating factors. And the intensity and frequency of oral parafunctional activity uh, may be exacerbated uh, by stress, anxiety, sleep disorders, and even certain medications like neuroleptics and alcohol. Anatomical factors, skeletal factors like uh, severe skeletal malformations, interarch and intra discrepancies, T particle eminences and pass injuries to the teeth. Occlusal uh, relationships. Now, occlusion is a strongly debated uh, topic. Uh, however, loss of posterior support and unilateral posterior cross bites have shown some association. Occlusal features such as uh, working and non-working posterior contacts and discrepancies between the retruded uh, condylar position and intercuspal position uh, have been identified as predisposing and perpetuating factors. Our current available evidence suggests that the true uh, that the influence of occlusion on, on onset and development of TMDs is pretty low. So the two factors which determine whether an intracapsular disorder will develop is the degree of orthopedic instability. However, a discrepancy of one to two millimeters is not significant uh, enough to cause a problem. And the second is the amount of loading. So bruxism patients with orthopedic instability have the highest risk for developing TMDs. There's something called stable malocclusion. Uh, some dental malocclusions are actually orthopedically stable. So a patient with a significant angles class two deep bite may be able to bring his teeth into occlusion uh, with a musculoskeletal uh, stable position of the condyles. So although it's a dental malocclusion, uh, it is orthopedically stable and therefore it's not a risk factor for TMDs. And also evidence clearly states that orthodontic treatment per se does not cause temperamental disorders. Psychosocial factors. General distress is the most salient single factor across uh, individuals with chronic TMD pain. Uh, the emotional centers of the brain, uh, uh, especially the hypothalamus and the limbic system, uh, influence muscle function. So increased emotional stress uh, uh, leads to an increase in the sympathetic activity which uh, causes an increase in the tonicity of the head and neck muscles, 
they uh, they by increasing the level of muscular uh, non functional muscle activity such as bruxism and they by leading to myalgia patient's adaptability is the most overlooked factor each patient is uh, biologically and uh, phenotypically different and can tolerate certain degree of variation uh, from the ideal adaptive capability of the individual influences what is normal for them so some are occlusions minor traumas uh, some emotional stre uh, stresses para function fall within the adaptability of the patient's uh, musculoskeletal uh, system and they do not always lead to tmds so as per this slide uh, the multifactorial etiologies of uh, tmds can be occlusional factors trauma emotional stress deep pain input para function and if they all fall within the patient's adaptability the individual is unaffected so before we proceed with the clinical examination uh, a detailed history taking is a must uh, starting with the patient's chief complaint which is uh, recorded in the uh, palpation because of their location and by an alternative technique called function manipulation is used uh, a tmj examination we look for the uh, the mouth opening which is active passive and the comfortable mouth opening deviation and deflection uh, uh, joint sounds uh, whether a click pop or a crepitus uh, uh, proceed with joint palpation dental and occlusal examination the psychosocial factors are important modifiers of disease uh, onset progression uh, and treatment response and therefore as i said before a basic psychological uh, uh, history uh, and assessment is a must the maximum unassisted and assisted intraincisal mouth opening should be accurately measured with a millimeter ruler presence and pattern of deviation or deflection so in deviation the opening pathway is altered but it returns to normal midline at the maximum opening whereas in deflection the opening pathway is shifted to one side and it becomes greater with opening also record the protrusion and the lateral excursions with and without pain and record the exact location of the resultant pain checking the end field uh, when limited mouth opening is found a uh, gentle steady pressure is uh, placed on the incisors for approximately 5 to 6 seconds uh, using the index finger uh, and the thumb and the uh, clinician applies a gentle stretch and a gradual increase in mouth opening uh, is known as a soft end field indicates a muscle induced restriction and if there is no increase in mouth opening is known as a hard end field and it indicates a joint induced uh, restriction so how, uh, how do we examine a patient for tmj always stand in front of the patient uh, when you're doing a clinical examination so that uh, the response can be adequately assessed and uh, asymmetries can be looked for what are the dif uh, different kinds of joint sounds it can be a click which is a brief and distinct sound of limited duration which occurs during mandibular movement uh, it can occur during opening or closing if it occurs uh, during both opening and closing it's known as a reciprocal click reproducible clicks refers to sounds consistently present on clinical examination and not only as a patient complain and usually click uh, clicks indicate an anterior disc displacement with reduction a crepitus is a sound that is present continuously during jaw movement it is not brief like a click uh, it reflects a uh, noise of bone grating uh, against bone like uh, uh, grinding of stones or walking on snow or sand and it indicates a uh, degenerative joint disease how do we record joint sounds it's performed manually via light palpation of the tmj uh, stethoscopic auscultation is always recommended uh, record the point at which the sounds occur also whether sounds occur during opening or closing or both do not record for sounds uh, sounds by placing the uh, fingers in the patient's ears uh, this technique can produce joint sounds uh, that are not present during normal functioning of the joint so what are the causes of clicking it can be uh, caused due to anterior disc displacement with reduction joint uh, laxity which is uh, like hypermobility an enlargement of the little pole of the condyle 
uh, structural abnormalities like irregularities of the articular eminence, uh, adhesion, and intra uh, loose bodies. Intra articular loose bodies. What is a joint loading test? It helps to differentiate between a myogenous and arthrogenous pain. So, in patients with uh, who are suspected of having a painful intra articular disorder, uh, loading by clenching of uh, the teeth on a wooden spatula induces pain located to the contralateral joint. So here in this uh, patient, uh, patient complains of pain on the right TMJ. So loading with a wooden spatula on the left uh, side and asking the patient to clench will cause uh, the patient's familiar pain to be reproduced. Whereas in a myogenous disorder, loading induces pain over the ipsilateral masseter muscle. So patient complaining of pain uh, in the masseter muscle on the left side, loading uh, test is positive uh, on, the, on the same side as well. Always record for the cervical range of motion, the flexion, extension, right and left uh, rotations and bends. Additional diagnostic tests we, uh, can be, uh, you, uh, imaging can be used, which can be either a panoramic X-ray, uh, CBCT, arthrography uh, with a contrast medium, how it is no longer used and it is replaced by an MRI. Also, bone scintigraphy, uh, which provides information on the metabolic activity of the bone. Other tests which can be used are using mounted cars, uh, electromyography, blood tests to rule out systemic, and synovial uh, fluid analysis. It is a most uh, promising test for intraarticular disorders, but it is invasive. CBCT for assessing bony changes, degenerative changes like osteoarthritis. MRI for assessing the disc uh, position and effusion. 2D radiographs like the pharyngeal uh, and the transcranial views in uh, close and open mouth position uh, provide limited uh, information on the heart tissue structures and range of motion and hence they are avoided. Uh, panoramic X-rays used for gross pathological changes. Uh, they are typically distorted. The images in, uh, by in, in the panoramic uh, X-rays are distorted and uh, there is often a superimposition of the zy uh, zygomatic process. Uh, therefore, it poorly detects TMJ uh, osseous changes and therefore of limited use. This shows the uh, detailed classification of uh, temporomandibular disorders, uh, but we'll be concentrating mainly on uh, derangements of the condyle disc disorders uh, and the inflammatory disorders of the TMJ. So arthralgia, pain of joint origin, which is affected by jaw movement, function, or parafunction. Uh, there's no pain at rest. Uh, there's pain in the jaw, temple, or in front of the ear. And uh, examination will confirm uh, the pain uh, either on the lateral pole or around the lateral pole. Management uh, depends on managing the etiology. Uh, definitive treatment is uh, pharmacological, uh, uh, advising NSAIDs. Uh, Sorry to interrupt you, sir. We are running out of time. So kindly conclude as soon as possible, sir. Invasive options preferred over open procedures for arthrogenous uh, temporomandibular disorders. Uh, they may be considered as an early option for those cases which are refractory to conservative approach. So in conclusion, uh, TMDs represent a divergent group of orofacial pain symptoms. Etiology of TMDs is multifactorial and a precise cause for symptoms may be uh, difficult to pinpoint. Earlier, the focus was on the physical origin of TMDs. Now, uh, an equally significant uh, psychosocial factor is still recognized. Multimodal approach, including counseling and psychological therapy, is uh, increasingly advocated. Most cases, uh, cases of TMDs are managed uh, conservatively and empirically during the early phases of treatment yet uh, lingering in the conservative phase for an extended uh, period when clinical improvement is unclear is not uh, recommended. Occlusion doesn't play a role in causing TMDs uh, except uh, orthopedic instability and hence uh, in invasive irreversible occlusal adjustment should be totally avoided as an initial therapy. And though open joint surgery is rare nowadays uh, and is reserved for specific situations, the changing paradigm favors early minimally invasive procedures. 
So you can never diagnose something you have never heard about, uh, as said by uh, the famous Felton Bell. These are my references. Uh, please feel to ask any questions. You can type in the chat box and we can answer them now or probably later. Thank you. Thank you so much for your informative presentation, sir. Now I would like to welcome our next keynote speaker, Dr. Hussein L. Charkavi, Professor and Chairman, Department of Prostodontics, Faculty of Oral and Dental Medicine, Future, De Future University, Cario Egypt, to deliver his keynote presentation. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I can hear you. And you can see the screen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizing committee of the Asia Pacific Association for Dental and Oral Health for organizing the fifth international conference on dentistry and oral health. I'd like to thank Dr. Raja and Dr. Koppel for organizing such an event. This is the inscription of uh, Risi Ra. Risi Ra was the chief dentist in the royal court of the ancient Egyptian uh, uh, dynasty. This inscription uh, is to 2,700 years before Christ. And as uh, again we uh, say, uh, learning is always uh, life as if you were to die, live as if you were to die tomorrow and learn if you were to live forever. Uh, today, it's a mix of culture organized by India. And speakers from Egypt and we presenting in Dubai. Today, I'm gonna talk about new digital innovation in implant prosthodontics. We do a lot of uh, life implant surgery and we invite every interested one to visit Egypt and implant in the near future. Is the digital uh, era represent the future? Uh, Nanda in 2022 uh, confirmed that uh, if it is well orchestrated, additive manufacturing are redefining prosthodontic today and can be foreseen to, to evolve more in the future. Nowadays, with the advancement in digital technology, we can make everything, even from large objects to little tiny things. We can make houses out of digital. 3D printing, we can make teeth, and we can make also very small things like uh, an attachment housing for an ear prosthesis. 
Also, the scope is widening. We can now use 3D printing techniques in order to make part of the scalp, teeth, scapula, knee joints, full teeth, and also a hip joint. And as we know, digital smile design uh, has made many changes to many celebrities, as you can see Catherine Beta Jones before and after doing digital smile uh, makeover. Nowadays, with digital technology, we can fabricate peak implants and abutments. We can fabricate implant supported prosthesis. We can fabricate high performance peak for full arch prosthesis. Also, we can mill uh, metal bars and use it to fabricate uh, an implant supported prosthesis. We can also, either by subtractive milling method or additive manufacturing method, we can make metal implant abutment, bridges, and frameworks. Also with the advancement of digital technology, we can fabricate completely edentulous, uh, uh, we can restore completely edentulous patient with a complete uh, denture, complete implant supported denture by uh, uh, making uh, these sequence of events. We uh, make a frame of peak and then uh, we in place the teeth and it is ready for uh, casting, as you can see in slide G. And then we uh, fabricate the final uh, prosthesis. Also, we can fabricate now metallic uh, CAD CAM uh, fabricated uh, metallic uh, partial dentures. Also, we can make uh, maxillofacial prosthesis. As you can see, we can scan the face and we scan the intact ear. And by mirror imaging, we can CAD CAM the uh, defect ear and place it in its place. Also, we can use intraoral scanning or uh, extraoral scanning. We can use also face scan or face smile. This can uh, represent the smile and superimpose the smile of the patient of the soft tissue on the hard structure and Sir, your voice is not audible, sir. Sir, can you hear me? Video for here, video for audio I think SAR having a network issue. So we move on to the next keynote speaker. I would like to welcome our next keynote speaker, Andrea Pisney, Professor, Department of Periodontology, West Virginia University School of Dentistry, Margantown, USA. We welcome you, ma'am. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. First of all, I want to thank you all the 
committee for organizing this uh, great event, especially Dr. Raja and Dr. Koppel. And uh, let's start today talking about a topic that to me has always been uh, very important about how to prevent membrane perforation during sinus floor elevation. A little bit about me, I was born and raised in Italy on a small town on Lake Garda. I went to Spain, to Madrid, where I met Dr. Antonio Coppel, and he trained me where uh, in the University of Fonseca Simon Sabio, I got my DDS degree. After that, I decided to go to the United States where I complete my periodontal training and I received the Master of Science from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Uh, I became a professor at West Virginia University and I also work in private practice in uh, Spokane, Washington. During my free time, I love skiing, and um, this is one of the passions that I share with Dr. Koppel. Let's go, let's go to business and let's see what are the factors and uh, what we can do, try to minimize the risk of membrane perforation while we are doing a sinus lift procedure. So the topic of this presentation is gonna be summarized in these uh, six points. We're gonna start seeing the anatomy of the sinus. The anatomy of the sinus is very particular and the maxillary sinus is uh, composed by six walls. And the one that we is uh, for our interest is definitely the lateral wall where our entry point, where our window is gonna be. The maxillary sinus is a uh, cover, is lined by a Schneiderian membrane that the average thickness is between 0.3 to 0.8 millimeter. This uh, membrane is an, immunologic, is an immunological barrier and is composed by a multi-layer cylindrical epithelium. With the lateral wall sinus floor elevation, we can, huge, we can achieve a huge um, amount of bone in the posterior maxilla that would allow us to collocate our implant. So the lateral wall technique has been um, introduced uh, by Tatum in um, 1977, and after that, there has been a lot of uh, modification and new material has been uh, introduced to facilitate the technique. As we can see here, there are different techniques, and uh, we can see the lateral window is the one that is the most predictable one to achieve uh, uh, augmentation of bone on average uh, of eight millimeter, but we know that we can achieve way more when we're doing our lateral sinus approach. The lateral sinus floor elevation is a very predictable procedure because if we look at this meta-analysis, the um, infection is very low and the survival rate in uh, augmented sinus is very, very high, almost the same as a dental implant placed in a native bone. Even if this uh, procedure is very predictable, uh, is not uh, immune to complication. And uh, the most common complication, as we can see, is uh, membrane perforation. Between the intraoperative complication, membrane perforation is definitely the most common one. Then we have bleeding caused by um, uh, the posterior superior alveolar artery. Then we have a buccal flap tear and uh, infraorbital nerve injury. As we already say, and uh, as our title of this presentation is, today we're gonna focus on how to prevent membrane perforation, because we all know that the key of our elevation is to elevate the membrane uh, without perforating, so we can con the graft can be contained underneath. The prevalence, the prevalence of membrane perforation is different depending on, uh, on the study and uh, mostly depend on the experience of the clinician. We can see that on average is around 20 um, to 40%. So nowadays, everybody will take a CBT, CBCT scan to plan for a lateral sinus floor elevation because on the scan, we're gonna be able to evaluate the thickness of, of the genitalia membrane the morphology of the sinus, the lateral wall thickness, the width of the sinus. We can see if we have uh, any septa. We, we want to see where the maxillary ostium is because we need to remember that we cannot obliterate um, the ostium 
by inserting a large amount of graft. We want to make sure that our sinus is clear uh, of pathology. Then we want to see how much residual bone height we have, and then we want to see where the artery is located. So the first um, analysis I want to do is uh, regarding the thickness of the Nigeria membrane. And uh, it was described that uh, once I have a thickness that is very, very thin, um, the chance of uh, perforation are, uh, are higher compared to when uh, the membrane is, uh, uh, is thicker. So for example, here we have uh, uh, in this scan that the uh, thickness of the membrane is 1.5 uh, millimeter, which uh, is going to put this, uh, 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 this membrane in a low risk uh, category. But uh, according to this paper from uh, Dr. Monji, we see that uh, CBCT evaluation tend to overestimate the histological thickness on the membrane, which basically means that the membrane on the CBCT tends to be larger than what the actual uh, thickness is, which in this case, uh, instead of being in a category of low risk, uh, we may be in a category of high risk. We all know that once we found a septa into the sinus, this is a very challenging area to do our elevation because the membrane is very fragile in this area. And we know that uh, the higher the septa, the more difficult is gonna be our elevation and um, the higher the risk of uh, perforation. With the CBCT, we can identify where the septa is. And it can be uh, with a medial lateral orientation or anteroposterior orientation. In this case, we can see that the septa as a medial lateral orientation. So in order to avoid the septa, we plan our window accordingly to make sure we don't do our entry point just above the septa and we can bypass and we're gonna be able to um, insert our graft and uh, after the healing, we end up having a decent amount of bone that will allow us to collocate our implant. In other case, what we can do, we can do a double window where the septa, the septa is going to be in, um, in the middle and we just uh, avoid making two en entrance and uh, treating the sinus with two different, like if it were a two different compartments. It's a different case if uh, the orientation of the septa is uh, anteroposterior. Some people recommend making a larger window to have a better access and then remove the septa, but this is techniques is a very high risk of perforation. And also we need to keep in mind that the bigger the window, uh, the less amount of, of vital bone we will form uh, inside of our graft. So once we, when we have an anthroposterior septa, I like to do a uh, combined approach, both from uh, the buccal and from the palate, and we treat the sinus as a sinus with a compartment, and we reach uh, one compartment from the buccal and the other one from the palatal approach. And we can see on um, the image on the, um, on the right that we were able to achieve a successful uh, uh, elevation with a uh, decent amount of uh, bone graft inside of the sinus. The dentalism also play a role because it's harder to do an elevation when uh, in an area where I'm missing one tooth because the sinus present with a um, steep instead of in an area where is a dentalus where the um, uh, outlining of the sinus floor is, uh, is flat. The residual bone height play a role where uh, we can see that um, once uh, uh, the residual bone height is more than four millimeter was found by the story and his group that is, uh, there is lower risk of perforation versus when uh, is less than five, there is a higher risk, less than four, sorry, there is a higher risk of perforation. During my thesis, when I was in Alabama, I wanted to, to see if there, is a, if there was any association between the lateral wall thickness and the chance of perforation because the lateral uh, wall is where we do our entry point and uh, 
Sometimes we can have um, a lateral wall of three millimeter and some other time it can be less than one millimeter. On average, the lateral wall thickness is uh, 1.5 millimeter. What we found from the study was that when um, the lateral walls were more than 1.8 millimeter, there was a higher chance of membrane perforation. Another factor that play a role in uh, increasing the risk of perforation is the angle that is formed between the lateral and the medial wall inside of the sinus. And the narrower is the sinus, the higher is the, uh, the chance of perforation because uh, when the uh, angle is very narrow, it's gonna be more difficult for us doing our elevation with our uh, cure. We know that on uh, the lateral wall, uh, there is the presence of uh, the alveolar antral artery. And uh, the um, dimension of the artery is uh, different. It can be less than one millimeter or can be uh, above two millimeter. And the bigger the artery, the higher the risk of uh, perforation of the membrane. We know from the paper from uh, Ilian that uh, the artery is identified 50% uh, um, of the time on the CBCT. And the mean distance between the uh, alveolar ridge is 16.4 uh, millimeter, which doesn't mean that the artery is always at uh, 16 millimeter from, um, from the ridge. Because uh, when we took a look in our study, we found that the artery could be found between eight to 24 millimeters. So always, once you have a scan, you want to go through and make sure you identify the presence of, uh, of the artery. The CBCT also tell us a very important information regarding uh, if there is any pathology in the sinus. And uh, we can see, starting from the, the left, uh, what a healthy sinus looks like. Then we can see when we have a membrane thickening, when we have a MOOC retention cyst or a chronic sinusitis. And we found that when we have a pathology like a MOOC retention cyst or a sinus that uh, was previously diagnosed with a chronic sinusitis, the membrane tends to be more fragile and the chance of perforation are higher in that case. So once we do our window perforation, we expose our lateral wall. And like I said before, uh, the original technique has been modified and different instrument has been introduced into the market. So they started using um, round carbide or a diamond uh, burr to the piezo piezoelectric instrument and uh, to other systems like the DAS system. What was found in the literature that the rate perforation rate, if I use a piezoelectric instrument, are um, significantly less compared to um, the regular um, diamond burr. It's important that you keep in mind that um, it's not the instrument that uh, increase the chance of perforation, but is the pressure of the operator. So if you are not careful, while we are preparing our window, even if we have a piezo and we put too much pressure, there, the chance of uh, invading the sinus by perforating the membrane is still high. So how can we avoid the complication? It's really important uh, CBCT planning. Like we see all those factors that play a role in increasing the risk of perforation. Using the piezo definitely uh, facilitate our job. And uh, it's really important that we need to know where to make our window. So sometimes we have to modify the window design. You know, um, usually the member, the window has to be made like the lower border, three to four millimeter above the floor of the sinus. But we need to consider if we have any obstacle like a septum or the presence of the artery. For example, in this case, we locate uh, the presence of the artery that was 6.92 millimeters uh, from, um, from the crest. So we decide, you know, here is visible on the right, uh, on the left image, 
the, the path of the posterior superior alveolar artery. So we decide to do a low window design, where in this case, the window is uh, almost at the level of the floor of the sinus, but doing that, Yes, is a little those type of design is a little bit more risky of um, of complication because your window is very close to your incision line and to the ridge, but you minimize the risk of uh, not only of memory perforation but also to any complication like bleeding by receding the artery. So how to manage a memory perforation? So perforation happen, and I bet that everybody that is attending this meeting that uh, does a lateral wall sinus lift had a perforation at least uh, a few times. And it's important to localize the location and the dimension of the, the perforation. Fugazzotto did a classification and he proposed a, a treatment depending on the location and the dimension of, um, of the perforation. So for example, a class one perforation where basically I have a perforation on the superior border of the window is a very easy to repair. So depending on the dimension of the perforation, if it's less than two millimeter, sometime I can just uh, keep elevating the membrane and the membrane will fold on itself. If it's larger, definitely I wanna use uh, a protection like a collagen membrane collatape. And if the dimension of the perforation is significantly um, big, like more than 10 millimeter, definitely I want to use some, uh, some fixation system to make sure that our membrane will, uh, will be in place and is not going to be displaced uh, once we are inserting our graft. So class to aid that um, the membrane is uh, uh, on the, the anterior um, side of our window, but their sinus cavity is going to extend at least four to five millimeter um, behind the, the position of the memory perforation. So in this case, we have room to enlarge our window. So we can enlarge our window and then we can uh, try to work uh, um, around the perforation to bypass the perforation. And here in this case, the most predictable way to protect the perforation is with a collagen membrane. In a class 2B, which is basically the perforation happen in the same spot, but uh, at my window is very close to the anterior wall of the sinus, I don't have room to enlarge my window. So in this case, um, uh, you just want to try to elevate the membrane and um, protect with a collagen membrane and depending on the dimension you either use or not a fixation system. When I have uh, a class three, which is basically um, kind of like in the middle of, um, of your window, you just want to elevate the membrane. And always once you have a perforation or you suspect there is a perforation because many times you don't see the perforation, but that doesn't mean that there is not a perforation, it can be an advantage to use a collagen membrane inside as a protection to make sure if in a case of perforation, our graft is still contained. So when the perforation is extremely big, um, there is uh, the technique of uh, Loma Linda pouch where we're gonna use external fixation and uh, all the graft is gonna be contained inside of uh, our, um, our membrane. As you can see on the image, uh, the graph is going to be inserted in a pouch and uh, fixate on um, the lateral wall. So these um, uh, techniques uh, uh, take care of the perforation, but it's very, very risky because uh, there is a high risk of infection because the graph does not receive any vascularization. So you have to make sure if you do this type of um, fixation, you're going to use a very aseptic techniques uh, and uh, the graft is not contaminated with saliva from the patient. So the question is, when should I abort in case of the breaks? There are some uh, authors that in the past, uh, they suggest uh, in case of perforation, if it's large, to avoid uh, um, abort the procedure and come back in uh, six months.
Uh, what is happen actually if you have a perforation and uh, you try to let him heal by himself uh, that the membrane uh, will fuse with the flap with the periosteum and then uh, when you are re-entering there is still a perforation as actually that you can there is a risk that you make the perforation bigger so according to picos uh, it does not recommend to abort any procedure uh, as long as you're going to be able to protect the your graft uh, with a membrane. So the step to follow, if the perforation is small, it can self-repair. And um, a membrane, uh, a collagen membrane, is the most predictable uh, uh, repair technique for a perforation. And if you, the perforation is on uh, the um, anterior uh, part of the window, you can enlarge your window, and then you can work around to facilitate your elevation. So larger perforation should require a uh, extra sinus stabilization with some tax system. It can be an advantage to mix the graft with the LPRF or, PR or PRP because it will improve uh, its consistency. It's important that we always work in a septic condition to avoid graft contamination. And like we said, the biabsorbable membrane can be used to repair the perforation. And uh, there is histological evidence uh, that vital bone formation is not affected by a perforation. And also the survival rate of the implant is not going to be alterated uh, by the presence of a perforation, which uh, in um, this means that even if you have a perforation is not the end of the world um, unless you're going to be able to fix it. If you're going to be able to fix your perforation, and make sure you can contain the graft, you should not have a negative outcome. So it's important that our patient follow a very strict um, uh, antibiotic regimen and uh, that they're gonna start like a day before and it depends if patient has some uh, allergy to penicillin or not. In conclusion, we need to know that the anatomy of the sinus play a role in rendering the procedure more straightforward or complex. And location and dimension of the window are crucial. Perforation, when properly treated, do not affect the outcome. But simultaneous implant placement is not recommended in case of a large perforation. And uh, lateral wall sinus floor elevation is a very predictable technique in experience. So I finished my presentation and I want to thank everybody for your attention. Here you can find my email in case you have any question or you wanna be in touch uh, with me. I'm more than happy to answer any question. And thanks again for having me with you today. Thank you so much. For, thank you so much, sir, for your informative presentation. Next, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Antonio Kapilji, Professor, Competency University, University Competency <coughs> Demerite, Spain, Director, Kapil Dental Academy, Spain. Over to you, Doctor. Um, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to share my. I want to share my um, my presentation. Uh, just a second, please. Mm. Uh. Okay, are we all set? Good morning again. Once again, it's a pleasure to be a speaker at this uh, fifth international conference on dentistry and oral health held in, in Dubai in virtual. I have um, half an hour to talk to you about my topic, which is today, modern and predictable sinus lift with uh, Diva device. Um, I want to Congratulate the previous speaker, a good friend of mine, Dr. And, um, Pizzini, from originally from Italy, now living in the US. 
And my lecture is also about sinus, but it's going to be a diff different approach. He spoke about the lateral wall approach. I am going to talk about the crestal approach. Uh, as we all know, when we have uh, atrophic maxillas in the posterior side, the sinus, um, the sinus volume is very big. And we need, in order to place our dental implants, to, um, to build some bone in this area. Sometimes we can go ahead and do a crystal approach. And by this means, we are less aggressive and we're, we don't need to do the lateral wall approach. Um, as you see in this uh, CBCT, there must be bone all around the uh, implant surface. It is very important uh, to consider when you do a crystal approach, the design of the uh, implant. The, it must be uh, concave, um, convex and not, um, as you see on the right, with uh, these aggressive shapes. So what we do not want when we do a crystal or even a lateral sinus um, lift approach, as Dr. Piccini said, is to get into the sinus. This is an endoscopy done um, through the sinus. And we see an implant and we see the mucous membrane, the scenario membrane. What we do not want is that biomaterial to come into the sinus because that can uh, cause a, um, a sinus infection. We have been uh, lecturing for uh, almost 28 years now, since uh, 1995, and doing hands-on courses and training a lot of doctors in different uh, situations. Um, it is important to, to know that bone spreaders can help us. Um, in this case, not only uh, pushing aside the, the the bone trabecules, but also upwards, and using these um, uh, convex uh, osteotomes, um, we, what we can do is we can do atraumatic sinus lifts. To be able to explain it better, we go to the classical technique. The classical uh, crystal approach technique would be to uh, prepare the site one millimeter before the floor of the sinus, and then introduce biomaterial and at the same time push with the osteotomes, push that material upwards in and find this final situation. This would be the classical uh, crystal sinus lift technique, which we all know, and which uh, can be used to place one or two implants or three implants in the sinus. Um, let's see this, this clinical case, it was, um, um, like done like in back in the 90s. We opened the flap. We prepare uh, with the burrs. We stop one millimeter before the, the, the sinus floor. Uh, we use our surgical guide always to, to position in the best way our implants. And then we go ahead with the osteotomes. And we finally feel that we liberate the sinus um, the sinus membrane and we go ahead and place two implants that was the uh, and that is the classical technique which we still use sometimes but I want to introduce you today this um, this uh, novel approach this this device which uh, which allows you as you can see in this article by Gonzalez, um, to do a crystal approach in patients with a residual bone of uh, more or at least four millimeters. The, um, this other article by uh, Olachea uh, talks about um, biphasic uh, hydroxyapatite and beta tricalcium phosphate biomaterial behavior in uh, maxillary sinus augmentations. And uh, I refer to this article because this beta tricalcium phosphide is the one we are going to use to do these um, sinus lifts with the DIVA. So they validate these uh, biomaterials. It's like a paste. 
you will see. And um, we have the first uh, publications back uh, almost uh, eight to nine years ago in 2014 uh, by Nahieli, showing a, a 96 point X success in 219 implants. And those from those 218 implants, 146 had a crystal bone height less than five millimeters. So Nahieli or the Nahieli, which is the uh, this the, the inventor of uh, Diva, published again um, a sinus segmentation in uh, in a in a pig, and um, he used an endoscopy to show the uh, to show the results. Very interesting article. Um, we will see the device in detail later, but basically there are some hollows in the apex. So we introduce the biomaterial as we will see the surgical technique later. And this is uh, the kind of augmentation he um, describes in the article, which is um, it's in it's amazing. And this is the um, this is the uh, the. Um, the hematocellineus in preparations showing uh, the bone formation all around the implant um, and um, and showing that there are bone builds all around the uh, implant surface. How does this device work? Basically, there's three hollows in the apex and um, there are four, as you say, as I said, for apertures. And uh, through these through these um, through these holes, the uh, the liquids, the fluids, as we will say, explain later, pass and uh, reduce the uh, risk of um, damaging the membrane. When we place the uh, biomaterial, we get like the mushroom-like uh, pattern, which I showed you before, and. Um, well, uh, the lower aperture allows uh, for uh, good access to the upper holes. It is very safe. It is very safe, and we will see why, because the membrane is raised very gently. Uh, we uh, reduce we reduce what the previous speaker, Dr. Piccini, said, the, the risk of membrane rupture, which is um, described to be up to 90% in the, in the lateral wall approach. As I said, the diva has a round apex, which is very important the implant design, as we said before. And um, we are able to monitor the uh, procedure throughout the um, throughout the uh, process. If we if we find some bleeding, it indicates the, the breakage of the sinus floor. Um, sometimes, as we will see in a video, you can see saline fluid coming out, so that means the uh, the uh, membrane raised perfectly. And um, it is very interesting, especially in those uh, patients, older patients, patients, patients where you don't want to be very, uh, very uh, traumatic. And this, this you see the uh, an endoscope uh, going through the hollow of the implant, and um, you see. Uh, you see the image we get to see uh, through that hollow in the apex. For a dental surgeon, it's uh, it's interesting because it's minimally invasive. The procedure is is uh, is very simple and easy to learn. It's uh, much less complications than an open window or even a, a, a traditional uh, crystal approach. So localized membrane lifting. It's uh, you can monitor the bleeding, and uh, we can do it. I'd say from from three millimeters onwards. It's safer to do it from five millimeters onwards. The chair time is much shorter. We can do a, a crystal approach, and um, as uh, we know, as surgeons, we don't need to rush, and we don't have to rush, but we can do it like in um, in half an hour or less. Um, we don't need special toolkits like we need in, in conventional uh, lateral wall approach. 
and the um, the failure rate is, is 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 very is very small. For the patients, the advantages are uh, the post op is 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 um, is much better, less pain, less swelling, less bleeding, which is important because you know everybody in our society. Um, wants to continue with their normal lives once they have whatever kind of surgery. We, as we said, we we reduce the risk of complications. The recovery period is shorter, and there are fewer visits to our offices. The kit comes with the implant, as you see, with the uh, holes, and in basically uh, three widths and two two sizes. Uh, mostly we use the 11.5. I asked the manufacturer to build a 10 millimeter implant because I consider the 13 millimeter implant is too simply too too long. There's a, a, a long bulb which comes within the implant and a short bulb screw. When you place, and we will see, we will see the steps. So you are able, and it comes with an internal screwdriver. And a cover screw, the saline syringe, the synthetic bone paste, and the cannula, all together in a kit. Uh, as an additional tool, you need uh, the, the three osteotomes and the pilot drill. The osteotomes have with a concave tip. They come in those sizes, 2.2 to 2.7, then they use the following one, 2.7 to 3.2. And finally, the larger one from 3.2 to 3.75, if the bone is, um, is a little bit hard. Uh, using the osteotome, we minimize the risk of membrane perforation. Can you silence that microphone, please? Thank you. Can you silence that microphone, please? Yes. The osteotome does not impact bone quality. And um, if the bone is soft, as I say, the, uh, the small osteotome will be enough. I want to show you some videos. Well, the bone paste, as we said, is um, it's gel consistency. It's fully absorbed. So we're using resolvable material. It hardens within 24 hours. And this is the image you would see of the uh, of the biomaterial coming through the hollow of the implant and creating that um, shape. The procedure, we do the, the, the opening, the flaps, small flap. We go ahead and drill with a pilot drill, one millimeter, one millimeter below the sinus floor, like we do in a crystal approach. Then we go ahead and use the produce a sinus flux fracture. These steps are the same in the crystal approach. And then comes the, the big uh, difference. We place the implant with achieving initial stability and we remove the bulb inside. And then we actually uh, screw in the implant, separating the, 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 the sinus. First, we, we place a, a saline solution and then we go ahead and inject the synthetic bone paste. Um, we can use uh, external rings. And I will show you, this is the final result. We call we will place the, um, the, final, um, the final healing screw, uh, sorry, um, um, the, the valve screw. And this is the result we should get. This is the the uh, what we expect to find um, in approximately three to four months. It is uh, mandatory always when you do a a um, any kind of uh, sinus approach, be it lateral or be it crestal, to have a healthy sinus to have a minimal bone height, to have no infection in the site, and the patient um, should, should be in good health. 
absolutely. No medical conditions that we're not allowed to place implants. And the patient must note uh, have undergone any previous sinus lift procedures. We see the uh, the videos of the incision, how we do the uh, lifting of the membrane of the. Uh, now we do the drilling. With the, the drills have stops, so we stop one millimeter. As I said, we go with the go ahead with the osteotomes. Using the three of them or one of them, depending on the on the on the bone quality. This is the the implant itself. We go, we screw it by hand. We screw it and get some some primary uh, stability of the implant. We take out the long ball screw, which is the, that one. Then. The next step, we'll do the, the, uh, the irrigation with saline, saline, in which we do start the sinus lift. Then we screw a little bit more again. We place more saline in. And that's doing the elevation of the, of the sinus floor. We place, we screw a little bit more the implant in. Again, we go ahead with the uh, irrigation so that we raise with that irrigation the uh, sinus membrane and we finally screw the implant in. We, we place a little bit more of irrigation and the final placement of the implant at the crystal level, maybe one millimeter below the level. And again, we put more um, saline that saline has reduced the sinus lift through the hollows, through the holes in the apex of the implant. There's a sign of integrity. You see the, the you see the saline with no bleeding. That means the sinus is is is, is, is safe. No, no tearing of the memory. Please, can you silence your microphones? Now we place the paste through the side of the implant. We place the um, the paste. We clean a little bit, and we, we place a little bit more of the paste. Slowly, gently, and once we feel uh, we have placed enough biomaterial. We do a little bit of the cleaning of the inside of the implant. And we place the short bulb screw. And we are about to finish the procedure by placing the cover screws. I have uh, met many friends around the world. I am the ambassador to Spain for ICOI. And we have... Um, we have, uh, I think, international societies such as Apadento, in which I'm so proud to be the president, allows for international uh, uh, connections, research, uh, to share information. And this is what makes the world um, more affordable and smaller for us. See, this is a very nice case, very challenging case. We have... Uh, um, our first premolar missing. We have like four millimeters. We drill with the first drill up to one millimeter. You see here the drilling. We go ahead. We had opened the lab. We work with the drill. We work with the osteotomes. We place our implant. We want to check. We see no bleeding. This is a this is a saline. Go ahead. Please, can you silence your microphones? Those who have it open, please silence your microphones. Thank you. We place the paste in the shape of valve. And this image is lovely. I love this case. Make it simple, make it, uh, make it um, successful. Please, again, can you silence your microphones, please?
and uh, this image, which means there's uh, absolutely no, no, it's been a successful um, sinus lift and, and we, we placed in the biomaterial. You see all these rounded shapes, which means everything went okay. And this is again, a very challenging case um you the, the implants are, are placed mostly by hand and uh you're going to see this video it's very nice to see uh the 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 the, the saline coming out from the uh, from the inside of the implant that shows there has been no damage some cases this is the, uh, the before, this is when the implants are placed, and this is after. You see how, how the biomaterial resorbs. Here you see a, a final CBCT of that case. This is the, how, how, how much we raise the, uh, the sinus. And these are the, um, these are the final CBCTs of the cases. And I want to show you uh, some of the images done by Professor Nahili of those implants uh, seen through an endoscope. In the scene, um, those implants have been placed intraorally, and then we place an endoscope and see what happens in the inside. So we see this, this image, and that's the. Um, it's actually the the the, the um, see the paste coming in. So uh, magnificent images. We see some cases finalized. The important thing is to see the rounded shape of the biomaterial. That means everything went okay. And um, uh, we see again uh, some of the uh, CBCT uh, images and final results 24 weeks post op, the immediate and the before. If you see this CBCT in the beginning, you, uh, you think about going ahead and doing a, a, a conventional sinus lift. But once you've known what you can do with uh, the diva device, you can get results such as this one, very predictable, raised like uh, from here, which uh, we might have like five millimeters, make it approximately 10 or 11.12 to get these final results being um, less aggressive. Um, the truth is more and more, and I have been, I did my first sinus lift in 1998. So it's a while uh, now since I did my one, my first one. I still do them, but in many occasions when I want to be less traumatic, especially in older patients, I go ahead with this uh, technique. Um, I wanted to, to, to give you uh, some tips of, of this um, new device. Uh, it's been around uh, for eight years already, so it's uh, still uh, not very well known. But uh, as we all know, the, the crestal sinus lift elevation is a, is a very documented technique in the literature. Um, it's a, a very uh, documented technique like the traumatic or lateral uh, window approach. And uh, like the uh, former, it must be done with a very precise and correct technique. When you uh, do surgery uh, close to the sinus, you, have, you must have a certain degree of expertise because the sinus, as we all know, is a, limit, a limiting um, anatomic structure. And uh, again, we need we need to have a certain experience in oral surgery and implantology. Um, radiographic evaluation is mandatory before and after the implant placement. Um, we, if we have a CBCT in the office, we can check the final results, but uh, we must, must at least do some periapical 
x-rays oh. to evaluate the uh, pre and the post. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Please, uh, can you silence yeah. your microphone, please? Um, and, and again, um, as I was saying, uh, the the patients in 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 who you do any kind of uh, sinus lift approach, even being crestal or uh, lateral, like the previous speaker, uh, Dr. Piccini you must follow up those patients very carefully. You must check them two days after surgery, a week after, after surgery, a month after the surgery, you know, and, and control those patients to see any, any possible uh, symptom of infection. So you treat it in the first stages. Um, DIVA, is an implant device which facilitates sinus elevation placement with uh, the biomaterial and without damaging the Snyder's membrane. We do use a uh, conventional crystal approach in, in, in some occasions. In others, we use Tiva, um, which can help you tremendously. So to those uh, more experienced uh, surgeons who want to give it a try, look for it, try to find the distributor in your country and uh, use it. Um, in these uh, two last minutes of my presentation, I want to um, thank again Apadento for this um, symposium, this Congress, which will last uh, two days, being it virtual. Uh, you have my, my Facebook there. You have my Instagram. Um, you also have my email. You are more than welcome to write to me with any uh, question, any, any um, if you want any, any paper. Uh, and of course, if you plan to come to my home country, which is Spain, uh, you are more uh, than welcome to, to visit us. We give a lot of uh, um, implant education all around the world. We will be uh, by the end of uh, by the end of January in Egypt. Um, and again, I'm looking forward to do something with Apadento in India. Um, I am very happy to see Apadento is growing. And again, as president, I'm very proud to represent your um, the society wherever I go. Thank you very much. I love I love triathlon. I think I am on time, and I think we can even have one minute of questions if there was any. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Here in Spain, it's um, 7, 12 a.m. So I, uh, I'll move back in very soon to my office to continue my, my work. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your informative presentation. Next, I would like to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Surichi Juneha Shukija. Professor and Head Department of Pedotonics and Preventive Dentistry, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India, to deliver their keynote presentation. Over to you, Doctor. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for the invitation and introduction. Thank Am you. I audible? Yes, you are audible, ma'am. Uh, all right. I'm not able to share my screen, ma'am. To open the number of the Yes. Okay. Is my screen visible, ma'am? Yes, visible, ma'am. Yeah. 
Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Suruchi from uh, Srinitha Dental College and Research Institute, Sri Ganganagar, Rajasthan. And I'm here today to uh, we'll talk about resin infiltration. I'm sure everyone must have heard about it. But uh, what we have heard about till now is basically a resting carrier solution. And I will talk about slightly different uh, uses of this resin infiltration. Well, starting with my presentation, resin infiltration of microinvasive resolution approaches for the management of dental caries have changed dramatically in the recent years, evolving from traditional, mainly restorative approaches to a more preventive or maybe we can say non-invasive or minimally invasive approach, which is mainly the medical model. So we have seen a, uh, seen a paradigm shift from surgical to medical model. And this is not only for dental caries, for all the dental diseases altogether. So keeping in view the present understanding of the carious process and the hypoplastic lesions in the body of the lesion, Modern management approaches, they basically aim towards preventing the disease, managing the caries risk, and early detection of the lesions so as to minimize the invasiveness of the treatment which we deliver. So the present day approaches for uh, non-carious uh, or incipient caries lesion, that is non-cavitated lesions are, as we all know, remineralization of the lesion with fluoride, either varnishes or gels, and CPP, ACP, that is casein phosphopeptide, amorphous calcium phosphate, which is easily available as a tooth mousse. So these remineralizing uh, treatments, they are easily available and commonly performed. And another approach is the therapeutic sealants for occlusion lesions. They all aim to superficially block the area so that the pathways of the bacteria and the substrate are totally cut off. Apart from the white spot lesions or the incipient carious lesions, there are certain other conditions that we see specifically on the anterior teeth and are aesthetically a concern for the patient. These are the white marks that can be due to any kind of tissue porosity, either subsurface or surface, like white patches, white lines, or speckled lesions. They are all seen in certain conditions like camelogenesis imperfecta, molar incisor hypomineralization, fluorosis, or Turner's hypoplasia, which is the hyperplastic lesion resulting due to either trauma or any kind of infection in the predecessor. That is, suppose primary teeth have some kind of, uh, say, abscess, and the effect is on the developing central incisor or resulting in hyperplastic uh, lesion, that is, Turner's hypoplasia. So, the aesthetic treatments of these white spot lesions are in the form of tooth bleaching, enamel microabrasion, direct composite resin. Uh, veneers or indirect veneers or indirect crowns. However, when we talk about all these aesthetic treatments, either we have an age limitation, like if the child is young enough, maybe eight or nine years when the central incisors erupt, and it is an aesthetic concern for the child as well as parents. Usually parents reports to us that they say there's an aesthetic concern. So we cannot place directly indirect veneers or indirect crowns or even direct composite resins or in, uh, resin veneers, they're insufficient because either the tooth is not fully erupted or if it is fully erupted, the passive eruption is still pending. And tooth bleaching is anyways not indicated under 16. Microabrasion is totally an invasive procedure. It will wear off the surface layer. So all these are either invasive procedures or they are pending till the full eruption of the tooth takes place. So resin infiltration is the answer to all these problems. So resin infiltration is a microinvasive treatment in which 
the porosities of the lesion body they are penetrated into the body of the lesion with low viscosity light curing resins which are called the infiltrants and thus the name resin infiltration it provides a newer treatment choice which falls between the preventive and the restorative therapies that is why the name micro invasive although it is invasive but still it is not as invasive as other procedures and it is not even restorative so let us see the principle of resin infiltration its rationale is to basically perfuse into the porous enamel with the resin using its capillary action now how does this capillary action take place this involves first of all we create the micro porosities as in composite we do it with a 37% phosphoric acid here and we use hydrochloric acid 15% hydrochloric acid which breaks the surface bond and erosion takes place leading to the creation of the micro porosities and into these micro porosities the resin is infiltrated into the depth using this capillary action thereby arresting the lesion progression by occluding the micro porosities which provides the pathway for acids and dissolved materials it aims to create a diffusion barrier inside the lesion and not on the lesion surface as with other techniques the other techniques only occlude the surface of the tubules or just the layer the top the topmost layer is occluded this resin infiltration it aims to go deep inside the body of the lesion and thus the aesthetic improvement is achieved now when we talk about the aesthetic improvement now let us first understand in the sound enamel whenever there is light on the surface of the enamel it is not scattered it either is reflected back or scattered to the very minutest of extent which is not even uh, visible microbiology na pakkathula silver lab irukku la adhu vaga irukku i would request uh, to please silence the microphone thank you now when there is a subsurface porosity as is seen in white spot lesion or maybe hypoplastic lesions so what happens when there is light falling on the surface of the enamel it gets scattered within the body of the lesion thus creating an optical labyrinth that is over luminous and therefore is perceived as more white than the rest of the tooth structure the sound enamel has a refractive refractive index of 1.62 whereas the white spot lesion or the hypoplastic lesion has a refractive index index of 1 to 1.3 depending upon the condition of the lesion if it is dry it would be somewhere around 1 and if it is wet it would be somewhere around 1.33 so this is what creates the difference in the refractive index and thus leading to the optical phenomena of being white now this resin that we are talking about the low viscosity resin it has the refractive index of around 1.52 that is close to the enamel so this is the difference which makes it this uh, the similar color as that of enamel so this is how it works now let us see the components of the resin infiltration it contains an icon h that is 15% hcl gel an icon infiltrant that is the infiltrant that is supposed to create a diffusion barrier that is tet tetraethylene glycol dimethyltryate and icon dry that is 99% ethanol which is used to dry the micro porosities created so that the capillary action can take so take place now the clinical procedure involves three steps first is erosion using the hydrochloric acid then is dehydration 
using 99% ethanol and infiltration is done using the resin infiltrate. First and foremost is erosion. Now, before we move on to this, since it is 15% hydrochloric acid, isolation of the tooth is must. When we are doing it on the anterior teeth, we can always use a gingival barrier that we use in bleaching or any, or any other things along with the retraction pot that would be sufficient. In posteriors, rubber dam is indispensable. So first of all, 15% uh, HCL, that is Icon HDMG. This is the only kit that is available commercially for resin infiltration, that is Icon DMG. So 15% HCL is, is used for two minutes to assess the hypomineralized fluorosis lesions. And it can be even used for lesser time if we are dealing with white spot lesions. We increase the time when we deal with certain hypoplastic lesions or fluorosis lesions because we need to actually erode the surface layer, which can be slightly hypomineralized the surface layer in case of fluorosed lesions. So that is why increased time is required for when we are dealing with white patches on the anterior teeth. And if we are dealing with white spot lesions, then the time can be easily decreased. Okay, now after uh, we have used this, we actually want to gain access to the underlying subsurface areas in order to avoid the uneven erosion, the surface is mechanically rubbed using a microbrush. As you can see in this picture, this tip is available with the kit and it is rubbed on the tooth surface so as to gain an even erosion, which can be, uh, say, hindered by the bubbles that are formed. So we want to uh, break those bubbles and make sure the etching gel it comes in contact with the whole of the tooth surface. Next is dehydration. Now dehydration is, after we have uh, used the HCL, we wash it off and we want those capillaries to be totally clean for the infiltrant and vacant and empty so that the infiltrant can go to the utmost step. Now, this hydrophobic gel will, uh, sorry, infiltrant will go into those capillaries only if it is dehydrated. And this dehydration is achieved using 99% of ethanol for 30 seconds on the surface of the lesion using a flat needle, as you can see in this picture. Now, uh, this, after we have used this, it will give a white frosty appearance as it gives in composite, but more than that. Now here, this is a crucial step. We need to stop at this point. We need to wet this etched area, sorry, dehydrated area with water. Now, once water enters into these uh, capillaries and it will give you an idea of how much result will be achieved after infiltrant, after this much of uh, etching and erosion and dehydration. If the desired result or after, wet, after wetting, we see that this is not what we want to achieve. We want to achieve some more aesthetic improvement. So what we can do is we can erode and then dehydrate two times more in the similar manner. That is according to the manufacturer's instruction, it can be used up to three times. That is erode, dehydrate, erode, dehydrate, erode, dehydrate. That is the max we can do. Even if after that, it is not achievable, the best of result, that means there's some problem with the case selection. All right. Then after we have dehydrated, it is the time for the resin infiltrant to flow. On the white spot or on the hyperplastic lesion, we are going to place this infiltrant and again wait for around three to four minutes because according to studies, Increasing the contact time will lead to a deeper depth of penetration by the resin infiltration. And so after, uh, we have to wait for three to four minutes and make sure it is done away from the light because it will set once and comes in contact with the even ambient light. After that, it is light cured for 40 seconds. 
we can repeat this infiltration if okay. we find that it is already seeped in and this little more to be done so that is optional now after we have done the light curing we can polish as we do with the composite uh, another thing I would like to add here is sometimes uh, there is slight, uh, due to the hypoplastic lesion, there is slight irregularity or maybe slight pitting, although that is not the absolute indication for resin infiltration. But however, after we are done with the resin infiltration, we can always combine it with a layer of composite so that the aesthetic result can be achieved. This is one clinical tip that can be used using resin infiltration now this is to summarize first we use the icon edge for two minutes that is 120 seconds then dry it for 30 seconds if the spots diminish then infiltrate if the spots are still visible then repeat the procedure of etch and dry up to three times after infiltrate is done then light curing and after light curing more infiltrant is required we can use that it is again optional then adding composite is also optional once all this thing is done cure and then polish so that is in short how the infiltration is done. that is for the vestibular or the buccal lesions now for the proximal lesions proximal, proximal lesions when we are talking about this it is basically to arrest the decay now, when you are talking about arresting the decay, we are talking about lesions of a certain, it's not only the non-cavitated lesions. We are talking about those lesions which have already penetrated into the enamel that is either E2 or D1. So, while we are doing this, the first and foremost is I told you again the uh, isolation with rubber dam is must, and then the separation of the teeth. Because this is the foil applicator that is specifically available in the kit for the proximal lesions. Here we can see the foil. This foil serves to separate and protect the adjacent tooth. And from the other side, there's a kidney shaped aperture through which the material comes out and does its job on the tooth to be uh, infiltrated. So now here, as we can see, the first is separation, then etching using the foil applicator, then drying with the 99% ethanol, infiltrate, curing, removing the access, the same procedure. So moving forward, let us see what are the pros of these resin infiltrants. Minimally invasive does not require any drilling. That is, we are totally sticking to the principles of minimal invasive dentistry. And the results are immediate. If we want to remineralize with fluoride or something else, it requires a lot of time, persistence. Every three months, the patient has to come back. So it requires compliance and the results are not immediate. So it, this resin infiltration, on the other hand, gives us immediate results in one visit and does not require any local anesthetic. It can be used in children under 18 years of age as an appropriate alternative to bleaching or veneers. It is less expensive, less expensive when we compare to direct or indirect veneers and even the crowns. When the teeth are whitened, the treated white spot will lift in color similar to the natural tooth. And it has been shown even to increase the shear bond strength and tensile bond strength. There's no difference in the bond strength of the infiltrated areas as compared to the normal tooth. Now, the cons of resin infiltrants, they're not suitable for demineralized spots which have progressed to cavitation. I told you if it has already progressed to cavitation, then we need to combine this treatment modal modality with application of composite, it can be done in the same visit. Now, the areas which have been infiltrated, they might fade because sometimes they do not complete the, completely match the area. Again, it was a problem in the case selection. So remember, this is a very, very important thing that the case selection has to be very good. 
this uh, resonant filtrant it is not appropriate for uh, use in patients where sensitivity of the teeth is there because we are using here hydrochloric acid which can lead to aggravation of this problem occasional touch ups may be required if it fades although that is rare and more uh, studies have to be conducted regarding this aspect so let us see i'll be presenting two of the cases uh, regarding uh, covering of the white patches one is this as you can see in the first picture there are white areas hypoplastic lesions spanning to around uh, maybe around 40 to 50 percent of the tooth surface after application of the gingival barrier the proper technique was followed and here in this picture where applicant uh, application of infiltrant is being done you can appreciate that on tooth number one one the infiltrant is being applied on on tooth number two one it is the white frosty appearance that has been there due to first etching and then dehydration and that was when we applied water wetted the tooth surface to assess what kind of result would be visible and since it was fine so we went ahead and this is the post-operative picture you can appreciate the first picture that is a pre-operative and this picture is a post-operative absolutely clean and a very good aesthetic result has been achieved however there was one case selection that was wrong now if you see this case this is not at all meant for resonant filtration and even if we want to uh, lighten these areas using resin infiltration, we would need composite restoration to ma completely mask the defect. Now, although three times we repeated, but we knew they are spitting, the interproximal areas not good, not uh, good enough. So this was the best result that was achieved. That was all, and we had to cover it with composite so that it can be better. So I think we already passed the time. Uh, let us conclude with saying that uh, resin infiltration is a treatment option with great potential, spe specifically in pediatric dentistry, when we cannot go ahead with veneers and more definitive treatments. It can be used to wear smooth surface enamel lesions and to camouflage the hypoplastic areas in the anterior teeth. Now the take home message, infiltrants, they can mask the aesthetically relevant lesion by reducing the light scattering. Masking effect can be achieved only in active carious lesion rather than inactive lesions. Now, this is important because in these inactive lesions, they're already arrested. The surface is so hypermineralized as compared to the uh, underlying areas that sometimes even after repeating three times the whole process of etching and then dehydration, the desired result cannot be achieved. So it is more useful, it is more effective in active KDS lesion than in inactive mm -hmm. lesions. Rewetting with water after etching may help to estimate the effect of the sub, uh, subsequent infiltration. And again, I would emphasize case selection is of utmost importance. Please do take care when you select cases for resin infiltration. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Uh, I would like to thank APA Dental for this academic extravaganza, bringing together the speakers from all over the world to an international platform. Thank you so much. I hope this presentation would be useful somewhere to most of us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your informative presentation. Next, I would like to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Sheetal S. Chowdhury, Professor, Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology and Microbiology, Erla Dental College and Hospital, Maharashtra, India, to deliver their keynote presentation. Over to you, doctor.
so a very good afternoon everyone first of all i would like to congratulate team Pacific association of dental and oral health for organizing this fifth international conference on dentistry and oral health this conference has actually provided a a great platform for all uh, dental professionals where we can share our thoughts and our research. So I would like to thank the organization for providing this platform and giving me the opportunity. Uh, going with the theme, where the theme of the conference is promulgating the latest innovations in the field of dentistry. So when we talk about the latest innovations in cancer research, what once seemed to be impossible in cancer research is now a reality, thanks to a number of technological innovations that have led to major breakthroughs in the way we find, visualize, understand, and treat cancer. So it's an ongoing area of critical research to develop better and more accurate diagnostic and screening techniques to have a good survival rate in cancer. Be it artificial intelligence mammograms, liquid biopsy for breast cancer, monarch robotic endoscopy for lung cancer, genomic cancer screening in embryos, or simple at home urine test for prostate cancer, to name a few. In fact, cancer genetics and genetic testing has revolutionized cancer diagnosis, prevention, and treatment. The discovery of BRCA genes in breast cancer diagnosis is actually a very promising tool. A greater understanding of the immune system, genetics, and cancer pathology has actually opened the doors to an ever-increasing range of cancer treatments and diagnostic tools. In fact, the 2000 has marked the emergence of targeted therapies in precision medicine, where drugs can find and kill cancer cells by becoming uh, by homing specific molecular targets uh, and thus making the treatment, cancer treatment, more effective, resulting in more survival and less morbidity. So when we talk about head and neck cancer, here also we have changed the way we treat and diagnose cancer. But we know that a lot more needs to be done. And for this, I think we need to have a more problem-based approach. The current diagnostic modality for oral precancer and cancer is, of course, biopsy. But we know that uh, this is associated. This technique is associated with uh, limit certain limitations. I think, as a clinician, we know the complexities involved in uh, the diagnosis and management of oral precancer and cancer, and therefore we are at the forefront, or we are at the most advantageous position of getting path-breaking ideas to resolve these problems. It is rightly said that clinicians are working in the greatest laboratory of clinical research. So what are the problems when we deal with oral precancer and cancer in our clinical practice? Histopath, as we as we know, that it is the gold standard for diagnosis, but as we have discussed, that it is associated with certain limitations. So the need of today is to have a molecular test to identify these oral precancer and cancerous lesions. Recently, uh, Dr. Anil D. Kruser, who is the head of a head and neck, head and neck uh, 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 surgery at Tata Hospital, India, he has come up with a very good uh, survey where we found where they have found uh, that not or all oral cancers are preceded by oral pre uh, potentially malignant disorders or what we call it as oral pre cancer. But certainly, all oral cancers are associated with adverse habits like tobacco and alcohol. So why can't we have a risk characterization tool where we can assess the cancer risk in the patients who are having adverse habits? Also, I think we need to have a more non-invasive or minimally invasive way of diagnosing oral precancer and cancer, uh, which can have an advantage over a more invasive uh, biopsy and histopath. So, as we, as I said, that we need to have a more problem-based approach to our, uh, uh, to the solutions. 
we need to have a molecular test we need to have a non invasive or less invasive and more objective technique for diagnosing oral cancer we need to have a cancer risk assessment tool which can be used in patients in individuals with uh, oral precancer as well as with adverse habits so solution is to have application of a more sensitive risk assessment technique which is based on molecular composition but then for this we need to collaborate with researchers we need to have a multidisciplinary collaboration approach when we started looking for this and when we started looking for molecular diagnostic approach towards diagnosis of oral precancer and cancer we come across we came across a diagno molecular diagnostic modality that is raman spectroscopy now this technique actually has an advantage because it uncovers a wealth of biochemical information which can give us the more detailed lipid protein and nucleic acid content of the tissue based on which we can diagnose a tissue pathology also this technique has an advantage that we can use serum or saliva as the diagnostic modality for oral precancer and cancer so Raman spectroscopy is a molecular diagnostic optical based technique which has an advantage over conventional histopath because it gives molecular because the diagnosis is based on molecular signatures it is an alternative approach which can give us an early rapid objective and label free technique because uh, in a very short duration of time the diagnosis can be provided also it uh, it uses a lot of algorithms and softwares uh, which can give us a more specific diagnosis and a more detailed information about cancer risk assessment in individuals with oral precancer and individuals with adverse habits this technique can prove to be more accurate and reproducible as i've told you that it uses a lot of algorithms and statistical tools cancer risk assessment is also possible with this technique because it as i've told you that it gives a more molecular information about the tissue based on which we, we can predict that which patient can develop or can have more risk of developing oral precancer and cancer so with all these advantages associated with this technique we started exploring its use in particularly in uh, oral precancer now this technique is actually based upon the interaction of light with the chemical bonds within a material it's basically a vibrational optical spectroscopic technique and here we can use it it in in vivo as well as in vitro that is with in vitro approach we can use serum and saliva uh, as a diagnostic modality so uh, as i told you that this technique gives a molecular information and uh, this uh, this technique is actually tried earlier in diagnosis of oral cancer and therefore we tried to explore its use in diagnosing oral precancer as well as assessing the cancer risk in individuals having uh, various or, uh, various adverse habits which are associated with development of oral cancer so with the objective of using serum as a diagnostic modality we chose to study the raman spectroscopy in uh, individuals with adverse habit but without any oral precancerous okay. lesion or cancerous lesion we also used this technique for diagnosis of oral potential malignant disorders like osmf and leukoplakia and we compared this data with controls as well as with oral cancer this was the workflow which was pro which was followed for uh, the serum when it was used as diagnostic modality serum was collected from patients uh, and uh, the uh, blood was collected from the patient the sera was separated and it uses this technique uses only 10 microliters of the serum which was placed on calcium fluoride window and then this serum was utilized for a raman spectroscopic analysis now this is the instrument which was used uh, this you as in this picture you can see the equipment that which consists of a microscope as well as a laser which is attached to the laser which is attached to this microscope and uh, the screen which shows various softwares which are used for analysis of the sera this was the serum which is placed in the special microscope 
and uh, the C, uh, the molecular analysis was done which was then recorded uh, with the software and this is how we get the molecular analysis of the C of these patients now once we get these uh, spectra what we call it as these waves are actually called as spectra and these spectra are based on uh, the lipid or protein content of the uh, patient sample now once we get this spectra these spectra are then further analyzed with certain special softwares which we call it as principal component analysis and linear discriminant analysis now, the softwares, they are used for better visualization of the data better compression of the data and it can give us more specific results about the sample after using this after compressing the data with these softwares and coming up with more specific uh, uh, more specific uh, stats we then uh, we then uh, uh, come up with a, we then came up with a predictive model where we used one artificial intelligence tool that is called as leave one out cross validation tool and through this uh, predictive model we could actually test the data and come up with the di specific diagnosis so here the blood samples were analyzed for beta carotene proteins dna and amino acids and based on these the spectra were analyzed so this is how we got the spectra for our various uh, 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 various groups that is control habit without lesion patients with oral submucous fibrosis we could get different spectra patients with oral leukoplakia we could get different spectra and these were quite different from uh, patients with oral cancer as you can see it here uh, this is the average overlay where you can uh, see we, where we uh, we can appreciate that there are different spectra which are associated with different uh, different groups that is uh, the groups were habit without lesion uh, oral submucous fibrosis, leukoplakia, and oral squamous cell carcinoma against control. So here you can appreciate the difference in the spectra which we obtained for individuals having various habits, but these patients were without any lesion. So morphologically, in these patients, there were no lesions at all. There, were, there was no leukoplakia, no oral submucous fibrosis, no lichen planus, nothing. But these patients were known to have habits, adverse habits in various forms of tobacco or alcohol so here also at this level where the lesion is not seen morphologically we could see the spectra of these patients which were quite different from the patients which were normal which were without any habit so you can see the difference in the spectra which we got for uh, individuals with adverse habits which was quite different from healthy individuals similarly as you can see we could also diagnose the cases of oral submucous fibrosis and leukoplakia uh, based on the sera of these individuals. So you can appreciate the difference in the spectra which we got for leukoplakia against oral submucous fibrosis. Here also, now what we tried to do is that his, uh, these patients, uh, the hyperkeratosis or oral submucous fibrosis patients, we compared the result of sera against the histopan now certain patients uh, uh, histopathologically were assessed for dysplasia and on sera also we could get the difference in spectra between hyperkeratosis without dysplasia and hyperkeratosis with dysplasia so this proves that the raman spectroscopic approach can prove to be a cancer risk assessment tool that is based on the spectra we can assess the cancer risk in these patients and we can tell actually the patient that the patient is having more risk of developing cancer so this can also prove to be a non-invasive or minimal invasive way of diagnosing of screening for the cancer risk in these patients so here you can appreciate the difference in the spectra which we got for hyperkeratosis with dysplasia and without dysplasia there is a huge difference in the spectra Dysplasia uh, definitely showed various biomarkers on the basis of which we can assess uh, the cancer risk in these patients. We can tell the patients that these are the biomarkers which were found to be deranged in uh, the sera and uh, therefore they have got more risk of development of oral cancer. We also found a difference in spectra in oral squamous cell carcinoma against dysplasia. So 
dysplasia showed us different spectra and uh, I mean the spectra uh, was different from oral squamous cell carcinoma. So we can definitely differentiate patients who are dysplastic and who are having oral squamous cell carcinoma based on the serum analysis uh, through Raman spectroscopy. Now, this is uh, something, uh, a software uh, which shows us a good clustering of our samples. That is, we can see that blue cluster, red cluster, green cluster. So this tells you the accuracy of this technique of diagnosing various groups. That is, we can differentiate control from oral squamous cell carcinoma, from dysplasia, from leukoplakia, as well as oral submucous fibrosis. So here we got the accuracy of almost, almost 80%. That is, with 80% accuracy, we can predict that this patient is having leukoplakia or this particular patient is having a more cancer risk uh, or more risk of developing oral cancer. So this was the result based on our These are the uh, uh, these are the uh, analytical tools where you can uh, differentiate between control versus habit with a good accuracy level. Uh, this, uh, the next graph uh, shows us uh, that we can differentiate patients with habit without lesion versus oral precancerous lesions. Also, we could differentiate oral precancer with dysplasia and without dysplasia based on Raman spectroscopy and dysplasia could be differentiated from oral squamous cell carcinoma and the accuracy as I told you that it range from 80 to 84 percent. So this is a very good accuracy which we got through Raman spectroscopy. Now our next target, next aim was to assess saliva as a diagnostic tool using Raman spectroscopy. So here uh, first of all, we established serum as a diagnostic modality for diagnosing oral precancer and assessing the cancer risk. And next thing, we try to uh, analyze the potential of saliva as a diagnostic modality for diagnosing oral precancer and assessing the cancer risk. Now, here we faced a little more difficulty uh, about the standardization of saliva as a diagnostic tool because serum we know that it is more pure form it is but saliva on the contrary is more adulterated because it is uh, it has got a lot of debris which consist of epithelial cells and food debris also so here we took a lot of time to standardize saliva and we carried out a preliminary study based on certain samples uh, of oral precancerous lesions and conditions which constitute of eight oral submucous fibrosis, eight leukoplakia, which were tested against six control. So um, the same procedure was followed that the saliva was actually uh, purified and then it was uh, analyzed through Raman spectra. So the results which we got were very, very promising. Here you can differentiate uh, the spectra. You can appreciate the difference in spectra obtained for control which were different from leukoplakia against oral submucous fibrosis. So all three spectra you can, these are the average spectra for all these samples. So we can differentiate these three uh, uh, from each other based on uh, Raman spectroscopic analysis of saliva. Uh, here you can differentiate now leukoplakia as we know that it can occur as speckled leukoplakia it can occur as pre leukoplakia or it can also be homogeneous leukoplakia so we took actually samples from all these cases and here we got uh, the uh, results that is we could differentiate homogeneous leukoplakia from non homogeneous and we could also differentiate pre leukoplakic lesions based on salivary analysis serum as well as salivary analysis then uh, oral submucous fibrosis also. We took certain samples of oral submucous fibrosis where patient had red component. Also, the samples were taken from hybrid lesions. That is where SMF was associated with leukoplakia. Recently, we have seen more and more cases of oral submucous fibrosis associated with leukoplakic patch. So we could take uh, these samples for uh, the serum as well as salivary analysis. And as you can notice, saliva gave, gave us very, uh, very good results. That is, we could differentiate plain OSMF from oral submucous fibrosis with leukoplakia from SMF with red component. So uh, we actually analyzed uh, both serum as well as saliva and saliva also uh, has uh, got, uh, has given us very good results. So when we compared uh, in the second approach, we compared the analysis or uh, serum analysis with salivary analysis because we wanted to know which diagnostic tool 
can be better that is whether serum is better or saliva is better and actually with serum we got 96 to 97 percent accuracy level to differentiate oral precancerous lesions and conditions from control and with saliva uh, we also uh, saliva also we could get uh, very good results which actually came to around 88 percent so with saliva also so uh, saliva can also serve as a very good diagnostic modality for assessing cancers or for diagnosing oral precancer now, this is what I was talking about. That is, we developed a predictive model. Uh, that is, when we uh, give an unknown model to the Raman, spec uh, Raman spectroscopic uh, uh, equipment, can that diagnose uh, uh, be, uh, that untested uh, saliva or serum? Can it diagnose specifically? So, uh, this predictive model from this, you can uh, see that. Uh, we had six control and it actually could diagnose five accurately. We had six, uh, eight leukoplakia. On serum, it diagnosed six correctly. And among eight oral purpose fibrosis, based on serum spectroscopic analysis, four could be diagnosed accurately. Similarly, on saliva also, we got comparative results. So with predictive tool, we could diagnose uh, oral pre uh, potentially malignant disorders. We could differentiate these diff disorders from control as well. So these are various biomarkers which we got on serum based on which you can diagnose or we ca you can assess the cancerous conditions. On saliva also we uh, got various, we got derangement of various biomarkers on the basis of which you can diagnose uh, oral potentially malignant disorders. So through this research, uh, what can we conclude? Actually, uh, these Raman spectroscopic analysis of uh, serum showed us variation in the content of protein and vari uh, various proteins and nucleic acid. So this tells us that, yes, there are significant biochemical changes which are taking place in these patients on the basis of which we can diagnose. So this study actually confirms the feasibility or the use of Raman spectroscopy combined with all these uh, statistical tools and artificial intelligence tool for the diagnosis of various oral potentially malignant disorders. Also, we could differentiate. It's not that we could just categorize it into one. We could diagnose oral submucous fibrosis and leukoplakia based on Raman spectroscopic analysis of Sera. Also, as I have told, uh, as we have discussed it earlier, that is, uh, dysplasia can also be diagnosed uh, in these patients based on their Sera analysis. So we. It, this Raman spectroscopic analysis of serum can definitely help us to assist cancer risk in these patients. And therefore, it can prove to be a, a minimally invasive technique for diagnosis of, uh, CIRA can prove to be a minimally invasive technique for diagnosis of oral precancer. Saliva from salivary research, what we could conclude that definitely it helps us to distinguish patients with oral potentially malignant disorders or oral precancerous lesions and conditions from healthy controls. We could also differentiate leukoplakia from SMF based on salivary analysis. And also we can uh, we can assess the cancer risk in these patients. So uh, we uh, actually want to know whether uh, this can serve to be a better diagnostic tool as compared to serum, but for this we need to definitely uh, test more and more salivary samples. Every research has its limitations, so uh, uh, th and that is how you can expand your research. So here we need to have more and more samples to be tested so that we can come up with a more accurate predictive tool for diagnosis and screening of these patients. So we need to have large, large data for which we need to have, uh, we need to expand our research. So to conclude, what we uh, actually can conclude through this research, what we aim for, that is we wanted to have a more molecular diagnostic approach towards diagnosis of oral precancer and cancer. And yes, we now can say that yes, we do have a molecular based approach uh, through knowing the biochemical composition of tissues in oral pre in patients having oral uh, precancerous lesions and conditions and oral squamous cell carcinoma patients, uh, through uh, and this can be achieved through Raman spectroscopic analysis. Secondly, we also wanted to analyze the cancer risk. Uh, we wanted to know the cancer risk in individuals having adverse habits and oral precancerous lesions and conditions. And yes, through Raman spectroscopic analysis, we can have, uh, we can analyze, we can assess the cancer risk in patients having adverse habits and patients having 
oral potentially malignant disorders. Also, our third goal was to have a non-invasive or minimally invasive method of diagnosing oral precancer and cancer. So yes, through this research, we can say that yes, serum and saliva can be utilized as more uh, non-invasive methods of diagnosing uh, oral precancer and cancer. So we have the implications of our research and diagnosis in cancer risk assessment and to predict pro progression of the disease. But definitely we want to expand the research where we want to know whether saliva can act as a better diagnostic tool. We want to know that whether Raman spectroscopic analysis can help in monitoring the patients with oral uh, potential malignant disorders. Also, we want to work more on patients with uh, uh, who are who are addictive, uh, who are uh, having adverse habits, but they are not having any lesions. But we want to know what uh, changes uh, these patients they show on their serum and saliva. Also, we want to come up with certain specific markers uh, on the basis of which oral precancer and cancer can be diagnosed. But definitely this is not possible uh, without having a multidisciplinary uh, team approach. So we we actually uh, oral here in this research, we as oral clinicians worked with uh, molecular scientists, data analyst, and analysts, and that is how uh, we could come up with these promising uh, results and solutions for diagnosis of oral precancer and cancer. Uh, we actually could publish uh, these promising results and we also got a research grant uh, for our project. So through this, I definitely would like to uh, convey that uh, we as clinician are, uh, uh, can come up with uh, uh, path breaking ideas or can come up with solutions to our problems uh, which we face in our clinical practice we can i can say that we are the chosen ones and therefore uh, but for that we need to definitely enlarge our territory uh, so that we can come up with very promising tools for uh, helping the patients with oral precancer and cancer and we can reduce the mortality and morbidity associated with this uh, uh, deadly disease so thank you for your patient listening and uh, i hope that uh, the uh, we can actually progress uh, on this path and can uh, have a uh, path breaking research for oral precancer and cancer in the near future. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your informative presentation. Next, I would like to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Basavaraj T. Bhagwati, Professor and Head Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology, Surendra Dental College, Rajasthan, India to deliver his keynote presentation. Over to you, doctor. Am I audible? Yes, sir, audible. Breakout room. Oh, wait, I join Korea. Hmm. Hmm. Hmm.
Yeah. Am I audible now? Yes, audible, sir. Yeah. Yeah. That one sec. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. My screen is visible over there. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, this presentation is uh, role of viruses in every cancer. You all know head and neck malignancy is the fifth most common cancer. Sir, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, can you please uh, adjust your video, sir? Okay, fine. I'll let this. Now it's okay? Yeah, sir. Great. Thank you. Fine. Fine now? Fine, sir. Due to the technical issue, uh, SAR will be left. Uh, we just wait for a few minutes to for continue the further section.
Dr. Basavaraj facing a technical issue. He will be joining within a few minutes. Kindly wait. Sir, kind. Sir, I'm audible. Sir, kindly start your presentation, sir. A technical session will start within few minutes. I request all the participants to kindly join to the respective breakout room.
and repeat a technical session will start within few minutes i request all the participants to kindly join to the respective breakout room No audible now. Yes, sir. Yeah. You are audible. Yeah, video fine now because there yeah. is an... fine, sir. Fine. Yeah. So let's start now. Okay. Fine, sir. Yes. There is one. Here. Okay. Can you see the screen now? Hello. Um, your screen. No, Is sir. No, sir. It's not visible. Yes, sir. Visible or not? No, sir. It's not visible. Now? Yes, sir, visible. Is that fine now? Yeah, sir, fine. Okay. Now, sorry for the delay. Let's start the. I'll make it as short as possible because since we have very less time. Yeah. Uh, so it's on uh, role of viruses in the oral cancer. We already started with that. Uh, I'll quickly go into the uh, details of this. Adenic malignancy is the commonest, fifth most commonest cancer uh, reported globally. And it leads to 3,30,000 deaths per annually. Adenic cancer, squamous cell carcinomas are the biologically heterogeneous group of cancers. With causing the morbidity and uh, mortality, sorry, worldwide. So in the Indian subcontinent. So what is the con today's concern is we all know automatically shift to gaya tom. Bas sir, sir. Yes. So uh, there are uh, ninety percent of which is in commercial carcinomas, and forty percent are commercial carcinomas. So what, what is the today's concern of uh, presentation? Uh, this thing is, you, we all know tobacco and alcohol have got a multiplicative. The effect is multiplicative rather than additive. But the area which is not a uh, concern, which is not a focus is a role of viruses, which has got an increased risk of cancer. It has been well uh, studied from oral oncology, this thing. Uh, there is a microbiome of uh, HLP-positive cancers and uh, neck metastasis are also studied. 
and the indian uh, current status in indian uh, is also studied where uh, uh, 35th indian cooperative oncology network has been held in september system they have also focused on a uh, role of uh, uh, hpv viruses or viruses in head and neck cancer So we take into the two groups viruses which are strongly associated with oral squamous cell carcinoma and viruses which are less frequently associated with squamous cell carcinomas. Under strongly we have HPV virus and HSV virus, but less commonly Epstein virus and hepatitis virus. Viruses which are strongly first we'll go to the viruses which are strongly associated with head and neck squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, they are cl broadly classified into according to their host and the associated risk factors. The first one is human papilloma virus, first named according to the host where they reside. The one which is there in the rabbit is a show or a show papilloma virus. In the cattle, it's bovine papilloma virus. In the deer, it is deer papilloma virus. And in humans, it is human papilloma virus. And the second one, depending upon their risk, high risk and low risk. Third one, according to the International Agency for Oral, uh, sorry, Research on Cancer, Group 1 and Group 2. Group 1 is strong, are highly carcinogenic in humans. Group 2 are less carcinogenic. In, in, in Group 2 also, you have we have A and B. Coming to, uh, in short, about transmission, there is horizontal transmission and vertical transmission. So you all know vertical transmission is from the maternal cervix, from the childbirth. Slides not moving. And uh, horizontal transmission is from the unprotracted sex, skin to skin contact, and through the formats. HPV has been a prime suspect of etiology of squamous cell carcinomas because they have an ability to change the oral keratinocytes, which are the basal cells in the, in the mucous membrane. They have an ability to transform these epithelial cells into the malignant cells. Uh, the buccal mucosa being the commonest site and making it HPV more susceptible for the to gain entry into the basal cell layer of oral epithelium. Coming, coming in short about the structure. Uh, you see, in, in entire structure of HPV system is not what oncogenic. So there are something called oncogenic proteins. So E6 and E7 part of the viral uh, proteins have got an uh, ability to stimulate the carcinogenesis. So we call these as an oncogenic proteins. Onco the word oncogenic, it, it says that oncogenic. So it, it, it these are the cells which are responsible for the conversion of epithelial cells into carcinogenic cells or uh, malignant cells, sorry. Now coming to, in short, these are the normal epithelium. This is HPV infected epithelium. Okay, so it enters and forms the infection, which is a promoter of earlier activation of carcinogenesis. Okay. So, in the more of in as compared to the site for HPV carcinomas, that is carcinomas induced by the HPV this thing are the posterior part of the oral cavity, that is tonsillar fossa and oropharyngeal mucosa, then followed by tongue and the buccal mucosa. So, there is a site specificity for HPV viruses induced uh, squamous cell carcinomas. Age and gender, I'll go into the short. As in squamous cell carcinomas, which are induced by tobacco and uh, alcohol, they are higher age group, they are above 60 years, but whereas uh, HPV induced squamous cell carcinoma are at the lower age group. So, younger age group is more prone for HPV induced squamous cell carcinoma. And the, coming to the site, tongue has become high frequency and the posterior part of the oral cavity. Then, um, among other risk factors, increase in the number of Sexual partners may also increase the HPV tendencies. HPV in oral pre-malignant lesions. The HPV in two to three times more likely to be detected in pre-cancerous lesions 
and 4.7 point uh, times more likely to see squamous cell carcinoma as compared to the normal group person. Mm -hmm. now, these studies are also shown uh, the site specificity and the pre-malignance. Then among all the viruses, uh, among all the types of this thing, verrucous carcinoma has got more HPV viruses as compared to the other types of viruses. Those are um, lesions. Association as a carcinogenes. See, there are very few studies done where independent exposure of alcohol and the tobacco showing the risk of squamous cell carcinomas with the HPV. So what they say is, uh, all these studies are showing HPV along with the alcohol, along with the tobacco, they are responsible for causing the carcinogenic changes. So the four risk factors are found here. One is the male gender. Second one is the site that is oropharyngeal mucosa. So these are termed as oropharyngeal tumors. And people who are using less tobacco and history of orogenital sex. So coming to Indian studies, North, in, uh, North Indian studies showed oropharyngeal cancer incidence is not significantly correlated with the tobacco and alcohol. Whereas the recent study in the Northeast India showed the significant association with the human HPV DNA positivity and tobacco chewing alcohol consumption has been seen. Then HPV prevalence in the Indian studies, in Indian oral cancer. So as compared to the other studies, the tongue and the floor of the mouth are a common site for the development of squamous cell carcinomas in Western countries. Buccal mucosa is common in squamous cell carcinoma in India. B, as the habit of placing the tobacco is more in common with the double buccal sulcus and the tobacco. So now these studies, there is a difference in the South Indian studies and the North Indian studies. South India has told the 67% of squamous cell carcinomas are associated with the HPV along with tobacco and alcohol. Whereas Eastern only 33 and 15% in the Western India. So it is not like the, the studies are also being done for HPV viruses. So there is a difference in, in the demographic of these lesions, occurrence of these lesions, which are caused by the HPV virus. So how do we detect that? The, the detection... So HPV your slides are not moving, sir. Excuse me, sir. Yeah, but here there are no since beginning it is not moving. I have kept it in a slide mode. Okay. okay, is it in okay now? Right. Detection is same. So detection methods, uh, there are uh, high sensitivity method. The PCR is the most uh, accepted method for taking the HPV detections. Uh, low sensitivity and intersensitivity, these are less considered. Yes. Future directions, the role of HPV in etiology of oral cancer is essential for determining the prognosis and the treatment for these diseases. Various cellular proteins such as P53, cyclin, P3 have gained an importance in prognostic value. So why we are why we are interested in the HPV? Because the people which are having HPV in this common cell carcinoma, they need less radiation doses and less chemotherapeutic levels. So that is why the need for HPV-induced oral cancer carcinoma is stressed upon. And in short, coming about the herpes, other viruses, uh, herpes simplex virus 1 and 2, as HSV2 is more affinity towards the uh, genital, ocular, and oral lesions, they have a stimulate the cellular protein and shock proteins. So these infections may also lead into the phase 1 and phase 2 for the next viral transformation and converting into infectious lesions into the carcinogenics or the malignant lesions. Coming to viruses which are less frequently associated with squamous cell carcinomas. EBV virus, so I'll not go into the details of this, it is also termed as HHV14 virus so, and the lesions which are commonly involved are Burkitt's lymphoma and Hodgkin's disease but not squamous cell carcinoma, but they induce malignancies also, hepatocellular carcinomas. 
EBV, EBV virus and squamous cell carcinomas are also reported in some cases as shown here. EBV virus is also persistent in oral diseases such as oral squamous cell carcinoma and oral lichen planus also. So what is this thing now? The very few independent studies have been done for a HPV. Coming to hepatitis C virus, squamous cell carcinoma, and OLP. So hepatitis C virus is also identified in squamous cell carcinoma and also in oral lichen planus because this hepatitis C is, a, is responsible for hepatocellular carcinomas. So people say there is a tenden epithelial tendency is also since oral mucosa is also epithelium, there are chance, there are chances of getting hepatitis C viruses in the oral mucosa also if the proper studies have been done. So these are the some studies where uh, Nagora et al. Uh, they have uh, done 88 out of squamous cell carcinoma. They have found in the CRAS uh, of these patients where they are positive for squamous cell carcinoma. And oral lichen planus is also done by Bernard et al. So what they have done? They have, they have isolated. They have done a PCR studies and they have found hepatitis virus in oral squamous cell carcinoma and also in a precancerous lesions like oral lichen plants. So these are the few studies now people are also doing it on the uh, in recent studies in 2021 also. Uh, this is a small clipping taken from oral oncology. Uh, so people are also doing the uh, HPV studies for oral squamous cell carcinoma and also neck metastasis. Okay, this I have already shown. Uh, even we are also not left behind in 2000, September 2016 only, there was one Indian cooperative, uh, sorry, cooperative oncology network conference held, and they are stressing upon HPV associated endemic squamous cell carcinomas. What is the take home message here? Uh, we need to concentrate on viruses along with the tobacco and alcohol. It's a well known fact that tobacco and alcohols are associated with adenous squamous cell carcinomas, but viral etiology is less studied. So we need, in all these uh, squamous cell carcinomas uh, patients, what I need to stress upon, we need to do a molecular studies or we need to do a PCR studies, whether they are involved, whether HPV is isolated or not. If done, if done, the therapy, the modality for oral squamous cell carcinoma, treatment modality for oral squamous cell carcinoma differs. Because according to the studies, HPV induced squamous cell carcinoma need less radiation and less chemotherapy. Since we are targeting on the uh, inflammatory component or infectious component. I have to take more. Huh? So in the future, antiviral, antiviral pharmacotherapeutic approaches and therapeutic vaccinations. So you all know the vaccinations has been done for HPV viruses in cervical cancer. So if study is proven, then there is possibility of, uh, possibility, I'm not sure, possibility of giving vaccinations for oral squamous cell carcinoma. So if HPV is identified as a etiologic agent. So these are few references. Thank you for your uh, patience hearing. Um, it was a little bit uh, hurry up uh, presentations as because of the technical uh, issue. Thank you for opponent and thank you for all the patient listeners for the my lecture. Thank you once again. Hello. Yeah. Sir, can I ask one question? Sure. Uh, sir, I just wanted to know, uh, can you make uh, this thing that every CA patient or malignancy patient which has been coming to our institution has to be checked whether it has got any link with a oral cancer and if it has to be, uh, sorry, uh, oral cancer has a link with a virus and if it has to be checked, how it should go for Hello. 
हेलो हेलो सर आई एम आई ऑडियबल या यू आर ऑडियबल आई हैड आस्क वन क्वेश्चन टू सर या सर आई थिंक ही लेफ्ट वन सेकेंड सर वी प्लीज वेट आई विल लेट यू नो ओके ठीक है दिस नो प्रॉब्लम i would like to thank you everyone for uh, joining today and i thank all the keynote speakers guest speakers for the valuable presentation now we move on to the technical session yeah i request all the participants kindly join to the uh, res respective breakout room good afternoon can any organizer please uh, respond to my question i am i am the next presenter yes ma'am yes, yes, yes this is dr pratibha here uh am i supposed to join any breakout room because the agenda link was not opening for me or i stay here hello ma'am uh ma'am ma'am ma audible yes yes you are audible uh yeah pratima pratipa ma'am uh your hall is e ma'am i should join there yeah yeah ma'am thank you so much thank you yeah yeah, yeah. we are supposed to join but hello how we are supposed to join in the hall pratyu breakout sir am i audible sir yeah you are audible yeah yeah sir which is your breakout room sir your Even respective i also i also don't know how do we come to know that which is our breakout room okay okay actually the agenda has been shared to your email sir kindly check the agenda in the agenda your respect on c uh, sir your presentation is today on c on c mr rajay kulkarni okay. abbai kulkarni on c we will be assigning you in all c yeah thank you sir hello dr sandhya here hello Am I? Yeah. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I am Dr. Abhilasha, and I am session chair in uh, Hall E. But this is the link which I got, so I clicked on the link. Is yes, ma'am. Yes. In the mail, this is the link which I got in the mail. So I clicked and I came into this. So okay. Link for me. 
uh your hall is e ma'am uh, we yes, will assign e. ma'am yeah. yes ma'am we will assign no problem okay i'm supposed to be in hall b please uh, can you guide me sure sir hello hello yeah sir i'm dr shanwas gulani uh oh. Dr. Shana was Mulani. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Um, Shall I start my presentation? Yeah, yeah, sir. You can. Yes. I just want to confirm whether slides are moving or not. Is it? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Visible. Yeah. Fine. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Shanwas Mulari. I'm associate professor from Aditya Dental College at Saint Bead, Maharashtra. Today's my research topic is it's a uh, 3D finite element analysis. The title of this uh, research is Effect of Restrictive Crown of Different, different Cuspal Inclination and Occlusal Contact on Stress Distribution in Mandibular Second Premolar with Different Feral Configuration. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what? Uh, is it fine? Shall I continue? Yeah, sir. Please continue, sir. Yeah, yeah, fine. Thank you. Okay, in that happens, just click join. Okay, restorative dentistry or can be successful. Type. Restorative dentistry can be successful if dentist knows about the role of occlusion and clinician must have adequate knowledge regarding how these principles of occlusion works. There may be need of modification of occlusal design because the stress transfer, every tooth has its own stress pattern like anterior tooth has different stress pattern, posterior tooth has different stress pattern. That's why uh, we have come here with a presentation, which is right, uh, simulating our uh, conference theme, which is novel approach to the promulgating the latest innovation in field of dentistry. For this thing, row finite element analysis is suitable. Role of finite element analysis. The finite element analysis is a numerical method for solving problems of engineering and mathematical physics. Useful for the problems with complicated geometries, loading, and material properties where analytical solution cannot be obtained. This FEA are we are using in FEA since decade, and it has very important role nowadays. So we search the articles through PubMed, Google Scholar, and the Cochrane Library through the internet. And we formulated the systematic review, and we shortlisted 14 articles, which are quite matching to our research. First of all, we identified, we carried out gap analysis. Like in 19, uh, in 24, uh, Liu concluded that maxillary premolars with uh, facial dentin remaining shows higher local stresses. This uh, conclusion, but remark of our uh, our remarks was uh, in this study, there was uh, no consideration of type of occlusal contact and the study was conducted on maxillary. There was uh, uh, no, very few studies are uh, covered the mandibular posterior teeth. In another uh, few studies, they considered full ferule, but they didn't consider partial ferule. Uh, role of uh, in intraradicular material like fiber post, but they didn't compare with other posts. 
So this was the gap analysis. So we identified this gap and uh, we selected mandibular second premolar uh, because this uh, mandibular second premolar, which are exposed to the repetitive oblique occlusal forces, uh, which uh, which are translated. Uh, so for that, occlusal design should be modified to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to modification of occlusal design is done by changing the cusp inclination, which is the one of the parameter of our study. The second hmm, parameter yeah, is. I have to do. Oh, breakout rule. Okay, okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Second parameter is location and type of occlusal contact, and third parameter is the materials which we are going to use, like fiber post, gold alloy post. And what is the rationale of this study? As so we know, endodontically treated, endodontically treated teeth has shorter service life as compared to the vital tooth. Uh, so basically, that. this failure is due to the prosthetic than biological. So we need to find out the strategy to reducing the lateral forces to improve the biomechanical uh, behavior uh, of this, uh, and and that needs more scientific evidence. So research question we formulated. Does the cuspal inclination, occlusal contact, type of material and type of contact affect the restorative crown of endodontically treated mandibular second premolar in stress distribution of mandibular second premolar, thereby affect the longevity of abutment? As we say, and see this uh, research question is formulated in PICO format. So accordingly, for hypotheses were formulated. Then objectives were divided into the four types like to analyze and compare the effect of cuspal inclination with uh, cuspal inclination, type of occlusal contact, location of occlusal contact, and type of post material. Okay, research done. This is a computerized study. Also, we can call this numerical study, three-dimensional finite element analysis. So we prepared eight three-dimensional models, which are uh, which is of semendibular second premolar, which is having. Uh, partial ferrule like buccal ferrule, lingual ferrule, mesial, proximal ferrule, or no ferrule. So, as per objective, we divided these four groups. In first group, we uh, carried out three, we uh, considered three inclination like 20 degree, 30 degree, and 45 degree. In group B, we considered point contact and surface contact. In group C, we uh, changed the location of contact from top, mid, bottom of buccal cusp. And in group D, we considered, we compared fiber post and gold alloy post. It was anticipated that the study will generate the foundational level to how steep cuspal anatomy, type of occlusal contact, type of material will uh, produce mechanical failure or bone loss around the tooth with the help of 3D FIFEM analysis. Uh, we selected mandibular second premolar with the help of micro CT scan, which is consisting of 98 cells, slices with thickness of one millimeter. We prepared three three dimensional uh, model and constructed along with surrounding bone with cancellous and uh, cortical bone with the help of mimic software. Axial force of 200 Newton was considered. We we have taken care of standardization of this uh, model, but uh, accuracy was uh, done by uh, conducting convergent tests, which is nothing but refinement of mesh size. And validity of uh, this model plays very important role, which it depends on the extent to which tooth model reflected to the reliable condition. As we use CT scan, it has more accuracy, definitely validated, uh, more, all models are validated properly. This is a uh, flow chart for the how FEA conducted. We conducted first we, uh, uh, CT scan. We, we use CT scan to uh, prepare this model and with the help of MIMIC software. In this MIMIC software, after preparing this model with the help of HyperMesh software, we done intervention like post score, different material. And uh, with this finite element model, we apply the loads of 200 newtons. After applying load, we calculated displacement and stresses and which is in the form of color coding. This color coding uh, will be in the format of red and blue. Red denotes a maximum area of stress, the blue denotes minimum area of stress. This stress generated can be analyzed and accurately by assessing the stress concentration area. And the software which was used was the ANSYS 18.1 software. After that, results were seen and we plotted the chart. The stress distribution we calculated within the center of post, within the post dentin interface, crown core interface, within the peripheral bone and crown. This chart is for cuspal angulation. Same charts we got for uh, type of occlusal contact, then uh, for uh, location of occlusal contact, and then for uh, uh, comparison between fiber post and gold post.
okay then uh, after that we found we uh, observed and we concluded that uh, according to research question first research question was whether it affects the cuspal inclination to the stress dissolution and we found that under equivalent load the cuspal inclination of 45 degree resulted in more tensile stress as compared to the 20 to 33 degrees of inclination. The weight concluded that with increasing horizontal component load on the cusper inclination, greater and favorable tensile stresses were generated. Second uh, research question was regarding uh, type of occlusal contact. The point load application exert almost three time load on the processes. So concluded that when opposed to the surface contact, point load application causes greater strain within the crown. Safety of the crown region need to be checked under the point load application. The third research question was regarding location of occlusal contact. The maximum principal stress was gradually decreases as loading position moved from top to bottom of the cusp. So loading position changed from top to bottom of cusp and the maxillary primary stress gradually reduced. And finally, the regarding post material, when compared to the tools rebuilt uh, with the gold post alloy, glass fiber post has significantly superior fracture resistance and the post water strain. Uh, this is due to uh, quite similar uh, mechanical property as glass fiber post to the dentate. So critical appraisal of study, we found, we, uh, we identified the gap and we filled this gap how we feel that we identified the gap regarding cuspal inclination that how uh, there was a need to modify the cuspal anatomy to minimize the hazardous stresses within the tooth. So in this study, we concluded three different cuspal inclination and concluded lesser steep inclination generated favorable stresses within the tooth and associated structure. And second, uh, we need to evaluate whether point contact or surface contact play a favorable role or not. And we concluded that loading point generated hazardous stresses within the tooth. Same kind of regarding uh, occlusion, uh, location of uh, 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 location of loading, and it concluded that the maximum principal stress gradually decreases from loading position from low to the top to the bottom. And one more thing uh, regarding ferrule, the complete and partial ferrule plays important role in distributing stresses in favorable manner. So how we uh, generated, what uh, knowledge we generated in this study. Occlusal geometry is a crucial factor, which uh, that's why the better knowledge uh, of occlusal geometry should be known by the technician and clinician, technician and the clinician also. The maximum principal stress fell gradually from loading position from top to bottom, and uh, which allows dentists to successfully minimize the cusp inclination and weaker tip. By including the ferrule, uh, tooth, the, the tooth resistance power can be increased. The remaining tooth structure should be strengthened by adding the ferrule in the uh, tooth preparation. The root fracture can be minimized by use of fiber post system. The limitation of study, this is the linear analysis and it does not simulate the static uh, dynamic condition in the masticative system. It was all the material were assumed to be bonded to the structure and coefficient of friction was not considered. For that, further in vitro and in vivo studies are necessary to uh, uh, for in vitro and in, in, uh, in vivo analysis are necessary. Okay. Then uh, what translatory component were actualized in this study? The study has generated a foundational level with respect to the cusper inclination, type of occlusal contact, location of occlusal contact, and different types of most material. Okay. Cervical ferrule also appeared to be determining factor resulting in minimizing the stress that could possibly increase the risk of fracture. That's all by bibliography and thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful presentation. Next, yeah. we move on to the technical session. Now, I would like to welcome our session chair to give presentation, Dr. Monica Chaudhary, Associate Professor, Department of Conservative Dentistry and Endodontics, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. Topic, comparative evaluation of sealing ability of three different materials as percal perforation repair material by using a dye extraction leakage method and
good afternoon am i audible yes ma'am you are audible ma'am we welcome you ma'am thank you abhinand to for giving me the opportunity to present here my topic of paper is comparative evaluation of sealing ability of three different material as percal perforation repair material by using dye extraction leakage method it is an in vitro study these are the content i will cover first introduction part maintaining the integrity of natural dentition is important for proper function and natural aesthetic and endodontic therapy can play a vital role in achieving this goal yes during endodontic treatment there are certain problem can arises at different stages and these errors collectively termed as procedural accident or endodontic mishaps here we are talking about the percal perforation this percal perforation according to american association of endodontists glossary of endodontic term it defines perforation as the mechanical or pathological communication between the root canal system and the external tooth surface and according according to cells the perforation is the second greatest cause of failure in endodontic therapy mm -hmm. and yeah. the accidental perforation of root mm -hmm. and the For nine point six percent of failed cases, percal perforation. It is a mid mid opening. It is occur during the search of the root canal orifice and the persistent bleeding into the pulp space may be the first evidence of percation perforation. The perforation in this percal area it are treated either conservatively or surgically. the selection of the restorative material for this purpose it is an important factor in determining the prognosis of this perforated tooth in search for the ideal material numerous sealing materials and the techniques have been tested over the year with varying success now comes to the aims and objective of my study the purpose of this present study was to compare and evaluate the sealing ability of three different material first biodentin endo second endo seal mta and third endo sequence bc rrm fast set putty as percal perforation repair material in mandibular molar by using dye extraction leakage method methodology for this study 80 extracted human mandibular molar with non fused and well developed roots were collected the exclusion criteria were teeth with fused root cracked teeth and extensively decayed tooth after extraction teeth were kept in 5% sodium hypochlorite solution to remove soft debris and stored in normal saline until they were used in study then the teeth were decoronated 3 mm above the furcal area and the root were amputated 3 mm below the furcation area after that a cis cavity was prepared then the root canal orifice and the section root surface covered with sticky wax so that uh, it prevent dye penetration into the root all the samples were clearly painted uh, with the nail paint and then furcal perforation was made with the help of round bar number 2 then repair of perforation in group 1 the perforation repaired with biodentin in group 2 perforation repaired with endo seal mta and in group 3 perforation repaired with endo sequence bc rrm fast set putty and group 4 used as a positive control in which it left unrepaired after that the teeth all the samples kept in normal saline uh, again uh, at 37 degree celsius temperature in 100% humidity for 24 hour to allow the material to set and then samples immerse in methylene blue dye for 48 hour measurement of micro leakage each tooth was stored in a test tube containing 2 ml of 65% nitric acid for 3 days for the complete dissolution then 
Thus, the solution obtained for centrifuge at 3,500 RPM for five minutes to separate the debris. After centrifugation, 200 microliter supernatant liquid placed in 96 wells microplay, and then the collected supernatant solution was then analyzed in ultraviolet visible spectrophotometer at 550 nanometer wavelength. Observation and results: uh, concentrated nitrogen value 0.065 used as a reference, and then. The data was coded and entered into Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. Analysis was done using SPSS version 20 Windows software program. The analysis of variance with post hoc took a test was used for comparison of all clinical indicators. This was the result. The table showing highest and the lowest dye absorbance value of all four groups. You can see. The fourth group that is positive control, it showed highest dye absorbance value. And all three groups in which group three showed lowest dye absorbance value, that is endoseal, endosequence BC RRM fast set particle. Group four showed statistically significant results with group one, two, and three. And the rest of the Discussion coming to the discussion part. An ideal perforation repair material it should provide it should be biocompatible, bactericidal, and it should not affected by the blood contamination. It should not be extruded during condensation. It induces bone formation and healing, radio opaque. It should induce mineralization, cementogenesis, and easy in manipulation and placement. As we all know, MTA it is a cal calcium silicate based material and it is commonly used as a perforation repair material. Several studies have confirmed its clinical and the radiographic success. But despite of favorable properties of MTA that it supports its clinical use, it has several clinical drawbacks such as prolonged setting time, its difficult handling property which is depending on the water powder ratio. Discoloration potential of gray MTA, its low washout resistance and high material cost. Hence, in, attempt, in order to attempt to modify the properties of MTA and to overcome the shortcoming of MTA, a variety of new calcium silicate based material have been formulating. For example, biodentine, bio MTA, bio, bio aggregate, MTA angulus, MTA plus, retro MTA. Endoseal MT and endosequence root repair material. In my study, I compared three materials biodenty, endoseal MT, and endosequence BC RRM fast set 20. All these materials have different working properties. For example, biodentine, it has to be mixed with a sterile liquid to a desired consistency, while endosequence BC RRM fast set 20, it is ready to use as packaged and its consistency like cavit G. It is simple to remove putty from the syringe. Endoseal MT, it is a pre-mixed and pre-loaded syringe that allows direct application of material into the perforated area without requiring powder liquid mixing and eliminate the potential of heterogeneous consistency during on-site mixing. So in my study, endosequence BCRRM fast set putty showed less dye absorbance and less leakage than the biodentine and endoseal MT. And the endoseal MTA, which is an injectable material, paste like consistency, it has not been studied before in the repair of Urkel perforation. And this group showed high dye absorbance, means uh, its sealing ability is less than the biodentine and the endosequence BCRRM fast set putty. The high dye absorbance of endoseal MTA may be because Inability to, to properly condense the MTA due to its space like con con consistency could have lead to void formation. And it is an injectable material which is susceptible to be extruded. The extruded material had a rough surface. Experimentally, it might be responsible for high dye absorbance value. And in a clinical situation, it may mechanically irritate the periodontal tissues. And uh, in my study, biodentine exhibited less dye absorbance than MTA. 
which may be because biodentin it bonds chemomechanically with the tooth along with the formation of tag like structure these tags composed of calcium or phosphate rich crystalline deposits and these bonding increases over time and minimizing the gap between the tooth and the biodentin so the superior sealability of biodentin also shown in different studies endo sequence bc rrm fast set pt it shows least dye absorbent and best seal than the biodentin and endo seal mta this endo sequence pt its particle size its particle size is very less it's a nano particle which allows the mix penetrate into the dentanal tubule and they interact with the moisture present in the dentine and resulting in better mechanical bonding of endo sequence and the tooth structure let's move to conclusion of this study there is no repair material was capable of producing a few tight seal all three material have comparable sealing ability as a percal perforation repair material and two sequence bc rrm fast set putty and biodentin presented better sealing capacity which may be related to less initial solubility which observed for these material in relation to endo seal mt because endo seal mt it is in paste like consistency endo sequence provided an excellent seal for percal perforation repair at the same time it also provide comfortable handling property because it is available in putty consistency endo seal mt showed least sealing ability among three groups because its higher initial flow and paste like consistency the present result suggested that endo seal mt has the potential to be developed as a percal repair material but should be used with an internal matrix in the extrusion of material however the best seal was provided by endo sequence putty still further research with the application of different technique would be helpful further studies needed to be conducted to evaluate the sealing ability of endo sequence putty biodentin and endo seal mt thank you these are my references thank you let's thank you so sorry ma'am Okay, ma'am, I'm done. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your wonderful presentation. Next, Dr. Neetu Jhandal, Professor and Head Department of Conservative Dentistry and Endodontics, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. Topic: Photodynamic Antimicrobial Chemotherapy for Presentation for Prevention and Treatment of Dental Caries and Ultra Conservative Approach. we welcome you ma'am over to you good afternoon everyone my slides are visible yes ma'am Yeah, please wait. Good afternoon, everyone. I am going to present a review on photodynamic activated chemotherapy for management of deep carious lesions and ultra conservative approach. this will be covered under following headings introduction photodynamic activated chemotherapy components of pet history mechanism various photosensitizers advantages of pet effectiveness of pet concept of clinical pet like sources and finally conclusion first of all introduction the human oral cavity is heavily colonized by a complex relatively specific and highly interrelated range of microorganisms collectively known as normal oral microflora a change in a key environmental factor will trigger a shift in the balance of the resin and microflora which will promote the emergence of acidogenic bacteria the constant accumulation of these kind of bacteria change the equilibrium towards dental demineralization which leads to caries dental caries is common 
and it is among the most significant human infectious diseases that results in the progressive dissolution of enamel with the disease progression it can lead the underlying dentin compromising the vitality of the tooth so prevention of dental caries can be achieved by controlling the accumulation of dental plaque by antimicrobial chemical agents such as we can use chlorhexidine but unfortunately this preventive approach does not reach the population of microorganism as a whole allow the dental cavity formation due to emergence of antibiotic resistant strains alteration in taste burning sensation increase of calculus formation and staining of teeth and restorative materials stimulated a search for alternative treatments recently approaches that might offer the possibility of efficient intra oral bacterial count reduction with minimum damage to systemic health that is preventive approach and avoids secondary caries development reducing the chance of material substitution and pulp inflammation as well that is curative approach are necessary for these circumstances photodynamic antimicrobial chemotherapy offers a possibility of a novel modality to reduce pathogenic bacteria and consequently prevent against new dental caries lesions so this review proposes that this technology has a great potential to recover from the bacterial resistance associated with bacterial biofilm formation Now, what is PET? It is a promising strategy to eliminate pathogenic bacteria. Its mechanism of action occurs via the cytotoxic reactive oxygen species, which are generated by the photosensitive component after light irradiation. There are various components of PET like photosensitizers, light, and oxygen. The history is: it was discovered accidentally at the beginning of twentieth century. it was applied in the medical field for the inactivation of cells microorganisms by light activation the term photodynamic action was introduced in 1904 by von tappeler one of the photobiologist in 1911 hospital conducted a study on the biological effects of hematoporphyrin and reported on the effect of light and hematoporphyrin in red blood cells and described skin reactions in mice that are exposed to light In 1930, the same study was carried out on humans. Later, Dog, Herlov, and Marcus renamed it photodynamic therapy. Photodynamic therapy was approved by Food and Drug Administration in 1999 to treat pre-cancerous skin lesions of the face and scalp. And later in 20th century, we are using it in dentistry. Now, what is the mechanism behind the PET? See, we can see in this diagram there is a visible light. and this is the photo uh, sensitizer after absorption of light the photo sensitizer is excited to a higher excited singlet state this is the singlet state this is immediately followed by intersystem crossing of the excited photo sensitizer the electrons are then quenched by molecular oxygen to generate the toxic reactive oxygen species which are able to damage nucleic acid and plasmatic membrane with consequent microorganism death so this was the mechanism of photodynamic therapy now various photosensitizers which we use in this first generation photosensitizer was available in 1970s they may be ingested orally applied topically or injected intravenously depending upon the agents they possess photophysical chemical and biological characteristics they have been classified based on their chemical structures like these can be tetrapyrroles furopumarins tricyclic dyes and some commercially available are photofrin foscan ama now what are the advantages of photoactivated chemotherapy it has been extensively investigated for the treatment of several microorganisms including bacterial oral pathogens in both in vitro and clinical trials it is rapid non toxic non invasive antimicrobial approach furthermore another advantage of pact compared to antibiotics is that bacteria do not develop resistance to oxygen species and there is no need for anesthesia as compared to chlorhexidine as we as we use the chlorhexidine in oral cavity to reduce the load of microorganism pact does not exert the reported side effects now what is the effectiveness of pact it has the capability of photosensitizer interacting with the bacterial membrane then second is penetration ability of photosensitizer and action inside the cell 
then there is a release of oxygen species formation around the bacterial cell by illumination of photosensitizers. So therefore, the efficiency of PET, the dye must be activated by proper wavelength from the light sources. Thus, the basic requirement of light is that they match the activation absorption spectrum of the photosensitizer and provide the adequate dose of energy that are able to transit to a higher energy triplet state. Now, what is the concept of clinical packed light sources? We can use three light sources like lasers, LED, halogen lamps. Lasers have some advantages such as monochromaticity and high efficiency that is greater than 90% and high potency as well. However, they do have a high cost and requires a separate unit for each photosensitizer due to different absorption wavelength. On the other hand, the main advantages of LED over lasers are their low cost, portability, easy configuration, arrays into different irradiation geometrics, and it demonstrated the same antimicrobial effects on S. Newton's biofilm viability as stated by recent publications. Filtered halogen lamps have the advantage that can be spectrally filtered to match any photosensitizer. However, they cannot be efficiently coupled into optical fiber bundles or liquid light guides. This is a photographic representation in which we can see this is the carrier's root. We can see the caries on the later walls or on the pulpal floor. Now we are going to remove the carrier's lesion from the later walls, but we will remain the carrier's lesion over, over the pulpal floor. After that, take a micro, uh, you can uh, micro punch the pulpal floor and then we will collect the sample. After that, methylene blue dye is injected and the laser irradiation has been done. After that, again, we will micro punch and collect the sample and finally fill the cavity with the temporary filling material. Now coming to discussion, even though controversies persist regarding how much tissue must be removed to arrest the caries process, the literature appears to discourage the excessive removal of dentine over the pulpal surface, supporting the idea of minimal invasive procedures. According to this concept, it is favorable to maintain a layer of partly demineralized filling material to preserve pulpal tissue vitality, especially to encourage the reparative process of tubular sclerosis and tertiary dentine formation. It has already been demonstrated that oral bacteria organized in biofilms can be susceptible to PET. Wilson verified that a substantial reduction in the bacterial count was achieved when plaque samples obtained from blunt ears were treated with the toluene blue O or phthalocyanin and exposed to red light. Analysis though cone focal laser scanning microscopy of multi-species biofilm cultured from saliva samples and treated with the TVO showed bacterial reduction of 97.4% after irradiation with a low power laser. Pre-irradiation exposure time seems to be an important factor for photosensitizer diffusion through the tissue. It is known that the high concentration of dyes can induce the phenomena of self-quenching, reducing the amount of light that actually reaches the bacteria and induces the generation of reactive oxygen species. This effect may have interfered in the effectiveness of PET, which warrants new studies with lower dye concentration. However, because the degree of photo damage is dependent upon the of the laser light, a higher concentration was chosen mainly because of the complexity of the substrate. Even though many studies have shown that PACT is an effective antimicrobial technique, most were performed with bacteria in an aqueous suspension, which is different from those conditions found in the oral cavity. It has been demonstrated that interposing 150 micrometer dentine slices between the laser light source and the bacteria leads to a reduction of 50% in the power density of the light source, although substantial kills were obtained. In addition, it is important and clinically convenient to have short exposure times. Therefore, the use of greater power density may represent an advantage. Several previous reports have demonstrated that different light sources and photosensitizers can be combined to promote the bacteriocidal effect. The dental plaque disclosing agent erythrocin was considered a potential photosensitizer for treatment of S. Newton's biofilm grown in vitro when combined with a white light source. The complete elimination of S. Newton's in a planktonic culture was a well demonstrated when it was previously treated with different concentrations combined with a held photopolymerizer or TBO combined with a light emitting diode. 
considering that longer wavelengths enable the deeper penetration of light into tissues the association between a blue dye and a red light source was preferred methylene blue has shown significant phototoxicity in different types of oral bacteria involved in periodontal diseases and endodontic infections among others because this photosensitizer has an intrinsic positive charge it can efficiently bind to both gram positive and negative bacteria gust demonstrated that fact was effective in decontamination of carious bovine dentine that was artificially induced using a light emitting diode light source and two different photosensitizers so the association of tbo and led also resulted in a significant decrease in the viability of total streptococci mutants streptococci lactobacilli and total microorganisms on dental caries produced in situ so finally i want to conclude my presentation by saying that although the achieved antimicrobial effect appears to be limited it may still be considered a clinically relevant outcome and agrees with other clinic literature encourages the maintenance of a layer of affected dentine over the pulpal wall in order to avoid pulp exposure in this way any immediate bacterial reduction obtained for dentine decontamination would increase the chances of treatment success and it is expected that further reduction occurs over time if a filling material is properly placed these are the references thank you for your attention thank you so much ma'am for you. your wonderful presentation next we move on to the technical session conservative dentistry and endodontic session i would like to welcome the technical session conservative dentistry and endodontic session chairs dr monica choudhury associate professor department of conservative dentistry and endodontics surendra dental college and research institute rajasthan india and dr neetu chandal professor and head department of conservative dentistry and endodontics surendra dental college and research institute rajasthan india before we move on to the session i would like to inform about the presentation timing i request all the participants strict to their timings oral presentation for 8 minutes poster presentation for 3 minutes and 2 minutes for question and answer a oral presentation by dr nimish tayagi kalka dental college and hospital topic the shear bound strength of mta with three different types of adhesive system over to you dr nimesh are you there i think doctor is not available here next Let's we move go. next we move on to the another presentation a oral presentation by dr anjali delu Subharati Dental College, Meerut. Doctor Anjali. Please share your screen. I think we should start with Dr. Aman Kaur Sachdeva. Yes, ma'am. Next, we move on to the oral presentation by Dr. Amandeep Kaur Sachdev, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute. A topic is awaited irrigation versus conventional non-activated irrigation in endodontics. Good morning, ma'am. Ma'am, sorry for the inconvenience. Actually, Doctor Vartika Jhunejja will be sharing under the same name. We will have different presentations, but we will do under the same name due to some technical issues. Ma'am, shall I start? 
Yes, start, Tanu. Good afternoon, everybody. I myself, Dr. Raman Sachdeva from Surendra Dental College and Research Institute is going to present the poster and the topic is activated irrigation versus non versus conventional non-activated irrigation in endodontics. Initially, the needle was introduced until resistance was felt and the needle should be withdrawn two to three mm and then irrigated. But still the microbes thrived after the treatment in lateral, accessory canals, fins, isthmi, and anastomosis. When it was considered as a failure, activated irrigation came, in which the root canal systems were agitated by mechanical or another energy forms. It delivered the irrigant up to the working length without causing any post-operative pain and in ensuring canal and isthmus cleanliness. After that, many things came like ultrasonic, laser-activated, microbrush, vibrinch, endoactivator, photoactivated disinfection, endovac, and PIPs. Now, many studies were done to do their intergroup comparison when the conventional syringe irrigation, vibrinch, and passive ultrasonic irrigation was compared. Passive ultrasonic irrigation was considered to be the best. Likewise, when the comparative evaluation of the photoactivated disinfection and sonic irrigation as an adjunct to conventional irrigation on e in root canals was done, Sonic irrigation was considered to be the best. And in vitro comparison of new irrigation and agitation techniques to ultrasonic agitation was done in removing bacteria, then the agitation techniques was considered to be the best. Now, the main activated irrigation versus conventional non-activated irrigation in endodontics, a systemic review was done, and it was concluded that mechanical active irrigation devices are best in delivering the irrigant. Thank you so much. Nice presentation, Dr. Raman. Thank you, ma'am. Vertika, Dr. Vertika. Uh, next, we move on to the Dr. Vertika Pabnija, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute. A topic is molecular diagnosis, a modernist approach of caries detection. Move over to you. Good afternoon, respected panel. I'll be presenting my poster on the topic Molecular Diagnosis, a Modernist Approach for Caries Detection. As we all know, caries diagnosis can be done by two approaches, culture and molecular analysis. Molecular analysis of microbial infection provides us information about the etiology of microbial infections. These methods make a comprehensive analysis of the microbiota difficult to achieve. Whereas the molecular technology reliably identifies cultivated bacteria, including strains with aberrant phenotypic behavior, rare isolates, poorly described or uncharacterized bacteria, and newly named species. Molecular diagnosis can be done by two approaches, species-specific and broad-range analysis. The species-specific analysis helps us to identify a specific species, and broad-range analysis helps us to identify broad range of the microbiota. In this, first we will start with the sampling procedure, followed by DNA extraction, then followed by PCR broad-range primers, and sequencing will be done. In broad range analysis, the sampling is followed by DNA extraction, PCR broad range primers are used, which is followed by cloning and use of DGGE and TRFLP analysis, and then it is sequenced further. Molecular finger. As we all know, molecular approach identifies around 45% of the different microbial species. As Compared to the culture method, which helps us to identify around 32%, whereas both these methods help us to identify 23% of the total bacterial species. Now we all know that the most uh, used method for caries diagnosis is the X-ray radiographic method, which is based on the 
principle of specificity, whereas a new method is introduced, that is a spectroscopy method, which helps us to identify the caries detection through the concept of predictivity, in which we can identify caries before the onset of the lesion. It, the Raman spectroscope is a five component system, which includes a light delivery source, a light emitting diode, a Raman probe, a signal delivery system, and a signal detection system. At last, I would like to conclude that to sidestep the limitations of culture, tools, and procedures, molecular diagnosis approach has given a more realistic description of the microbial world without the need for cultivation relying on certain genes that contain revealing information about the microbial identity. Thank you. Any questions? Next, we move on to the next presentation. Dr. Amandeep Kaur, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute. A topic is penetration depth of 2% chloroxidine, dicolconate and Chitosan into radicular dental tubules by different agitations method using CLSM and Invetro study. Over to you. Please start your session. Good afternoon, ma'am. Today, I will be presenting my paper on evaluation of the influence of different irrigate agitation method on penetration depth of 2% chlorhexidine digluconate and chitosin into radicular dentinal tubules using cone focal edges scanning microscope and in vitro study. So, it will be covered under the following contents. Start with the introduction. Apical periodontitis and associated pathologies are primarily due to the bacterial infection. Endodontic treatment's main goal is to eradicate microorganisms from the root canal system and prevent them from the infecting or reinfecting the root canal or peripical tissue. The pulp space and dentinal tubules must be avoid reinfection of a treated root canal. Endodontic irrigant must meet stringent criteria, including the absence of toxicity to the peripical tissue, the ability to dissolve the tissue and to lack of the microorganism killing characteristic. Key faculty show a critical role in root canal failure because it can colonize the dentinal tubules, which are unreachable to the chemomechanical disinfection or hot defense system. EDTA, sodium hypochlorite, and calcium hydroxide have all been shown to be ineffective, ineffective against the E. faculty in a number of scientific research. So when applied at a concentration of the 2% chlorhexidine has been demonstrated to be effective at eliminating the efficalis from the dentinal tubules. The intimacy of this contact depends on the vatability of the solution on the solid dentin. The efficiency of an endodontic irrigant could therefore be improved by reducing its surface tension because vatability of such solution is of primary importance in their penetration of the main and the lateral canal and the pre-dentin dentinal tubules. The penetrating ability of the irrigant and flushing action created by the irrigation are dependent not only on the anatomy of the root canal system, but also on the system of the delivery, the depth of the placement volume, and the fluid property of the irrigant, that is the surface tension and the viscosity. So the aim of the present study is to evaluate the penetration depth of 2% chlorhexidine and chitosin into root dentinal tubule by agitating it with a different method of irrigations and seen under the corn focal laser skinning microscope. So these are the aims and objectives. First, assess the penetration depth of 2% chlorhexidine and chitosin into root dentinal tubules on the basis of surface tension and viscosity. Second, to check the influence of the different irrigation method on the penetration depth of the chlorhexidine and chitosin and the coronal, middle, and the apical level. So, this study was carried out in the Department of Conservative Dentistry and Endodontics. And 
confocal edges can be microscope in the sopalitic analytic faculty punjab university chandigarh so these were the materials and irrigation irrigants which were used in this study and these were the armamentarium which were used in this study so move on the methodology total 88 single canal maxillary anterior were selected for this study the corner portion of the each tooth was sectioned using diamond disc to standardize the root length and 15 mm working length was determined after that bmp was done using crown down technique with rotary protaper ball system up to file number f4 then canal was irrigated with the 5.25% uh, sodium hypochlorite between the each instrumentation after that canal was rinsed with 3 ml of 70% edta for 1 minute and finally rinsed with saline for 4 minute then a solution of about 0.1 g protamin b dye b dye was mixed with these two solutions which was the final irrigants then surface tension and viscosity was measured using viscometer and staglometer then total sample is divided into the two experimental group for group 1 chlorhexidine and rhodamin b dye then group 2 2% chitosin and r then those two groups further divided into four sub group on the basis of the different agitation method these are conventional needle irrigation manual dynamic agitation sonic irrigation and passive ultrasonic irrigation after the whole agitation procedure the teeth were cross section at apical middle and corner level using diamond disc to obtain a dentin section of 1 mm thickness then this section was viewed under the confocal edges scanning microscope to evaluate the penetration depth for both chlorhexidine and chitosin then the result obtained were subjected to statical analysis by one way anova and tate post hoc test then we will measure the viscosity and the surface tension of the chlorhexidine and the chitosin so the values for the chlorhexidine the viscosity and the surface tension of the chlorhexidine was lower than the chitosin that's why chlorhexidine was were was better penetrated into the root dentinal tubules than the chitosin so come to the table which uh, illustrated the penetration depth at the corneal middle and the apical level as you can see with the ultrasonic penetration method the chlorhexidine group show maximum penetration at the corneal middle and the apical level as compared to the other three groups and also chitosin show the better penetration with the ultrasonic irrigation at the corneal middle and the apical level than the other uh, irrigation method these are the cone focal images which demonstrated the penetration depth of the chlorhexidine at the corneal middle and the apical level as you can see the maximum penetration with the ultrasonic irrigation device at the corneal middle and the apical level as same as for the chitosin chitosin show the maximum penetration as the corneal middle and the apical level as compared to the other agitation devices then the discussion the primary goal of the chemo mechanization of the root canal system is eradication of the pulpal tissue organic and inorganic debris bacteria and their toxic by product through the use of such instruments and irrigation devices there are various new root canal irrigants like chlorhexidine digluconate chitosin electrochemically activated solution ozonated water photo activated disinfection and herbal irrigants in the present study 2% chlorhexidine and chitosin was used apart from the positive antimicrobial efficacy of the chlorhexidine it has got substantivity chlorhexidine is a base itself capable of forming salt with a number of the organic acids because of its cationic property chlorhexidine can bind to the hydroxyapatite of the dentin and gradual release of this bond chlorhexidine may protect the canal against the microbial colonization beyond the actual medication period and chitosin was also used as an irrigant because chitin is the most abundant natural polysaccharide partial deacetylation of the chitin result in the production of the chitosin chitosin has shown a large number of the pharmaceutical applications activation of the irrigation increase the efficacy of the irrigant to a great extent then various irrigant activation system include sonic ultrasonic agitation manual activation gut and with gutta percha cone and agitation with brushes and conventional needle methods the te technique involved dispensing of an irrigant into a canal through the needle and cannulas of variable gauze either passively or with the agitation the later is achieved by moving the needle tip up and down the canal space some of these needles are designed to dispenses and irrigants through their most distal end whereas other are designed to deliver and irrigants laterally through the closed and side venting needles then manual dynamic irrigation was significantly more effective than the automated dynamic irrigation system because of the push pull motion of a well fitting gutta percha point in the canal might generate the 
higher intracanal pressure changes during the pushing movement leading to more effective delivery of the irrigant to the untouched canal surfaces then the use of the ultrasound during at the end of the root canal preparation phase is necessary step to improve the endodontic disinfection the range of the frequency used in the ultrasonic use is bit, unit is between the 25 and 40 kilohertz the effectiveness of the ultrasound in the irrigation is determined by its ability to produce the cavitation and acoustic streaming the sonic irrigation device designs allows for the safe activation of the various intracanal reagents and could produce a vigorous intracanal fluid agitation so in this study disinfectants and the corneal third of the root canal show the better penetration in the both the groups and the least amount of penetration at the apical third level because of the density of the tentinal tubules is less in the apical third as compared to the cervical area and the amount of the peritubular dentin is also more in the apical area so these reason could be attributed attributed for the lesser penetration of the disinfectant in the apical third Hence, 2% disinfectant chlorhexidine and chitosin, along with the passive ultrasonic irrigation, can be an effective final irrigation technique for better disinfection of the root canals. There is no literature or study evaluating the penetration of the chitosin in the dentinal tubules. So, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first study that is has been done in vitro using chitosin with all the mentioned irrigation system together. It need more and more study. So, within the limitation of this study, it was concluded that 2% chlorhexidine show the maximum depth of penetration. With the passive ultrasonic irrigation, chlorhexidine and chitosin were penetrated more in the apical third of the root canal as compared to the other devices, and these differences were statically significant. Ultrasonic and sonic irrigation performed better penetrating into dentinal tubules than the side vented needles, which is also statically significant as compared to the chlorhexidine and chitosin group. Chlorhexidine showed the better penetration in dentinal tubules than the chitosin groups. These are the references. Thank you. Doctor Amandeep, what is substantivity? Bacterial. What do you mean by substantivity? Can you just answer that question? There are two factors, no? Substantivity and one more factor. What is the other factor? It's effective against the bacterial effectiveness against the bactericidal and bacteriostatic property. And what is the other factor? Shall we look it up? There are two factors responsible. Along with substantivity, there is one more. Anyway, you look it up, okay? Dr. Aman? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me, Dr. Aman? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, please tell me why you have checked the viscosity and surface tension of irrigants. Because uh, when we, uh, because of the penetration of the irrigants into the root and end tubules, we check the viscosity and the surface tension. Why it is important to check it? Any irrigant you can take, no? Why did you check it before? Because uh, when the irrigant is more viscous or more viscosity, it does not penetrate into the dentinal tubules. If the liquid is less viscous and less viscosity, then it got penetrated into the dentinal tubule easier. And chitosan was available in which form? It is available in both powder and liquid form. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ramandi. Thank you. And our next presentation is by Dr. Arshdeep Gill, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute. A topic is influence of 2% CHX on immediate and delayed shear bound strength of compensate resin to dentine using total H and self H detine bounding system and in vetro study. Over to you. Good afternoon, ma'am. I, Dr. Ashtip Gill, PG, third year student from Department of Conservative Dentistry and Endodontics. 
is presenting a paper on the topic influence of 2% chlorhexidine on immediate and delayed shear bond strength of composite tracing to dentine using two different bonding system that is total H and self H and it is an in vitro study. Dr. Harsh is can we cover under following contents. Screen is not introduction. The demand of aesthetic restoration are popular because of their magnificent aesthetic and improved physical and mechanical properties. A stable bond formation between restorative material and dentine in Please uh, share your screen. For long term success of the restoration. Please share Arsh. your screen. Your screen is the bonds. Uh, Arsha? My, uh, are my slides are visible? In, no, your sli oh. slides are invisible. Kindly check it, check it down. Yes, now visible. Great. Thank you. Maybe. Yes, please start. My slides are visible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am, you start. Okay. First of all, introduction. The demand of aesthetic restorations are popular because of their magnificent aesthetic and improved physical and mechanical properties. A stable bond formation between restorative material and dentine is necessary for long-term success of the restoration. The bond strength of enamel is usually stable, but in case of dentine, it is recorded to be decreased by 30 to 40 percent after six months and 60 to 80 percent after one year. Most studies showed that degradation of Arshad, is there any technical issue? Yes, ma'am. Kindly be fast, others are waiting. So Dr. Bharti can start. Next is Dr. Bharti. Meanwhile, she can start if she is ready. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, next, I would like to welcome Dr. Bharati Lissa, uh, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute. A topic is repair share bound strength of aged resin compensate after, after different surface treatments and its mode of failures and in vitro study. Over to you. Bharati? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You can. Please start your session, ma'am. I request all the participants be ready with your PPT. Start 
Please start your presentation, ma'am. Only we have uh, eight minutes for your presentation. Dr. Bharti, your screen is visible. Please start your presentation. Some technical issue is there. Please next. Okay. Next, we move on to the presentation by Dr. Deepa Chautri, Institute of Dental Science, Sherora. Topic: A non-surgical endodontic management of minimal or. Move on to you, Dr. Chief. Deepa Chautri. Yes, I'm. I'm here only. Ma. Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, one and all. I'm Dr. Deva Chaudhary from Institute of Dental Sciences, Seora, Jammu Kashmir. So today I shall be presenting a paper on non-surgical endodontic management of mini molar. Okay. So first, we have to know that why this topic, why I've chosen this topic. We all are very well versed with uh, root canal treatments. But yes, there are difficulties found during endodontic treatment, and they are mainly due to variations in the root canal morphology. Due to this, there can be an extra root or canal that can provide an additional challenge. This overall, uh, we have to modify the cavity design, canal assess, and localization, thus cleaning and shaping of the canal. So for us, yes, root canal variations are a big challenge. Awareness of root canal morphology and careful interpretation, uh, uh, careful interpretation of preoperative radiographs is necessary for success during endodontic therapy. We all have two-dimensional image of a three-dimensional object in form of radiographs. So yes, their management is also a, a big challenge for us. The earlier these complex root canal configuration are anticipated the more likely one can properly manage intracanal preparation and filling procedures. So since my case is about a maxillary molar, so we are going to study the variation of a maxillary molar. Maxillary molar has highly variable root canal morphology. Maxillary first premolar, we all know that typically it has two well-formed root, and this is seen in 56% of population. But yes, there can be one root in 40% of population. But problem arises when it has three roots. That is in 0.5 to 6% of population. Frequently, one canal is seen in each of the three roots. And when we talk about maxillary second molar, premolar, the variation decreases further. That is, it is 0.3 to 2%. When maxillary premolar has one palatal and two buccal roots, that is the mesiobuccal and a distobuccal, it is called as a mini molar. Two scientists, Bilizi and Hertzwick, they classify these into three categories. First is the total fusion, that is fusion of all three roots or only two buccal or semi-fusion or free palatal root. Then category two was normal separation of the buccal roots at the mid or the apical third level with either semi-fusion or free palatal root. And third category was normal separation of the buccal roots up to the cervical level with a free palatal and a, it shows the classic tripod appearance. So now I come to my case report. 
Yeah, my case report was about a 54 year old female patient. She came to us in the department of conservative and endodontics for root canal of uh, tooth number 14. The patient mainly complained of pain in the upper uh, tooth region since two weeks. On taking medical history, it was non contributory and clinical examination revealed a large carious lesion in the distal proximal aspect of the first uh, uh, upper right first premolar. Tooth was tender, no periodontal pocket was present, and thermal and electric pipe testing elicited a negative response. Radiographic examination, the, uh, the picture here it is shown, that is revealed a distoproximal radiolucency suggestive of dental caries with palpal involvement. There was widening of the periodontal ligament space in relation uh, 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 with periapical radiolucency in relation to the distobuckle uh, and the palatal root. This is shown in the figure and uh, I've marked it with red arrows. Based on all this information, we came to the diagnosis of chronic irreversible pulpitis followed by symptomatic apical periodontitis. And this was the diagnosis which we made. And treatment plan of all this was a root canal uh, therapy followed by a full coverage crown. The treatment was as following. After administration of local anesthesia, the tooth was isolated with rubber dam and cotton rolls, caries were excavated with round burr and root canal therapy was initiated. endo assessed burr was used to modify the edges of the assess opening in order to make it more triangle and confirmation at the base for proper visualization of the canals. Pulp excavation was done with barred brooch, floor of the pulp chamber was visualized and dentinal mapping suggested three canals, one palatal and two buccal roots. So I have, uh, provided pictures of these. The working length was established with apex locator and confirmed radiographically. Biomechanical preparation was carried out by crown down technique and canals were thoroughly irrigated with saline and 2.5% uh, sodium hypochlorite solution and finishing was performed till F2 protaper reaching the full length. After the preparation, roots were irrigated with 17% EDDA followed by normal saline. Calcium hydroxide dressing was placed and closed dressing was given. Patient was recalled after one week. On recall, the tooth was asymptomatic. Obturation was done with F2 and GP points uh, with uh, F2 GP points and AH plus sealer. Tooth was inadequate to support prosthesis. So we decided to give a fiber post followed by full coverage crown. So this is the crown we provided. So now I come to my discussion part. Anatomy of maxillary premolar with three root canals, mesiobuccal, distobuccal, and palatal is similar to that of adjacent maxillary molar. So therefore, they are sometimes called as small molars or radiculos. In three rooted maxillary premolar, the buccal orifices are situated close to each other and therefore are difficult to locate. A third canal should be suspected if the pulp chamber appears to deviate from normal configuration and seems to be either triangle in shape or too large in a mesiodistal plane. If an eccentric orifice is found, at least one more canal will be present and should be searched for on the opposite side. Unsuccessful endodontic treatment of maxillary first premolar may be associated with a second canal in the buccal root being overlooked and hence not assessed, prepared and obturated. The anatomic variation adds difficulty to endodontic treatment and therefore coronal assess to the root canal should be different for these teeth when maxillary premolar have three canals, two of them are buccal and one is palatal. Therefore, assess should have a triangle shape with the base of the triangle on the buccal side, similar to the assess shape for maxillary molars. At least two radiographs, one at right angle and second at 15 to 20 degree angle medial or distant from the horizontal long axis of the root are required to reliably diagnose more than one root or root canal systems. 
Whiteson recommended the use of two diagnostic radiographs. If a radiograph shows a sudden narrowing or even a disappearing pulp space, the canal diverges at the point into the part that may be either remain separate or merge before reaching the apex. Now, in the end, I would like to conclude that my case report is yet another depiction of anatomic variation in the root canal system and goes to underline the fact that thorough knowledge of the root canal along with proper assessed cavity can lead to decrease in percentage of canal failures. That is all from my presentation today. Thank you for listening. Very nice presentation, Dr. Deva. Everything you have covered. Thank you so much, ma'am. Why didn't you go for CBCT? Ma'am, we don't have CBCT in Jammu and Kashmir. So, mm -hmm. uh, yes, ma'am. So, mm -hmm. I had to go all the way to Punjab for that. Okay. Very nice. Deva, it is not like that. We yeah, have it here, here in a private, private clinic. clinic. Uh, ma'am, I, ha I don't have any idea about it because I have recently come back. I, I don't know. Maybe it might be there. Ma'am, you're not audible, please. I'm saying I'm HOD, HOD in Ascoms over here. Okay. So I have to know that there's a private practitioner, he has CBCT. So you can probably find out and get in touch with him. Yes, ma'am, surely, but I, I recently have week. come back, so I have no idea about it. Thank you for the information, ma'am. But your presentation was very good. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deba Chaudhary, for your mm -hmm. presentation. And next, we'll move on to mm -hmm. oral presentation by Dr. Adas Jain, PMS College of Dental Science and Research, on the topic Aurora Borris in Dentistry, that is application of novel non-thermal plasma technology in modern dentistry. Dr. Adas Jain, yeah, you can go with your presentation. and its applications in modern dentistry. So this is a paper. So I'll be covering the... I'll be covering it under the following headings. Coming to the introduction, plasma is regularly alluded to as the fourth form of matter. Its bounty presence in nature, along with its potential mm -hmm. antibacterial properties, has made it a widely utilized recent... Dr. Adarsh, you are not audible. Dr. Adarsh Jain. In non thermal plasma, the electrons are hotter, but the ions and nickels are at room temperature. Dr. Adhis Jain, I think he's having some de technical issues, so we can move on with the next presenter. That is oral presentation by Dr. S.B. Divya, Savita Dental College and Hospital. On the topic of the presentation is caries removal gel patent. Dr. S.B. Divya. Uh, hello, ma'am. Am I uh, audible? Yes, ma'am. You are audible. You can uh, okay, start uh, sharing your screen. Yes, ma'am. One second. Uh, a warm greeting to everyone present out there. I would like to, one second, ma'am. Oh, yeah. I would like to start my presentation with a quote. That is, innovation is taking two things, uh, taking two things that already exist and putting them together in a new way. So my study is about a uh, new innovation. My study is about a new in innovation that is nothing but a KD removal gel that has been patented. Uh, conventionally, Caries uh, has been removed using dental burst. That is a drilling method of caries removal. 
but it is known to cause many adverse biological effects as in it can even cause anxiety and fear in uh, in uh, different patients so in order to overcome that different caries removal methods have been tried one such method is chemical mechanical method of caries removal and um, majority of this chemical uh, chemical mechanical method of caries removal is based on a gel and the gel which uh, we have prepared is based on pepain and bromelain pepain is an enzyme which is rare from the food of papaya Bromelain is an enzyme that is derived from the pineapple fruit. These two together, along with that, biosynthesis of silver nanoparticles have occurred. So this is the basic composition with which the gel has been prepared. And in the study, this gel will be compared with that of the drilling and uh, carry care, uh, commercially available carry removal gel. Uh, so the aim of my study is uh, to compare the efficacy of uh, carry removal time taken for the caries removal and the surface changes of the patented group after caries removal with that of the drilling and commercial caries removal gel under scanning electron microscope. And also the study aims to evaluate the cytotoxicity, antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory activities of the gel that has been prepared against oral microbes. Uh, now coming to the materials and methods. Uh, in the materials and methods, first thing which I would like to uh, tell about is how the gel has been prepared and later on about how the removal of caries was attempted. Firstly, uh, pepain and bromelain powder which are readily available in the market were collected and to that silver nitrate was added uh, and uh, it was left with in a shaker for about 24 hours and then after that biosynthesis of silver nanoparticles has occurred from that uh, powder. So these have been again centrifuged and the final, uh, like the residue has been discarded and the final silver pellets were collected. And along with that, the gelling agent, which was already prepared made, uh, made of carbapol and uh, carboxymethyl cellulase. Uh, to that, these uh, final products which were obtained were mixed and finally K-stimol gel was prepared. The, the gel, so now come into the next uh, step, that is the removal of the so 15 extracted molar with plasma dead on have been taken. They were randomly divided into three groups, uh, that is drilling, patented uh, gel, and the commercially available gel groups. So with each of these methods, caries removal have been attempted, and the time taken for the caries removal was recorded. After the caries have been removed, uh, the tooth were restored with uh, composite resin, and they were uh, mounted onto an acrylic resin, and they were sectioned with a hard tissue microtome. After that, they were viewed under scanning electron microscope. Um, before going into the actual results of the study, uh, we, uh, I have already stated that biosynthesis of silver nanoparticles has happened. So there should be a proof whether the really biosynthesis has occurred and whether, the, whether there is a presence of silver nanoparticles or not. So these are the tests which were uh, done to check for the uh, presence of silver nanoparticles. First is the EDX, that is the energy dispersion X-ray. This is a particular and specific technique wherein uh, the elemental analysis of the particular compound is done. So the gel was uh, given for uh, EDX uh, test and in that what we see here is nothing but the uh, percentage composition which is present in that. It can be noted that uh, carbon, oxygen and silver were present in uh, the prepared gel. Next is the FTIR, that is a Fourier transformed infra infrared spectroscopy. Uh, the, in this, uh, infrared light is used, and this is also another method of uh, uh, determining the molecular composition of a particular compound. In the graph, the prominences with the red indicate uh, different uh, wavelength of a particular compound. These all depict uh, the uh, presence of uh, silver, carbon, nitrogen, and polymers. This is one more test, which is uh, an evidence for that. And... Um, the third one is nothing but the SEM analysis. That is a scanning electron microscope view of the gel. And it, it can be clearly seen that um, like radio opaque uh, spherical pellets are seen of different uh, sizes. So this indicate the presence of silver nanoparticles which are inside. So in the prepared gel, the silver nanoparticles have been synthesized. Now coming to the time taken for caries removal. Uh, this is uh, shown in minutes. It should be noted in the table that the time taken for caries removal is actually very much less in the drilling uh, uh, technique compared to that of the patented gel and the commercial product. Um, now coming to uh, now coming to the SEM analysis of the results. As in, uh, this slide is of importance, ma'am, because this is the slide which is showing us about how after removal of caries, we have restored them with composite and they have viewed it under scanning electron microscope. So this is the view of that. So it should be noted that in the patented group, uh, the micro cracks, which is like the micro gap, which is present, that is the 16 to 17 micrometers is uh, seen. Uh, in commercial gel group, a little more uh, more than that of the patented group, the gap is seen, the micro gaps. And in the drilling group, that is the last picture, it should be noted that the gap is very much high and there is micro crack, uh, crack uh, 
formation. So this is of importance clinically because this is a gap from which the micro leakage is going to happen in future. And this is the one which is actually going to lead to secondary cases. So it should be noted that the micro uh, gap is much more in drilling group compared to uh, patented group. So uh, next thing is that uh, so far we have seen about the efficacy of KD symbol. But once a gel is prepared, it is even important for us to know whether it is like cyto cytotoxic, it is uh, uh, healthy to the tissues, or it is having antimicrobial property, all that has to be characterized. So this study is about the cytotoxicity of the prepared gel. So uh, brine shrimp lethality assay. In this, the gel has been taken in different concentrations and they have been uh, uh, placed in uh, 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 six well ELISA plate wherein already uh, no play, no play is nothing but the uh, larvae of the shrimp. So they have been uh, left there for 24 hours and checked for how many uh, no play were alive after 24 hours. So this is the graph which shows that it should be noted that even at higher concentration, about 80 to 90 percent of the no play were alive, indicating that the prepared gel is very less cytotoxic. Now coming to our uh, next test, that is the antimicrobial activity. Uh, we even need to know whether the prepared gel is having antimicrobial activity or not. So uh, it was tested against S. mutants, Lactobacillus, E. fecalis, and Candida albicans. So zone of inhibition was looked for. It is nothing but it is an area around the antibiotic uh, where the bacteria colonies do not grow. It means more is the zone of inhibition, better is the uh, gel against uh, that particular organism. Uh, the picture, it can be seen. And in the graph, we can see that compared to the uh, control group, the control which I have taken was a commercially available KDS removal gel. Compared to that, uh, at even higher and uh, moderate concentrations also, the gel was effective against uh, S. mutants, Candida albicans, and E. fecalis. Uh, uh, coming to the last test which I had uh, conducted, that is nothing but anti-inflammatory activity. To know whether uh, any product can cause inflammation to the tissue, so I should know if my product is actually anti-inflammatory in action. So uh, anti-inflammatory action, wherein the bovine serum albumin was used, the pH were maintained at 6.3, and it was incubated and heated at 55 degrees uh, Celsius. And the spectrophotometry was uh, uh, used for this purpose, and the absorbance was estimated, and it was put into a graph for easy understanding. It should be noted in the graph that at higher concentration, um, uh, the, uh, the prepared gel, that is the blue uh, line in that, it shows a better uh, anti-inflammatory property compared to the commercially available gel. That is, again, I have compared it with the commercially available carrier removal gel. So these are the tests which I had actually conducted. Uh, in spite of doing uh, this much of in vitro or testing, there are certain drawbacks which are present. First thing is that uh, any test is incomplete without a clinical trial. So uh, still the clinical trial has not yet been done. And one more important thing is that uh, any gel, because it's a chemical composition, we need to know the shelf life of the gel. Though uh, we have added uh, sodium benzoate for preservation, still uh, there are certain tests which are to be done to uh, check for the uh, shelf life. And uh, the scope of future research would be like, I would like to do a research on like animal trials before uh, trying it on human uh, beings. And uh, finally, the conclusion. So the efficacy of KD removal was equal in all the groups. Uh, but the time taken for KD removal was uh, definitely uh, lesser in drilling group. But then it should be noted that uh, in spite of having uh, taken the less time, the marginal graph and the micro crack propagation, all these are uh, again ad added a drawback to the drilling group. So self-made gel can definitely be used as a KD removal gel because it is less cytotoxic, better antimicrobial, and better anti-inflammatory property. Uh, final word of conclusion is that although it is difficult to employ one particular uh, method for uh, the clinical excellence, we can definitely try to use such uh, a method uh, in cases which are indicated as in a case of anxiety people at all. So it shows a, pa a patient-friendly and promising uh, results. These are my references. And, uh, thank you. Hello, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Divya, very nice presentation. Ah. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Next, I would like to welcome a presentation by Dr. Nikhil Murli and Dr. San Sandeep Chandran, PMS College of Dental Science and Research. A topic is photographic communication in aesth aesthetic dentistry. Dr. Nikhil Murli. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you.
good afternoon respected chairperson uh, today we are going to present an e poster on the topic photographic communication in aesthetic dentistry in the world of aesthetic dentistry photography has become an indispensable tool it is said that we cannot treat what we cannot see and to address the challenges we are presented with every day familiarity with high quality macro photography is an absolute must as you can appreciate from the poster photographic protocols are mainly divided into two diagnostic photographic series and shade communication series in a diagnostic photo communication series we have mainly three types of photographs that you usually take one is the facial second is the dental facial and the third one is the dental series of photographs first one the facial photograph series the first photograph that we are supposed to take is the a, a picture covering the full face and lips together of the patient this photograph will help us in assessing the symmetry of the facial features second picture that we are take we have take is the uh, uh, the full face of the patient with a natural smile which will help in assessing the relationship between the dental and the facial midline third type is the full face looking smile which will actually help us in assessing the lip mobility the fourth photograph that we take in the facial series is that of a relaxed profile of the patient which will help in assessing whether the profile of the patient is convex or concave the second series in the diagnostic photo series is the dendo facial series in the dendo facial series first we'll take a picture with the lips of the patient at rest which will help in assessing the degree of maxillary central incision edge display at rest which is a common starting point for most of the aesthetic treatment plan second one we are have we will have a natural we will take a natural full smile picture which will give information on number of teeth displayed the buccal corridor gingival display as well as the gingival zen next we will take an oblique smile picture left as well as right and this will actually offer a patient's view of their smile which they never see themselves but the whole world or the, the other people can see just as much as the direct frontal view coming to the third series which is the dental photo series wherein we will first take a retracted maximum intercuspal position frontal uh, photograph which will help in assessing the occlusal analysis as well as the aesthetic properties of the maxillary and mandibular anterior teeth next we will take a retracted maximal intercuspation in left and right position which will help in evaluating whether the molar relationship of the patient is in angles class 1 2 or 3 third one is a occlusal photograph that is maxillary and mandibular occlusal photograph which will help in give which will gives gives us an idea regarding the number of frustrations whether there is any spacing or clouding in the dentition and the fourth one is a maxillary anterior retracted a uh, photograph and this particular photograph should have the entire anterior six teeth in focus and this will actually help in identifying micro aesthetic elements of the teeth like the shade of the teeth crease lines incisal translucency and halo incisal wear as well as the gingival health of the patient thus to conclude in our humble opinion photography being such an indispensable tool for diagnosis treatment planning lab communication interdisciplinary communication as well as for patient education photography should be made a mandatory topic of learning in the undergraduate as well as post postgraduate level thank you so much is there any questions our next presentation by jyoti lakshmi b and dr Saranya S Nair PMS College of Dental Science and Research a topic is influence of different agitations method on tissue dissolution's ability of sodium hypochlorite versus hypoclean and inventory study Dr Jodi Lakshmi yes good afternoon ma'am yes please present your presentation okay ma'am yeah, no. Medical history, no relevant history, no or no any dental history.
I mean, the, is it audible, ma'am? Can you see the screen? Yes, audible. Can you see in the screen, ma'am? Yes. Please start. Good afternoon. Our topic is the effect of microelectric current and other activation techniques on dissolution ability of sodium hypochlorite and hypoclean in bovine tissue. Introduction. Successful root canal treatment depends on removal of microorganism and infected pulp tissue. Irrigation plays an important role in efficient biomechanical preparation. Sodium hypochlorite is considered as the gold standard irrigating solution in endronics. To enhance its penetration into inaccessible areas of root canals and to improve its overall effect, the addition of surface active agents are recommended. Also, activation techniques as an external factor affect the dynamic balance of sodium hypochlorite use increasing its tissue dissolution ability. According to various authors, increasing the sodium hypochlorite's temperature is accepted as an activation technique that increases the solution's dissolution effect. The various factors that affect the tissue dissolution efficiency are the type of tissue, concentration and pH of solution, time of exposure and role of the replenishment of solution, the amount of organic matter in relation to volume of suction, temperature, the frequency and intensity of agitation, effect of other irrigants, stability of sodium hypochlorate, surface area in contact with the solution, and surface tension. An aim of the study is to compare the effect of several final agitation techniques in comparison with the microelectric current using sodium hypochlorate and hypoclean. Methodology. In this study, bovine muscle tissue was used for the tissue dissolution experiment. To standardize the size and weight, samples were collected with a biopsy punch with a 5 mm diameter. Prior to testing, samples were weighed with a digital precision scale. And the samples were majorly divided into two groups. First one, sodium hypochlorite at 45 degrees Celsius and second one, hypoclean at 45 degrees Celsius. And they are subdivided into four groups. Sonic activation, ultrasonic activation, microelectric current and microelectric current combined with pipetting. In ultrasonic activation method, the stainless steel size of tip 25 size was operated at moderate speed in the solution. And it was kept at a distance of 5 mm from the tissue and is submerged to 10 mm in the solution. And the sonic activation, the endoactivator using polymer tip number 2504 was run at 10,000 cycles per minute in the solution. It was also submerged up to 10 mm in the solution and was kept at 5 mm from the tissue. And the microelectric energy, the current activation procedures were performed for 15 seconds each minute during the five minute experiment period. A potentiometer was calibrated to supply 10 milliampere to the sodium hypochlorite. And the next group is microelectric energy and pipetting. For pipetting, in accordance with Stoichesic et al., a glass steering rod was mechanically activated by the same operator at a distance of five millimeters from the tissue. After five minutes, each sample was taken out of the solution, dried gently, and reweighed. Statistical analysis. The data were analyzed statically using multi-way ANOVA and UKHSP HSP test. The level of alpha type error was set at less than 0.05. Now, moving on to the results. This table depicts the results with 5 percent sodium hypochlorite solution with various agitation methods such as using ultrasonics, sonics, microelectric current with and without pipetting. And among these groups, the microelectric current with pipetting gives a better tissue distribution followed by the ultrasonic group. Here also, the irrigant used in this group was hypoclean, and the results remain the same. To the special mention, comparing both the irrigants, hypoclean these better than the plane. This is a bar diagram that shows a consolidated result of the two main groups and the subgroups. Here, the remaining weight of the bovine tissue is depicted. Moving on to the discussion. This was an article that is published in the Journal of Endodontics in the year 2010 by Soti C. et al. And in this study, he demonstrated that the sodium hypochlorite dissolution effect changes as its concentration, pH, surface tension, and the temperature change. There is no much significant difference between the sonic, ultrasonic, and the pipetic activation at room temperature. And the, in this present study, the bovine muscle tissue was preferred and instead of pulp tissue in order to standardize both the surface weight and surface area. According to Lumili et al. determined 100 micrometer and the less to be the distance limit for the creating active cavitation during ultrasonic action. And the present study, ultrasonic and the sonic tips were operated at a distance of 5 millimeter from the tissue in all experiments and thus avoiding the cavitation effect. 
In another study by Valmetter, he determined that at 45 degrees Celsius, the concentration of chlorine in hypochlorite solution did not change for one hour. In our study also, the heated hypochlorite was not kept for more, not more than one hour. And hence, the superior dissolution ability of the irrigants were completely obtained. In the previous studies, refreshed water were used as canal washing solution. And in this study, 10 milliampere direct current was created that changed the dynamic structure of hypochlorite solution. Direct current was passed through the hypochlorite solution at a micro level. In the study conducted by Madan et al., microelectrically activated irrigant shows a better dissolution than the one without activation and is coinciding with our results. In both the studies, microelectric current and the sonic waves showed a synergetic tissue dissolution efficiency. Moving on to the conclusion, while having a good dissolving tissue and antimicrobial capacities, sodium hypochlorite shows some limitations such as a high surface tension and that limitation in its penetration in the anatomic irregularities of the root canal system and deeper penetration into the dental tubules. The new solution added with the surfactants optimized the properties of the sodium hypochlorite by lowering its surface tension. Also within the limitations of the present study, combined the use of microelectric energy, heat and agitation had a positive synergistic effect on the hypochlorite solution tissue dissolving ability and however, further studies should be conducted on the microelectric energy for better understanding this technique in practice. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Is there any queries? Okay, next we move on to the next presentation. Our next presentation by Dr. Afina N, PMS College of Dental Science and Research. Topic is comparative evaluation of antibacterial activity of 0.9% normal saline and 5.25% sodium high chloride and 5% metofilm high chloride, 2% cytosine, iron oxide uh, nanoparticles against enterocious facilis and inventory study. Dr. Afina. Next, we move on to the another presentation by Dr. Jananindi, PMS College of Dental Science and Research. A topic is evaluation of fracture strength of endocarbons fabric fabricated with zirconia reinforced ceramics over base metal alloys. Dr. Jananindi. Dr. Jananindi. Our next presentation by Dr. M. Shamli, Savita Dental College and Hospital. Topic is effectiveness of flavonoid incorporated total H adhesive in dentine adhesion inventory study. Dr. M. Shamli. Ma'am, I am unable to share screen ma'am because this you can pr proceed your presentation without your screen previous person has not uh... okay okay i know dr jyoti lakshmi kindly unshare your screen okay yeah thank you Can you see my screen? Ma? Yes, I can share. I can see you. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, all. My topic is about effectiveness of lavender incorporated total dentin adhesive and dentin adhesion. Um, and before going into my topic, a few introduction, brief introduction about my topic is as we all know, effectiveness of adhesive restoration depends on durable long term dentin bone. There are three common adhesive systems, namely total edge, self edge, and self adhesive. Uh, out of which we prefer total edge because of its increased bone strength. But the main drawback of total edge adhesive system is it's time consuming. And main important thing is because of as 
toxic conditioning procedure it causes decreased ph so this decreased ph it causes release of proenzymes like mmp cysteine catepsins which in turn affects the hybrid layer by decreasing uh, decreasing the collagen stabilization by causing collagen degradation also etching causes gelatinization of the collagen fibers which further present infiltration and which in turn further causes collagen degradation and micro leakage so the main uh, aim of my study is incorporating a material with mmp inhibiting as well as collagen cross linking property to prevent this collagen degradation as well as to improve the bond stability and to decrease the micro leakage so the aim of my study is to evaluate the effectiveness of hesperidin which is a flavonoid uh, i incorporated hesperidin in total h adhesive uh, to evaluate the bond strength and micro leakage of resin dentin bonded interface so coming to the objective to determine whether incorporating hesperidin in total h adhesive it prevents the micro leakage and it improves the bond strength of resin dentin bonded interface coming to the materials and methods in group 1 i used a uh, flavonoid free adhesive uh, that is plain aqua single bond 2 which is a total h adhesive and group 2 i used flavonoid incorporated adhesive that is hesperidin incorporated adhesive in 2 percentage concentration in reference with the previous studies uh, so for m1 ml of uh, bonding agent i used 20 mg of hesperidin and i used a, a solvent named dmso which is a dimethyl sulfoxide uh, in 0.025 concentration for 1 ml of bonding agent so coming to the first study evaluation of micro leakage i used 10 extracted um, uh, premolars freshly extracted premolars and i uh, allocated into two groups so uh, i prepared class by cavity on the on either side that is buccal and lingual side of specific dimension as mentioned here and uh, after preparing the cavity i restored with the uh, subjective subjected group and i stored in uh, uh, stored in distilled water at 37 degrees celsius for 24 hours after that i subjected to 2000 thermocycles which implicates the one year of uh, aging uh, between temperature baths at 5 degrees celsius and 55 degrees celsius and after that the teeth were painted with coats of varnish within 1 ml of 1 ml of margins of the restoration uh, and then the samples were all the samples were in, immersed in the ammoniacal silver nitrate dye for 24 hours at 37 degrees celsius after which we washed the um, samples in uh, running tap water for 1 minute and then dried so after which we viewed the sample uh, we sectioned the samples and viewed under the stereo microscope so uh, we used a scoring system by uh, munro hilton and hermish uh, to determine the micro leakage so score 0 implies that there is no evidence of micro leakage and score 1 is the dye penetration up to half of the cavity depth and score 2 is micro leakage more than half of the depth of the cavity and score 3 is dye leakage involving the axial wall so coming to the second test evaluation of the shear bond strength so as as mentioned um, after allocating um, into two groups um, 20 teeth were selected and i allocated 10 teeth uh, per group so uh, i flattened the cervical third of uh, in um, teeth i flattened the cervical third and after etching and bonding uh, bonding uh, according to the groups that is flavonoid with flavonoid and without flavonoid i built the composite block with a particular dimension 4 into 6 mm so composite block was built uh, on the eastern bonded surfaces after which the teeth were mounted in the acrylic resin as may, as shown in this figure and the um, sample was subjected to uh, shear bond strength test using a universal testing machine as a at a cross head speed of 0.5 mm per minute until fracture so coming to the results as it is shown in the figure the micro leakage results were in test group most of the uh, leakage was seen uh, till the enamel restoration margin and few uh, leakage was seen till the dentin restoration margin that is more than half of the cavity depth but in control group the most of the uh, leakage was seen till dentin restoration margins and few uh, leakage was seen till uh, the axial wall that is more than half of the cavity wall and also it involves the axial wall so this is the result of uh, micro leakage and coming to the shear bond strength uh, result uh, the, uh, the control group the values were 156.33 and the test group the values were 199.47 that is uh, the compressive force withstood by the test group 
is more compared to the control group. So coming to the result, as we all know, resin dentin bonds are less durable compared to the resin enamel bonds because of the micro leakage, staining, recurrent theories, and post-operative sensitivity. So incorporating a flavonoid that is a natural collagen cross-linker uh, can prevent this collagen degradation and can improve the uh, can improve the um, uh, bonding. I specifically chose hesperidin because um, there are various bonding, uh, there are various flavonoids, but this hesperidin is a, a citrus extract. It has, it not only has collagen cross-linking and MMP inhibiting property, but also it has antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and also antimicrobial property. We also tested against uh, uh, many karyogenic bacteria, and uh, it proved that uh, incorporating hesperidin in a bonding agent has anti uh, antimicrobial property, and also um, uh, it shows immediate bond strength compared to the control group. So, uh, so because of this, it helps in preventing the micro leakage and preventing the secondary caries and also improves the bond stability of the resin dentin interface. Also, the dimethyl sulfoxide solvent used in this group also, it helps in solubilization of the hesperidin. In recent, uh, uh, last year, one study was published using the dimethyl sulfoxide. It, uh, in that uh, article, uh, they have stated that using dimethyl sulfoxide can increase the adhesive penetration and also it can help in improve the durability of the hybrid layer. They, are, they have also used the dimethyl sulfoxide uh, in total H adhesive and they have uh, got the same results. And few there were no clinical studies with the hesperidin incorporated total H dentin adhesive. Only one clinical study is available um, based on flavonoid incorporated total H adhesive. And uh, that is the flavonoid used was proanthocyanidin, but they have got negative results because of few reasons. That is because of the particle size of the flavonoid etching was not proper and so they have got negative results so um, uh, in this study um, i have used hesperidin as i mentioned uh, i use hesperidin as a flavonoid because it's a citrus extent and also it has more uh, antioxidant and anti-inflammatory property um, so this is uh, i am doing a clinical study related to this topic also uh, so my final conclusion is within the limitation hesperid that it is an in vitro study uh, the hesperidin incorporated total h adhesive can be used effectively to reduce micro leakage and also to increase the increase the bond strength in adhesive restorations uh, its application in restorative dentistry can be it can be used in non carrier cervical lesion in which we, we have more uh, most difficulty in uh, debonding and it also can be used in uh, aesthetic restorations like laminates and venies and also it can be used in fragment uh, fragment reattachment cases uh, so these are my references thank you thank you shamli is there any questions uh, yeah dr shamli can you tell me the one more reliable method to check the micro leakage you have checked the stereo microscope. Under stereo microscope, you have done your uh, micro leakage study. One more reliable. Um, uh, uh, SEM we can use to check, ma'am. Scanning electron microscope. And also nano CT we can use. Or cone focal. Have you ever heard about cone focal? Uh, cone focal also. Yeah. Have cone focal, actually, cone focal is used for micro leakage studies. Okay, okay. Okay. Thank you. Our next presentation by Dr. Manu Vikram, BP Korilla Institute of Health Science. Topic is a study of relationship between skin color and tooth shade value in patients attending a dental OPD in Territory Healthcare Center of Eastern Nepal. Dr. Manu Vikram. We next move on to the next presentation by Dr. Vivek Divadas Mahali, Savita Dental College and Hospital. A topic is guided endodontic microsurgery. Dr. Vivek. Thank you. I would like to welcome Dr. Arshdeep Gill. Dr. Arshdeep Gill is there? Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, 
please start your presentation Good afternoon, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, audible. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. I'm Dr. Ashtit from uh, Surrender Dental College, Department of Conservative Dentistry and Endontics. I am presenting my paper on the topic influence of 2% pure hexidine on immediate and delayed shear bond strength of composite tracing to dentine using total H and cell fresh dentine bonding system. And it is an in vitro study. It will be covered under the following contents. First of all, introduction. The demand of aesthetic restoration are popular because of their magnificent aesthetic and improved physical and mechanical properties. A stable bond formation between restorative material and dentine is necessary for long-term success of the restoration. The bond strength of the enamel is usually stable with restorative material, but, but in case of dentine, it is recorded to be decreased by 30 to 40% after six months and 60 to 70% after one year. Many studies showed that degradation of collagen bundles and hydrolysis of bonding grazing caused by MMPs, which are present in dentine, is responsible for shear bond strength deterioration over time. What is the importance of shear bond strength determination? The determination of shear bond strength of restorative material is important to know the effects of lateral stresses and dislodgement forces on the restoration, which were present during functional movement inside the mouth. Now, what are these MMPs? MMPs are cell-derived zinc and calcium-dependent proteolytic enzyme family with 26 identified members. They have the capacity to hydrolyze all extracellular matrix. These enzymes are present in inactive form in dentine and get activated in the low pH created by acid etching process in restorative procedure. So these days, use of antibacterial agent and MMP inhibitor may overcome this drawback. MMP inhibitors are present in many cavity disinfectants like chlorhex, minocycline, sodium hypo, glutaldehyde, and aloe vera. So, in present study, I used 2% pure hexidine, and the aim of the study was to evaluate the influence of 2% pure hexidine digluconate on immediate and delayed shear bond strength of composite raising to dentine using total H and cell-fetch dentine bonding system. This study was conducted in Department of Conservative Dentistry and Endotics in Srinagar Dental College and Central Institute of Plastic Engineering, Jaipur. These were the armamentarium and material used in the study. 2% pure hex was used as disinfecting agent and the equipment used was LED light curing unit and universal testing machine. Coming to methodology, intact caries restoration and crack-free 80 permanent molars free of debris, blood, calculus were collected and stored in normal saline for no more than two weeks. The samples were divided and polished with rubber cup along with pumice stone under water at slow speed. Then the horizontal sectioning of all the samples was done at mid-coronal portion using slow speed diamond saw under water coolant spray to reduce the heat production during sectioning. The sectioning was done to remove the occlusal enamel. The occlusal enamel of all the 80 samples were removed to expose the mid-coronal dentine. Then, Flattened occlusal surface was smoothened with 1000 grit silicon carbide paper such that the surface become evenly flat and free of any craze line or cracks. Then each section sample were embedded in acrylic glazing which kept the occlusal surface completely in horizontal position. After that, an adhesive tape with 3 mm diameter hole was up, was punched and securely adapted to the center of flattened portion of exposed dentine for all the 80 samples. 
it was done to demark the area for surface treatment coming to grouping of the sample all the 80 permanent molars were randomly divided into two groups on the basis of disinfecting treatment used or not used in group 1 that is control group number of samples taken was 40 in both the groups and in group 1 no disinfectant treatment was done then on the basis of type of adhesive system used this uh, group is divided into two subgroups that is total edge subgroup and self edge subgroup with n20 each in each subgroup the total edge and self edge adhesive was applied according to manufacturer's instruction and the composite slider was built without any disinfecting treatment uh, uh 10 samples from each subgroup were stored for immediate for delayed shear bond strain testing in normal saline for 6 months and 10 samples were undergone immediate shear bond strain testing under universal testing machine likewise in uh, group 2 total edge and self edge subgroups are formed with and mere photo mere photo aa raha tha mujhe yaar iske type pe edit the sequence followed in each subgroup was first of all in total edge subgroup agent was applied and rinsed then floor hexidine was applied and rinsed then bonding agent was applied and cured and the composite slender was built in self edge subgroup first of all floor hexidine was applied on dentin surface then bonding agent and composite slender was done according to manufacturer's instruction likewise in control group each uh, 10 samples from each subgroup was stored for delayed shear bond strength testing and 10 was undergone immediate shear bond strength testing coming to results shear bond strength was recorded in mega pascal and stats were applied using pair t test and post op tucky test when intergroup comparison of immediate and delayed shear bond strength for groups divided according to type of adhesive system was done it showed that the highest shear bond strength was given with total edge subgroup with the help of chlorhexidine in delayed shear bond strength testing that is 18.82 mega pascal and the least strength shear bond strength was given by self fit subgroup in control group that to in delayed shear bond strength testing that is 4.81 mega pascal after that pairwise intergroup comparison was also done coming to discussion it is stated by many authors that the duration of bond strength with time is due to the degradation of adhesive resin and activity of collagenases and mmps mmps are hydrolyzing enzyme which are capable of hydrolyzing all extracellular matrix MMPs are secreted as inactive enzyme inside the dentine and had a great affinity to zinc and calcium ion and get attached to it in the presence of acidic environment for their activation thus to inactivate these MMP many potent MMP inhibitor were introduced and evident in literature many authors used chlorhexidine sodium hypochlorite benzo benzalkolium chloride disinfectant iodine iodine potassium copper sulfate sulfate based agents and also hydrogen peroxide in addition to chlorhex and sodium hypochlorite this study was conducted to examine the influence of 2% chlorhexidine as an in mmp inhibitor and their effect on bond strength between composite resin to dentine using total edge and self edge dentine bonding system Self-etched adhesive system contain acidic primer and do not require separate etching process. Etch and rinse adhesive system use 37% phosphoric acid to dissolve the smear layer and to demineralize the dental hard tissue, which open the meshwork of dentinal tubules for bonding. Quality of this open meshwork is very important to define the quality of bond form. To obtain stability in bond, the complete penetration of collagen meshwork is very essential. now interpretation of the observation control group showed lower shear bond strength as compared to experimental group that is total edge with gave 7.69 mega pascal which is decreased to 7.11 mega pascal in delayed testing and with self edge 6.30 which is decreased to 4.81 mega pascal although 
A lot of factors are responsible for this reduction in bond strength with time in both the cases, but MMPs are prime responsible for bond hydrolysis over time. The experimental group that is Chlorhex showed increased shear bond strength regardless of the bonding system used in both immediate and delayed shear bond strength testing. But the highest bond strength of 80.82 was given by Chlorhex with total edge in delayed shear bond strength testing, which favored the study by Develo R et al. in 2020. They stated that a statistical significant increase in shear bond strength can be seen when Chlorhex pre dentine is tested for shear bond strength after six months of storage. Candron et al. in 2002 stated that Chlorhex shows two mechanisms of action as MMP inhibitor. First is binding to zinc and calcium for inhibition of MMP, and it also reacts with sulfhydryl group and cysteine, which is present in its reactive site. Chlorhex potentially prevented the hydrolysis of incompletely infiltrated area in hybrid layer by MMPs. This study showed less bond strength with self fetch adhesive in both immediate and delayed shear bond strength testing, which was favored by Dang et al. in 2013. They stated that Chlorhex failed to stabilize the bond strength with one step self fetch adhesive resin. They also stated that one step resin monomer have high concentration concentration of acidic monomer, which hampers the water evaporation and leads to its entrapment within which in turn decrease the shear bond strength of the resulting polymer. Coming to conclusion, my study concluded that MMP had a potent effect on shear bond strength deterioration of composite restorative material to dentine regardless of the adhesive use if disinfectant had not been used. Though the disinfectant use can completely reverse the process of bond strength deterioration with passage of time if total edge bonding system has been applied. These are my references. Thank you. Next presenter, please. Thank you, Doctor. Our next presentation by Dr. Bharati Lissam, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute. Dr. Bharati? Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, please start your presentation. Good afternoon, ma'am. Ma'am, am I audible? Yes, audible. Good afternoon, ma'am. I myself, Dr. Bharti. I myself, Dr. Bharti, will present a paper presentation on repair cell bone strength of AIDS resin composite after different surface treatment and its mode of failures and in vitro study. It will be covered under the following contents. Inter, uh, then start with the introduction. Composite resins are widely used in dentistry because of the great demand for the aesthetic restoration. Moreover, it is less expensive alternative to indirect restoration. However, fractures and the failures of the composite restorations do occur from time to time, and the clinician must decide whether to replace or repair the restorations. Complete removal of the defective composite restorations is not always necessary or desirable as it involves removal of the adjacent tooth structure leading to the loss of the tooth structures. Repair of the composite restoration is a conservative method that can increase the longevity and durability of the restoration while preserving the tooth structure. Achieving a suitable bond between the old and the new composite is difficult. 
Considering this, surface treatment of the AIDS restoration serving as the bonding substrate is performed to improve the repair cell bone strength. For this, various surface treatment methods like mechanical and surface and chemical surface treatment have been employed. As an objective, first, we have to evaluate the influence of the various surface treatments on the cell bone strength of the composite resin to the AIDS composite and to evaluate the mode of the failures of the repaired composite like cohesive, adhesive, and mix. So now coming to materials and methods, this study was carried out in the Department of Conservative Dentistry and Endodontics, Surrender Dental College and Research Institute, and Central Institute of Plastic Engineering and Technology, Jaipur, as it was a non-invasive procedure and in vitro preparation, so ethical clearance was not required. Experimental design, this study tested the cerebral strength of the repaired composite after different surface treatments like 37% orthophosphoric acid, 9.6% hydrochloric acid, sealant coupling as an air abrasion, green coat diamond burr, and its mode of failures like adhesive, cohesive, and mix. And this is the and these are the materials used for this study, and these are the armamentarium used. And this is the picture showing the micro etcher, then universal testing machine and stereo microscope for the study. And these are the samples which were met, uh, 72 specimen of the composite which were met using cylindrical stainless steel mold for the purpose of this in vitro study. And the holes in the resin molds were filled with nano hybrid composite to simulate the existing restoration and was light polymerized for 40 seconds. And the next step is aging procedures. In this, the specimens were aged by thermal cycling 1,500 times between 5 and 55 plus minus 2 degrees centigrade with a drill and transfer time of 10 seconds intervals between the baths. Then customization of 55 plus minus 2 degrees centigrade temperature was maintained by digital hot water bath and for 5 plus minus 2 degrees centigrade temperature by customization with ice. Thermometer ranging from minus 10 to 110 degrees centigrade was used to check the temperature. Then the surveyed samples were, uh, were then randomly divided into six groups with 12 number each. For the group one, that is control group, no surface treatment was done. And for the group two, 37% orthophosphoric acid was used. And for the group three, 9.6% hydrochloric acid was employed. And for the group four, surface was abraded with the help of green coat diamond point. And for the group, group five, sealant coupling agent was used. And for the group six, air abrasion was done. Then after this, uh, after the different surface of different, different type of surface treatment, a seventh generation bonding agent was applied on the surface of the edge composite and then light polymerized for five minutes, followed by position of a piece of plastic stro hollow straw in the center of the flattened portion of the edge composite of all the samples. Then the composite resin, which was deferred from the original composite block, was placed and repaired the restoration. The piece of straw was cut and removed. The samples were stored in a distilled water for 24 hours and then submitted for the shear bone test. The samples were tested for the shear bone strand under universal testing machine with a cross head speed of 0.5 millimeter per minute was placed parallel to the adhesive interface until the fracture. The shear bone strand of the samples were calculated and expressed in Newton. Analysis of the mode of the failures. After the shear bone strength test, the samples were evaluated under a stereo microscope to determine the mode of the failures as adhesive, cohesive, and mix. And for the cohesive, fractures of the adhes uh, base or the re repair composite was seen. And for the adhesive, failure at the interface was occurred. And for the mix, failure at the interface and the repair composites were included. And this is the table demonstrating the intergroup and the standard deviation values of the shear bone uh, strand for the for, the, for the different groups. In this area, abrasion source the maximum shear bone strand uh, with 831.17 newton, and for the control, uh, and the lowest is shown by the control group with 314.19 newton. And uh, and this is a table demonstrating the most of the failures of different uh, different groups for this adhesive. Uh, motor failures was mostly found in the control group with 96.9%. And for the cohesive, 
Quasimodo failure was found mainly in the air at present with 83.91%. And this is a uh, graph showing the mean, mean shared bond strength comparison values of all the groups. And this is the graph for the most of the failures of different groups. So, com so now coming on to discussion, the present in vitro study was done to evaluate the influence of the various surface treatments on the shared bond strength of repaired composite and its mode of failures. In the present study, the highest repair bone strand values were observed in groups that were surface treated. Roughening composite surface by either air abrasion, burr, or etching can increase the bone of the, uh, to the repaired composite. The result of the present study demonstrated that the control group with no surface treatment showed lowest shear bone strand as compared to other experimental groups. Air abrasion with the particle size 50 micrometer aluminum oxide had shown the maximum shear bone strand values as compared to other groups. Higher bone strand was obtained from air abrasion, which yields micro retention because the adhesive resin infiltrates into the micro irregularities of composite surface, resulting in better surface wetting. Then high bone strand was also acid from the diamond burr. The reason behind this was burr roughening produced micro retentive and micro retentive areas, which enhanced the optimal bone. Application of the sealant coupling as a result in the formation of the siloxane bond when the silino groups condense with a silinized coating on the glass filler particles and silica present in the composite promotes the chemical bonding with the resin matrix. Whereas hydrochloric acid etching promotes micromechanical interlocking and silica containing fillers which was partially exposed because of etching. The etching of the composite surface with 37% orthophosphoric acids seems to expose less inorganic fillers, reducing its capability to have a better bonding surface area. The results of the present study coincide with the study done by Cavalcanti et al., which evaluated the bone strand of repaired composite with different surface treatments like air abrasion with 50 micrometer aluminum oxide and diamond burst, and concluded that surface treatment of direct with the air abrasion led to higher repair bone strand values as, com as compared with the diamond burst. Even the inference of the present study was supported by Hemadri et al., which evaluated shear bone of the repaired composite using surface treatments like diamond burr air abraded with 50 micrometer aluminum oxide particles. Failure modes of different groups. In the present study, on analyzing the failure modes, cohesive failures were found predominantly in air abrasion and green burr, which also had the higher bone strength as compared to other groups. Most of the adhesive failures were recorded in control group, followed by autophosphoric acid, hydrofluoric acid, and sealant coupling. In general, failure modes indicate that those groups with high bone strands exhibit cohesive failure. However, low bone strands tend to exhibit adhesive failure rather than cohesive failure. Failures within the composite resin seems to be more appropriate for bearing the occlusal load, that is the cohesive failure. This agreement was agreed by the study done by Kimyai et al. on comparison of the effect of three mechanical surface treatments on the repaired bone strand of a laboratory composite by using diamond burr, air abrasion, and erbium yak laser, and saw that cohesive failures were observed in groups which resulted in higher bone strand. This results agreed with the Kasi et al. who found most of the adhesive failures occurred in control. So now coming on to conclusion, it was concluded that mechanical surface treatment of the composite significantly improves the repair bone strand, especially with the air abrasion compared with the chemical surface treatment. In air abraded group, cohesive failures was observed dominant, dominantly, which could be assumed that the selected protocol was appropriate to bear the occlusal loads based on the previous reported studies. With no surface treatment, nearly no bone exists between the materials. These are the references. Thank you. Thank you, Bharati. Is Thank there any Dr. questions? Yeah, Dr. Bharati, please tell me you have applied a bonding agent over the aged composite to bind the composite over that. Yes, ma'am, I do apply the bonding agent. But your studies is actually on the surface treatments. You have applied the bonding agent. What is the role of that? You are supposed to apply the bonding agent on the dentine or on the enamel. But why you have applied it on the aged composite? Ma'am, uh, we have to test it. Uh, the flowability of the bonding agent, I mean, uh, the 
Vetability of the bonding as in after the surface treatment. But I think it will block the surface treatment, uh, you know, holes, which the which you have done surface treatment, the holes you have created in the aged composite that will be blocked by bonding agent, I think, then how can it be possible that we will get a good bond strength? Ma'am, actually, uh, ma'am, with the help of the roughening of the edge composite, there will be a uh, mechanical interlocking between the bonding yeah, agent and the only I'm telling that mechanical interlocking you have blocked after yeah. application of bonding agent. Ashish, yes, anyway, please uh, check it again. Ashad, uh, 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 okay, now next presenter, please. Our next presentation by Dr. Adarsh Jayan, PMS College of Dental Science and Research. Dr. Adarsh. Yes, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, the other participant has not stopped screen sharing. Yes. Bharati, kindly stop your screen sharing. Dr. Bharati. Dr. Bharati? Dr. Adarsh, yeah. please start your presentation, sir. Yeah, are my slides visible now? Uh, no, sir. Uh, are they visible now? No, sir. Yes, now we can see. A very good evening to one and all. My topic today of presentation is about non-thermal plasma and its applications in modern dentistry. It's a review paper. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Your screen is not visible, sir. Please check it out. Is it visible now? Yes. I'm, I'll be co covering the topic under the following headings. Coming to the introduction, plasma is a regularly alluded as a food form of matter and its bounty presence in nature along with its potential antibacterial properties has made it a widely utilized disinfectant in clinical sciences. Plasma is categorized as thermal plasma or non-thermal plasma based, based on the temperature that it is used. In thermal plasma, the electrons and heavy particles are in thermal equilibrium, but in non-thermal plasma, the electrons are hotter, but the ions and neutrals are at room temperature, and therefore, it is also known as cold atmospheric plasma. Non-thermal plasma has a temperature which is less than 104 degrees Celsius Fahrenheit, and at the point of application, it is very suitable for, make, for its delivery. Plasma can be produced by radio frequency, high voltage alternating current, or direct current, some methods to use or produce plasma include a dielectric barrier discharge method, atmospheric pressure plasma jet method, plasma needle, and plasma pencil, of which plasma needle is more suitable in dental purposes. A specific type of plasma needle can be designed by using helium gas, which is the most commonly utilized gas for plasma production, with a radio frequency power ranging from 10 milliwatts to so several watts. When it is delivered at 13 millihertz pressure, microplasma is produced. So how does it act? The non-equilibrium nature of atmospheric plasma with its gas phase at low temperatures and highly reactive particles allows it to be directly applied to the living tissues. The highly reactive plasma species clean, etch, modify, form a thin layer of plasma coating or react with surface they come into contact with depending on the gas composition. Coming to the different application of non-thermal plasma technology in modern dentistry, the first of which is sterilization. When compared to conventional approaches, plasma devices have been found to destroy bacteria faster. A plethora of plasma components such as reactive oxygen species, electromagnetic fields, UV ions, and electrons are related to the mechanism of plasma sterilization. Bacteria are rendered inactive by the hydroxyl radical assaults on the unsaturated fatty acids, which are produced by plasma, and they also damage the membrane lipids. The effectiveness of plasma sterilization is affected by gas composition, bacterial stain and driving frequency and it was proved in studies that plasma device was effective in killing both E. coli and bacillus subtilis. When used in dental cavities, cold plasma decontaminates the cavities without the need to drill them. 
Despite plasma's surface level nature, its active plasma species can penetrate deep into cavities. The clinical procedures can be carried out by disinfecting bacteria which are in the dendritic tubules or close to the pulp after the removal of most of soft cavities with a bird. Soft, short-lived chemical species generated by the plasma nadi in the gas phase can interact with the surface of a tooth and dissolve it into liquid phase. So unlike the other antibacterial liquid rinses that remain in the mouth after operation, the plasma nadi generates bactericidal agents locally allowing them to reach the cavity and fissure areas. Ultimately, this helps in reducing the level of patient's anxiety and fear as well as the potential pain during treatment procedures. Extreme potency in reducing the bacterial load as well as cavity a conservative approach in preparing dental cavities and elimination of feed production are other advantages of using plasma for excavating dental cavities. Coming to root canal disinfection, few preliminary studies are done which shows that it can completely inactivate e canals within a few minutes and non-thermal plasma was also proved to break dental biofilms. Cold plasma's gaseous nature gives it an enormous advantage over traditional instrumentation method to reach the isthmus, deltas, ramifications and specific dental tubules and abnormalities of the root canal system. Tooth bleaching can also be done with non-thermal atmospheric plasma. When atmospheric plasma is used with hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radicals are released and surface proteins are removed. Studies have claimed that mixing plasma with hydrogen peroxide have erased coffee and alcohol staining. Roof et al. had discovered that combining plasma therapy with non-abrasive air water sprays efficient in removing biofilms from dental implants. Non-thermal plasma is also efficient in decontamination of biofilms. A few in vitro studies that uh, have shown that it has a large uh, range of action ranging from streptococci, lactobacillus, acnomyces, and other probable anaerobes and aerobes present uh, in normal routine infections. Plasma therapy has raised the bonding strength at the dentin composite interface by almost 60%, and this has enhanced the interface bonding between composite and it has improved the composite lifespan and durability. The main culprit for failure of mechanical bonding is the smear layer, which is composed of type 1 collagen. And the adhesive and the plasma treatment increases the number of free radicals in the ions and the tooth surface, and it increases the bond strength. The application of plasma modifies the dentin surface proteins and thus surface characteristics of dentin and increases dentin adhesive interfacial bonding. It can be deducted that non thermal plasma treatment results in increased bond strength and it also prevents microleakage and secondary caves. Coming to implant modifications, the biomodification by non thermal plasma has been tested. And it has seen that plasma increases the surface roughness and wettability, which improves the cell addition and osteo uh, induction. Chair side application of non thermal atmospheric plasma before placement of implant is recently reported, which helps in reducing the contact angle and supporting the spread of osteoblastic cells. It is known to aid in osteoblastic proliferation and osteo integration, thus increasing the success rates of implants. Another potential use of non thermal atmospheric plasma is in wound healing. Long treatment periods cause apoptosis in lungs in cells, whereas brief treatment has encouraged normal growth. Reactive oxygen species, nitrogen species, and UV radiation and an electric field are all produced by plasma, which is a complex mixture of reactive species, and this promotes wound healing. Finally, it has also been tested in oncology. At a cold atmospheric plasma induces necrosis, cell detachment, apoptosis, and deterioration of tumor cells by disrupting the S phase of cell division. Non-thermal plasma has shown great potential in removal of infected cells and preservation of healthy tissue in necrotic areas of the teeth. These findings may be extended beyond the tooth and can be applied in the remaining oral cavity in, and especially in cancerous lesions. So coming to the discussion, plasma is a gaseous medium which can penetrate into regular cavities and fissures. It has strong advantage and it kills only pathogens in the bacterial plaque and oral tissues without damaging the normal tissues. Plasma does not cause pain in patient and it does not induce thermal damage. Since oral diseases are not, are not caused by single pathogen, research must be conducted to know whether non thermal plasma can also kill various other oral pathogens at the same time. Considering all the characteristics of plasma, such as its sterilizing effect, blood coagulation, wound healing, and tooth bleaching, the application of plasma to oral tissues is potentially a fascinating technique. There are many limitations uh, in, to non thermal plasma, which being the cost and availability being a main concern. Depending on the type of construction, the gas discharge does not occur at the site where the microorganisms are located, which is a problematic issue. Also, one more considerable aspect is the formation of ozone during the production of plasma, which uh, is a problem for a patient as well as practitioner during clinical procedures. Another uh, issue with non-thermal atmospheric plasma is a requirement of humidity during clinical procedure and also uh, limits the direct application of plasma. The most important drawback is the lack of availability of material and equipment 
due to which it is used in research as well as clinical practice is very limited so i can conclude that a non tunnel plasma uh, is a very uh, interesting topic for further research and more research should be conducted in this area and uh, as a result of availability of a handheld equipment that is recently designed the method is expected to increase in popularity and researchers and doctors might potentially benefit from better knowledge and cell of the cellular and molecular mechanisms included these are my references thank you thank you dr adar is there any questions no ma'am it's a very well presented dr adarsh okay so we next move on to the next presentation by dr afina n pms college of dental science and research dr afina dr afina yes ma'am i'm here Yes, please start your presentation, ma'am. Okay. Can I start, start, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, I'm here to present my uh, study on the uh, on uh, the comparison of antibacterial activity of 5.25 percent in sodium hypochlorite. 5% metformin, 0.2% chitosan, iron oxide nanoparticles against enterococcus fecalis. Moving on to the introduction, E. fecalis is the most persistent anodontic pathogen and the bacteria which is most commonly recovered from teeth with failed root canal treatment and it is also resistant to conventional medicaments. The prevalence of E. fecalis in persistent anodontic infections ranges from 24 to 77%. And the reason being uh, due to its ability to grow in extremely alkaline pH, endured, it can endure periods of nutritional deprivation. It can serve up at a temperature of 60 degrees Celsius for about 30 minutes. So the aim of my study is to evaluate the antibacterial activity of 5.25% sodium hypochlorite, 5% metformin hydrochloride, 0.2% chitosan, iron oxide nanoparticles against E. fecalis. So this is the methodology of my study. So uh, after sample preparation, bacteria were inoculated in the specimens, then cleaning and shaping were done with the respective regions. Then uh, the cell viability was assessed by MTTSA. So moving on to the sample preparation, uh, 35 uh, extracted single rooted mandibular premolars, which were uh, devoid of any caries and developmental defects uh, were selected. And uh, access cavity preparation was uh, made by using number two round verb. Uh, then, uh, protepa next file system was used in my study. Then, coronal pre enlargement was done up to protepa uh, next nifty file size X1. Uh, then, bacterial inoculation was done. Then, the specific. <laughs> specimens were embedded on the heart infusion board. Then the two nine two one two were used, and the specimens were incubated at thirty seven degree for a period of eight weeks. Then the purity of infection was checked by culturing and gram staining at uh, days twenty eight and fifty six. Then uh, the grouping of specimens was done. The specimens were grouped into five with seven specimens in each. Then the cleaning and uh, shaping of the specimens was done up to protepa nitty files uh, size X three. Uh, under irrigation with the respective irrigants used in the study. Then group one was 5.25% sodium hypochlorite. Group two is 5% metformin hydrochloride. Here 500 milligram metformin hydrochloride oral tablets were uh, uh, dissolved in 5 ml of distilled water. Then group three was 0.2% chitosan. Here 2 gram chitosan was dissolved in 100 ml of 1% acetic acid. Then group four was iron oxide nanoparticles. 2.5 milligram iron oxide nanoparticle powder was dispensed in 5 ml of crystal water. And group 5 is a control group, which is 0.9% uh, uh, normal saline. So manual dynamic agitation was done for uh, one minute after the final instrumentation. Then uh, the apical third were prepared by decoronating uh, 6 mm from the apex by using a diamond disc. Then the delineal shavings were obtained by using GG drills. Uh, then uh, the evaluation of the 
MDG assay was performed using the linear shavings obtained from the respective specimens. The percentage uh, viability was calculated by using the formula OD of the test by OD of the control into 100. And this is a feature of a microplate reader, which was used for measuring the optical density. Uh, and this is the picture of the uh, culture wells showing the results of the study. So this is the control group which show the uh, um, uh, um, a more, more degree of color and the uh, rest of the uh, rest of the uh, spe uh, rest of the groups where least color was uh, C. Then the statistical analysis used in the study was one way ANOVA test and the p value was kept at less than uh, 0.05. And uh, moving on to the results, the results of the study uh, uh, showed that the uh, saline uh, showed the highest mean value, uh, which means that it showed the highest number of mean cells, then followed by metformin and then uh, the ionoxide nanoparticle and 5.25% sodium hypochlorite and 0.2% percentage chitosan uh, showed a mo uh, moreover uh, com comparable uh, similar values. Then the, uh, this is a table, uh, uh, tabular interpretation of the one-way ANOVA test performed. Uh, here the p-value was uh, 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 obtained as less than 0.01, which uh, showed that the study was uh, statistically significant. Uh, then this is a tabular uh, representation of the same. Here the highest number of uh, viable cells was seen in the saline, then followed by metformin. Then the uh, iron oxide uh, group, uh, sodium hypochlorite and the chitosan showed more or less uh, were in the same range. Then moving on to the discussion. So in, uh, in the present study, normal saline, uh, which is uh, which is devoid of any non-antibacterial activity was used as a control, uh, again, when compared to the other test solutions. And uh, uh, sodium hypochlorate, even though it is considered as a gold standard irrigant, it is reported that 40 to 60 percent of the root canal still uh, harbor viable bacteria after irrigation with sodium hypochlorate. And also in the study by Bystrom et al., sodium hypochlorate uh, demonstrated reduced effic efficacy for dendinal tubule disinfection uh, with the antibacterial activity limited to the superficial layers of the meat. So newer irrigants uh, are required for optimal disinfection of the root canal space. Uh, then in an article by Bukhari et al., uh, uh, he has mentioned about the uh, uh, disinfection properties of ionoxide na nanoparticles. The results of this study has shown that this ionoxide nanoparticles equally efficacious as 5.25% sodium hypochlorite uh, when used as an irrigant. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the reason being due to their nanoscale size, which enables better penetration in the mineral tubules and also their broad spectrum of antibacterial activity. And also uh, they are biocompatible and show, and uh, it has a tendency for developing less resistance and also it is least toxic. And uh, the next irrigant was a 0.2% chitosan. So it also showed uh, an antibacterial activity comparable with sodium hypochlorate. And the antibacterial uh, efficacy of chitosan could be due to their hydrophilic nature, which favors the intimate contact with the routinal dendin and its adsorption to the routinal walls. And the fourth irrigant use was the metformin. So here uh, in an article by Mann et al, it was uh, quoted that the intracanal metformin was able to reduce bone resorption associated with apical pterodontitis by suppressing the inducible nitric oxide synthesis enzyme produced by the monocytes. And also it was able to pr promote bone healing. So this uh, uh, results of the study showed that the metformin also inhibited the growth of uh, epicalis, but it was less efficacious when compared to the other test irrigants. So, uh, uh, to the, moving on to the conclusion, so uh, within the limitations of the study, it can be concluded that and the antimicrobial efficacy of anoxin nanoparticle, 0.2 percentage chitosan, and uh, is comparable to 5.25 percentage sodium hypochlorite, while metformin uh, showed the least antimicrobial activity among the uh, test organs. So more and more clinical trials need to be done in this regard in order to exploit the antibacterial potential of anoxide nanoparticles uh, and 0.2% chitosan and uh, metformin as potential root canal irrigants in the future. Uh, so these are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Afina. Is there any questions? No. Okay. Next presentation by Dr. Janani D. 
PMS College of Dental Science and Research. Dr. Janani D. Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, please start your presentation, ma'am. Sure, ma'am. Thank you. May I audible? Yes, audible. Please continue. Okay. Uh, is the screen is viewable? Yes. Yes. Uh, good. Uh, good evening to one and all. I am here to present a study regarding the fracture strength of endocrowns fabricated with zirconia reinforced ceramics over base metal alloys. So, moving on to the study here. Before that, in the in, under the introduction for treating or restoring an endodontically treated teeth, various uh, challenges are there. That is especially in the ultra structural level and in the gross structural level. And the ultra structural level, there will be a, a loss of uh, moisture uh, while after removing the pulpal remnant. Also, there will be changes in the collagen structure while using the irrigants like hypochlorite or the EDTA. These irrigants will soften the dentin. Besides this, while uh, while uh, while doing the cavity preparation, the SS cavity it also during that conventional technique it also disturbed the pericervical dentin, which is uh, which has a key role in the uh, which has which co contribute a key um, strength to the tooth. Besides this, it also uh, removes the uh, um, excess amount of uh, tooth structure while doing the cleaning and shaping. These uh, these patterns finally contribute the weakening of the tooth structure. So in order to prevent that, uh, in order to prevent this uh, weakening of the tooth structure, a devil and core system is in, in on a past days it is practiced. That is by using the towel, it to co concentrate the forces, especially on the lateral aspect of the tooth and also on the apical aspect. Besides this, it also create a force on the apex and also it has an um, it has a great key role in retention of the core. According to the study by Eric Amson, it has, it has um, the, from the study, it says that, that the post will finally will be loosened while after a, a prolonged time. So in order to avoid these drawbacks, uh, see, see, uh, um, develop a monoblock technique. That is, he developed the uh, retention in, uh, uh, retention from the pulp chamber and uh, consider uh, core and crown as a single unit. So, by introducing this monoblock technique, it was found that uh, the it, it enhances the tooth uh, by using this monoblock technique. From this uh, concept, Bintil and Moman introduced a new type, innov innovative method, innovative restorative method for endodontically treated tooth. That is the endo he was he published the concept on the uh, journal at clinical at clinical evaluation of adversely placed serac endocrons after two year preliminary results in the journal of adhesive dentistry so what is the purpose of endocron the endocron is mainly used for the retention uh, of the uh, endodontically treated teeth. They receive the core retention from the pulp chamber. And uh, the uh, concept is monoblock concept. And it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it is in the lines of only that it also provide a micro retention. That is, this mainly depends upon the adhesive cementation. And also it depends upon the retention from the parallel walls of the pulp chamber. So so this, this by uh, contributing by uh, by receiving these patterns, it enhances the uh, tooth and it uh, to resist the masticatory forces. 
So various materials are um, are used for the fabrication of endocrines. In the past days, lithium disilicate, which is commonly used for the fabrication, but uh, by uh, by the introduction of the zirconia, which is an outstanding has an outstanding feature of to enhance the resistance, uh, to, to enhance the um, fracture resistance, and also excellent aesthetics. This uh, lithium disilicate is replaced by zirconia, which is also bio compatible which provides a low thermal conductivity and also it is resistance to corrosion besides zirconia my variant of zirconia is, that, uh, zirconia is there that is monolith zirconia here three to five percentage yttrium stabilized zirconia is there the key uh, key unique feature of this monolith zirconia is it minimizes the wear of its opponent antagonist tooth and it also possesses high flexural strength and it also has a satisfactory aesthetic uh, then other materials that I am choosing for this study is the base metal alloy. It, is, it possesses a high strength, even in small uh, small thickness, and also highly tarnished to corrosion, highly resistant to tarnish and corrosion in the oral environment, and also low specific depth. So moving on to my study, that is my study aims to compare the fracture strength of these endocrons fabricated with zirconia reinforced ceramics over base metal alloy. So the methodology is usually I um, collect the samples and uh, after that the samples are prepared. Then it is uh, from the then it is uh, sub, um, subjected to crown fabrication by impression taking. Finally, this strength is evaluated. So this the 20 extracted mandibular mona tooth are selected, which is devoid of caries, attrition. These tooth are mounted on a click block of specific dimensions. Then these are, uh, um, these, are um, clean, uh, be, these are subjected to cleaning and shaping. And finally, it is obturated with, um, uh, with a um, data patch of one size with a H plus sealer. Then these specimens were grouped into three, four groups. Group one is zirconia endocrine, group two monolith zirconia, group three nickel chromium, and group four uh, cobalt chromia. Then the tooth is prepared for the each um, endocrine. That is, they, it should be in a rhomboidal shape with the 3 mm depth and occlusal divergent walls of 2 to 5 degree depth. And for base metal groups, the, there is an, uh, for the preparation for the base metal groups, it, there is an 1 mm occlusal reduction and 2 to 8 degree of uh, um, axial wall taper is giving that is occlusally divergence and finish line is chamfer is preferred. For zirconia reinforced ceramics, 2 mm occlusal reduction. 10 to 12 degree axial wall taper and radial shoulder finish line is this is how it look, uh, looks like after the final preparation for preventing the undercut at the base pulper floor pulper floor level we i am using uh, gic as the base uh, to prevent the undercut finally it looks like this and the impression is taken for the each specimen uh, by using the cement uh, putty impression light body then the final endocrine I got is so this is how this is the zirconia endocrine, monolith zirconia endocrine, nickel chromium, and the cobalt chromium. Then these are um, these are looted with the dual queer resin cement. Before that, sand blasting is done for each uh, endocrine to enhance the porosity, and also HF uh, HF etching is also used. Hydrofluoric acid etching of nine percent is also used to enhance the microporosity. Then the dual queer resin is used for looting this processes. And finally, after looting, this, uh, this, uh, these uh, samples are subjected for the uh, fracture strength evaluation. This is done by using universal testing machine. And here the load cell, um, load cell given is maximum of 5,009 Newton with a speed of one millimeter per minute. Then here the axial force is given perpendicular to the central fissure. So finally, the statistical analysis obtained uh, is used is one way an hour two key test and p-value, which is said to be less than 0 0.05. So the results that are obtained is here cobalt chromium shows a mean value of 2,250 newton uh, for the um, for, uh, for the fracture of this um, cobalt chromium. And uh, for a zirconia, it shows that a 2,693 newton is uh, required for um, fracture of the zirconia crown. So moving on to the discussion, 
Okay, at the zirconian monolith, zirconia endocrons, uh, the hedis, uh, endocrons are occurring, the fracture is occurring between uh, 2000 to 3000 newton. And but uh, for nickel chromium and cobalt chromium, here the endocrons uh, shows the debonding and deformance instead of fracture at 1000 and um, between 1000 to 2000 newton. So here maximum force is given uh, for the, uh, the samples is 5000 newton. The is for the zirconia and monolith zirconia endocrons uh, shows a complete destruction of these uh, processes. So maximum load given to the to, uh, fractured copper is zirconia shows it to the above 2500 newton and monolith zirconia shows above 2300 newton and nickel chromium and cobalt chromium shows a uh, uh, fracture uh, for, uh, require a fracture uh, uh, load of 2700 to 1700. So in the bar diagram, bar diagram, we can see that zirconia, which shows high, higher compressive strength, uh, or, it, which all, or it shows a higher resistance to load uh, on comparing with monolith zirconia and the remaining deep metals. And for cobalt chromium also, it shows a high compressive strength on comparing with nickel chromium. So after that, uh, these are the uh, uh, failure patterns uh, we can see after the uh, after evaluation, after subjecting to the sample to the fracture test. That is the zirconia. Here, complete zirconia chromium is complete destruction is occurring. For metal uh, endocrons, debonding and decompression is occurring. And for some monolith zirconia, debonding is also occurring. So finally, concluding my study that on comparing with base metal alloys, zirconia reinforced ceramic endocrine has higher fracture resistance and fracture strength. Among, uh, on, among the base metal alloys, cobalt chromium endocrine shows higher fracture resistance. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jananidhi. Is there any questions? Yes, I want to ask a question from Dr. Uh, Nidhi. Please tell me uh, what are the factors which loosens the post? You have told in the introduction that post will be looser inside the tooth. And, yes. retention, and retention mode is radicular. And in endocrines, the retention mode you are taking only from the chamber. Then which one should be better? Here, uh, the drawback of the post is um, here we, while using the uh, preparation, uh, while, uh, while placing for the post, there will be a intra-canal uh, post space preparation will be there, which also reduces the uh, sufficient amount of dentine. And also, while using, uh, while giving a some continuous masticatory forces, there is a chance for the loosening of the force, uh, loosening of the post uh, by use, um, while placing this, uh, while uh, giving a continuous more masticatory forces if the post placement is not in a proper way. But for the uh, endocrine, here the um, uh, canal, uh, canal preparation is not here and it is mainly focusing for the tooth which have which does not have a sufficient amount of coronal structures. So it, it also uh, re uh, receives its retention from the pulp chamber which is having a 2 to 3 millimeter depth. So which also uh, give a strength to the tooth uh, in an around for the, the insufficient tooth. Debonding will be there even in the endocrines, but you might have taken some control group in your study. You have not taken any control group? Uh, no, ma'am. I didn't take any control group. No? Yeah, control group was must actually. Otherwise, it is a good study. Okay. Next presenter, please. Our next presentation by Dr. Vivek Devidas Mahali, Saveta Dental College and Hospital. Dr. Vivek? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Uh, please start your presentation, sir. I'm not able to share the screen, ma'am. Okay. Yes, sir. Please share now. Good evening, everyone. Uh, one minute, one minute. Good evening, everyone. My topic of today is uh, guided endodontic surgery. Myself, Vivek Devidas Male, first time this uh, concerned endodontics from Savita Dental College, Chennai. 
Excuse me. Uh, okay, Xavier Dental College, Chennai. Uh, these are the, my uh, table of contents. Uh, these are my table of contents. Coming to a brief history of uh, micro analytic microsurgery and uh, dynamic navigation. First, root end dissection was done by Smith in uh, 1871. Then uh, Brophy introduced the root end filling in 1880. So this uh, dynamic navigation system was first introduced into dentistry for uh, accurate placement of implants. Then Bukharets uh, introduced guided endodontics in vivo in 2016. Uh, he introduced this uh, dynamic navigation system into endodontics in 2016. So uh, coming to the users of uh, guided endodontics, it can be used in calcified pulp chamber to negotiate and uh, to for, for uh, making minimally invasive access cavity preparation and for retreatment cases and uh, periapical surgery in complex cases and where there is a complex uh, anatomy uh, when uh, important anatomical structures are involved. So coming to the type of guided endodontics, there are two types, static guided endodontics and dynamic navigation system. So static, uh, uh, static guided endodontics, it involves taking a CBT, CBCT scan, then uh, designing a surgical strand, a surgical stent, and uh, this is a 3D printing of the surgical stent and uh, performing uh, the guided endodontic microsurgery uh, in the patient. Uh, th this is the uh, stent which uh, we have, uh, which is the print 3D printed. And uh, this is the plane which uh, through which the piezotome will enter. Uh, the limitations of static guided endodontics is that it lacks a real time visualization and once it is manufactured uh, with the planned angulation and size depth, uh, it cannot be altered. And there is no scope for uh, the changing of the plan intermittently during the treatment. If during the treatment, if you feel any complications, you can't uh, change the plan uh, immediately. You have to again start from the first. And uh, stents are cumbersome to be used in uh, posterior teeth, uh, posterior regions. Uh, coming to the dynamic navigation system, it is uh, it is analogous to GPS. Uh, this uh, this is the optical tracking device which which continuously tracks this. Um, drill tag and also the jaw tracker uh, in a real time. So this technology is called as the trace and place uh, introduced by Claronav in the Navident system. It, it is analogous, analogous to GPS. This acts uh, like a satellite and uh, uh, this customer and uh, like Ola cab companies like that. It will, uh, re it will show the real time uh, location of your drill and drill uh, drill uh, and so these are the stages in the dynamic navigation system workflow. So First, there is a first. You have to take a CVCT, import the data into the uh, into DNS software. Then you have to do case planning. This case plan, uh, case planning. Then once the patient enters your clinic, you have to do trace registration. You have to do trace regi registration. Then calibration of the piezo Then accuracy check. Then we are ready to go with uh, surgical uh, and uh, surgical microsurgery. So first stage is loading of the CBCT data. The CBCT data should be loaded in the DICOM, DICOM data form. So once you uh, load the DICOM data form, the software will uh, reconstruct the, uh, the CBCT in, uh, uh, in 3D view uh, with axial and buccolingual mesial distal uh, in angulations and also the depth indicator. Then, then next step is case planning. The case planning can be done even before the patient comes to your clinic. So you can uh, plan the orientation of your piezotome, depth of the osteotomy, and everything can be uh, planned before and uh, kept ready. So every uh, the angulation and depth, everything can be planned before in the, the DNS software. Then comes the trace registration. For trace registration, there are... Uh, uh, <clears throat> First, you have to select three to six uh, trace locations, which are stable and evident for ex uh, like anterior tooth, uh, uh, like for example, anterior tooth. Uh, after you select the trace locations, then you have to insert, uh, install the head tracker to the patient, uh, head tracker if you are doing mandible jaw tracker to the patient, then using this uh, tracing instrument, you have to trace the all the uh, teeth which have selected as a trace locations, you are in the brushing motion. Uh, in the buccal and lingual and all the all the surfaces until you will get a score of 100, 100%. The next step step is calibration of the piezotome. Piezotome uh, calibration is uh, done after it is attached to the uh, drill tag. This is the drill tag. Once it uh, the piezotome is calibrated, once it is attached to the piezotome uh, uh, drill tag, and uh, this is the calibration device. You will insert it in this. Uh, uh, hole and uh, there uh, you can uh, do the 
calibration next fourth step is accuracy check uh, this is uh, for accuracy accuracy check this cone uh, represents the your uh, calibrated drill which is a piezotome and this uh, tip tip of this cone represents your uh, piezotome tip and this uh, this number in the green which represents the distance between your tip and the planned uh, osteotomy axis and the second number represents the angle between the drill and the central axis of the osteotomy this represents the distance it represents the angle and uh, for uh, uh, Ideally, it should be less than uh, 0.5 mm, and this degree should be less than 3 degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this third number will represent the distance between the planned depth and how much depth you have gone, uh, how, how much depth you have already gone. So fifth step is performing the microsurgery under the dynamic navigation. So this is an example of uh, access, uh, access cavity preparation uh, with the dynamic navigation. Uh, where when this is the the thing in uh, yellow color marking is uh, the planned uh, planned uh, access cavity opening and the green one is uh, the your uh, drill so when it is uh, with, when, when it, the drill is uh, within the 1.5 mm of the uh, planned depth it will turn into green and when it is less than 0.5 mm this will turn into um, yellow and ideally it should be uh, like uh, this bull's eye uh, when if uh, in the graph if it is showing like bullseye then you are going exactly into the your planned path see how it is exactly into the planned path uh, like that uh, it's it works so so performing the microsurgery under dynamic navigation is also same just the uh, uh, your plan will be like in the apical area and advantages of the DNS over static guides. The advantages is of, of flexibility. You can play change the plan at any time after the CVCD data, and you can do it immediately. And uh, there is a more predictability. It is uh, more predictable due to immediate detection. If you go anything wrong, the computer will start beeping. And there is a, a safety because of the accuracy check. It's always available. Then uh, it is a simple, sim it is a easy and simple to use software. Then why to use uh, DNS over freehand uh, endodontic microsurgery? Because the size of osteotomy and the speed of radiologic healing are directly related to the uh, uh, size. Healing is directly related to the size of osteotomy. So smaller the size of osteotomy, uh, better is the healing. With DNS, if you enter exactly, you know where you have to cut the root. If you enter exactly there with your osteotome, then uh, there will be a small uh, osteotomy site to be he healed. Then instruments can be easily navigated and can be used effectively in the posterior region because you don't have to use a uh, stent and all. Then major anatomic uh, areas like mandibular uh, mandibular nerve and maxillary sinus can be safeguarded and there's a reduced surgical time. And these are all the dynamic navigation systems available. One is Navident uh, by ClaroNav, then XGuide, ImplaNav, and then CAMP. Limitations of DNS. Coming to the limitations of D DNS, uh, there's a uh, difficulties faced by operators if in establishing a stable reference point. You 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 have to decide uh, which for which teeth you are using as a trace uh, locations, and then uh, alterations in position of the patient's head uh, uh, if will uh, disturb the calibration, like synchronization. So synchronization and position of the overhead stereoscopic motion tracking camera influences the overall tracking uh, of the orientation uh, tracking so orientation plays a main role then burst utilized has to be recalibrated if you are using two three bursts every time you change the bar and you have to recalibrate uh, it again so that uh, it will work fine Next conclusions, uh, DNS can be successfully applied in the challenging clinical situations like pulp canal obliteration, conservative cases and retreatment cases and endodontic microsurgeries, uh, surgeries eff efficiently and with, uh, with a the shorter chair time, safeguarding the important anatomical structures. But uh, it also has, has some limitations, which we explained in the last slide, which has to be uh, addressed to make it more easy and more accurate. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vivek. Is there any questions? No, ma'am. Okay. Nice presentation, Dr. Vivek. We 
Thank you, ma'am. This live on a patient in uh, Delhi IAS National Conference. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah. They gave a live demonstration of this device. Yeah, over Vivek. There. Yeah. Yes, yes, Dr. Vivek gave it. You're right. Oh. Okay. Okay. Our next presentation by Dr. Nimish Tayehi, Kalka Dental College and Hospital. Dr. Nimish. Okay. Next presentation by Dr. Anjali Dul, Subarati Dental College, Mirut. Dr. Anjali. Dr. Anjali, can you hear me? Dr. Anjali, please unmute your Zoom and uh, start your presentation. Dr. Anjali, can you able to present your presentation? Okay. Next presentation by Dr. Manu Vikram. Dr. Manu? Thank you everyone for your wonderful innovative presentation and thank you session chair for spending your valuable time. On behalf of Asia Pacific Association for Dental and Oral Health, APADENTO, I would like to express my gratitude all speakers for their presence and contribution to making the conference a more in informative and interesting session. Asia Pacific so Association for Dental and Oral Health, APADENTO, extends our sincere gratitude to our speakers and participants to take out time from their busy schedule to grace the event. Kindly join the conference with the same enthusiasm on tomorrow 9 a.m. Thank you, everyone. Can you?